Section 1 of The Convivio This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey The Convivio by Dante Alighieri Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed Treatise One, Chapters One to Four Chapter One As saith the philosopher in the beginning of the first philosophy, all men by nature desire to know. The reason whereof may be that each thing, impelled by its own natural foresight, inclines to its own perfection. Wherefore, inasmuch as knowledge is the distinguishing perfection of our soul, wherein consists our distinguishing blessedness, all of us are naturally subject to the longing for it. Yet of this most noble perfection many are bereft, for divers causes, which, inside of the man and outside of him, keep him from acquiring the habit of knowledge. Inside of the man there may be two defects and impediments, the one from the side of the body, the other from the side of the soul. From the side of the body is it when the parts are unduly disposed, so that it can receive naught, as with the deaf and the dumb, and their likes. From the side of the soul is it, when vice hath such supremacy in her that she giveth herself to pursuing vicious delights, wherein she is deluded to such a point that for their sake she holds all things cheap. Outside of the man, likewise, two causes may be detected, one of which brings about compulsion, the other indolence. The former is that family and civic care, which rightly engages to itself the greater number of men, so that they may not abide in leisure of speculation. The latter is the defect of the place where the person is born and nurtured, which may chance to be not only void of all provision for study, but remote from studious folk. The two first of these causes, to wit the first from the inner side and the first from the outer side, are not to be blamed, but to be excused, and deserve to be pardoned. The two others, though one of them more than the other, deserve to be blamed and abominated. Manifestly, then, may he perceive, who rightly considers, that few be left who may reach to that habit which is desired by all, and well nigh beyond number are they which be hindered, and which live all their lives famished for this universal food. O oh, blessed those few who sit at the table where the bread of angels is consumed, and wretched they who share the food of sheep! But inasmuch as every man is naturally friendly to every man, and every friend is grieved by the defect of his friend, they who are fed at so lofty a table are not without compassion towards those whom they see browsing round on grass and acorns in the pasture of brutes. And inasmuch as compassion is the mother of benefaction, they who know ever proffer freely of their good wealth to those poor indeed, and are as a living spring at whose waters the natural thirst above spoken of is refreshed. And I, therefore, who sit not at the blessed table, but having fled the pasture of the common herd, 
gather at the feet of them who sit at meat of that which falls from them and who by reason of the sweetness which i experience in that which little by little i gather recognize the wretched life of those whom i have left behind me moved to compassion though not forgetting myself have reserved somewhat for the wretched which somewhat already some time agone i have displayed to their eyes and thereby have made them the more eager wherefore desiring now to make provision for them i purpose to make a general banquet of that which i have already displayed to them and of the bread which is needful for such like viand without which they might not eat it at this banquet such bread to wit as is worthy of the viand which i well understand to have been offered them in vain and therefore i would not have any take his seat who is ill disposed as to his organs inasmuch as he has neither tooth nor tongue nor palate nor any addicted to vice inasmuch as his stomach is full of poisonous and contrary humours so that it would not retain my viands but let come whosoever because of family and civil care has been kept in human hunger and let him seat himself at the same table with others impeded in like manner and at their feet let all place themselves who have been excluded by their sloth for they are not worthy to sit more high and let these and those take my viand together with the bread which will enable them both to taste and to digest it the viands of this banquet will be served in fourteen fashions that is to say fourteen odes treating as well of love as of virtue which without the present bread had the shadow of a certain obscurity so that to many their beauty was more in favour than their excellence but this bread to wit the present exposition will be the light which shall make apparent every hue of their significance and if in the present work which is entitled and which i wish to be the banquet the handling be more virile than in the new life i do not intend thereby to throw a slight in any respect upon the latter but rather to strengthen that by this seeing that it conforms to reason that that should be fervid and impassioned this temperate and virile for a different thing is comely to say and to do at one age than at another wherefore certain ways are suitable and laudable at one age which are foul and blameworthy at another as will be shown on its own account further on in the fourth treatise of this book and in that i spoke before entrance on the prime of manhood and in this when i had already passed the same and inasmuch as my true purport was other than the aforesaid odes outwardly display i intend to set them forth by allegorical exposition after having discussed the literal story so that the one account and the other will supply a relish to those who are invited to this feast whom i pray one and all that if the banquet be not so magnificent as consorts with the proclamation thereof they shall impute every defect not to my will but to my power because what my will herein aims at is a full and hearty liberality chapter two 
at the beginning of every well-ordered banquet the servants are wont to take the bread that is set out and cleanse it from every blemish wherefore i who in this present writing am taking their place purpose at the outset to cleanse this exposition which counts for the bread in my repast from two blemishes the one is that for any one to speak of himself seems unjustifiable and the other that for an expounder himself to discourse too profoundly seems unreasonable and this appearance of what is unjustifiable and unreasonable the knife of my judgment cleanses away in the fashion that follows rhetoricians forbid a man to speak of himself except on needful occasion and from this a man is prohibited because it is impossible to speak of any without the speaker either praising or blaming him of whom he speaks and there is a want of urbanity in either of these kinds of discourse finding a place on a man's own proper lips and to solve a doubt which rises here i say that it is worse to blame than to praise though neither the one nor the other should be done the reason is that what is directly blameworthy is fouler than what is incidentally so to dispraise oneself is directly blameworthy because a man should tell his friend a fault in secret and there is no closer friend to a man than himself wherefore it is in the chamber of his own thoughts that he should take himself to task and bewail his faults not openly again for lacking the power or the knowledge to conduct himself rightly a man for the most part is not blamed but for lacking the will he always is for it is by willing and not willing that our badness and goodness is judged and so he who blames himself by showing that he knows his fault exposes his lack of goodness and therefore a man must refrain on his own account from speaking in blame of himself self-praise is to be avoided as evil by implication inasmuch as such praise cannot be given without its turning to yet greater blame it is praise on the surface of the words it is blame if we search into their entrails for words are produced to demonstrate what is not known wherefore whosoever praises himself shows that he does not believe himself to be well thought of which will not happen unless he has an evil conscience which in his self-praise is revealed and when revealed is blamed and further self-praise and self-blame are to be shunned for one common reason bearing of false witness for there is no man who is a true and just measurer of himself so does our kindness to ourselves deceive us whence it happens that every one hath in his judgment the measures of the unjust trader who sells with one and buys with another and each one takes stock of his evil doing with a large measure and takes stock of his good with a little one so that the number and quantity and weight of the good seems to him greater than if it were assayed with a just measure and that of the evil less wherefore when speaking of himself in praise or the contrary either he speaks falsely with respect to the thing of which he speaks or he speaks falsely with respect to his own belief 
and the one and the other is falsity. And this is why, inasmuch as assenting to an opinion is a way of professing it, he is guilty of discourtesy who praises or blames another to his face, because he who is thus estimated can neither assent nor protest without falling into the error of praising or blaming himself. Save, be it understood, in the way of due rebuke, which cannot be without blame of the fault which is to be corrected, and save in the way of due honouring and magnifying, which cannot come about without mention made of the virtuous deeds, or of the dignities virtuously acquired. But returning to the main purport, I say, as indicated above, that speaking of himself is permitted on needful occasions, and amongst other needful occasions two are most manifest. The one is when it is impossible, without speaking of himself, to quash great infamy and peril, and then it is allowed by reason that taking the least evil path of two is in a way taking a good one. And this necessity moved Boethius to speak of himself, so that under cover of consolation he might ward off the perpetual infamy of his exile, showing that it was unjust, since no other arose to ward it off. The other is when by a man discoursing of himself the highest advantage in the way of instruction follows therefrom to others, and this reason moved Augustine in the Confessions to speak of himself. For by the progress of his life, which was from bad to good, and from good to better, and from better to best, he gave example and instruction which could not have been received otherwise on such sure testimony. Wherefore, if the one and the other of these occasions excuses me, the bread of my leavening is purged from its first blemishes. I am moved by the fear of infamy, and I am moved by the desire to give instruction which in very truth no other can give. I fear the infamy of having pursued so great a passion as he who reads the above-named odes conceives to have had dominion over me, which infamy is entirely quenched by this present discourse concerning myself, which shows that not passion but virtue was the moving cause. I purpose also to reveal the true meaning of the said odes, which none may perceive unless I relate it, because it is hidden under figure of allegory, and this will not only give fair delight to hear, but subtle instruction, both in discoursing after this fashion, and in understanding after this fashion the writings of others. Chapter 3 Worthy of much blame is the thing which, being appointed to remove some special defect, itself induces that same, as if one should be appointed to part a strife, and before he had parted it set another on foot. And now that my bread has been purged on one side, it behoves me to purge it on the other, that I may escape this latter blame. For my present writing, which may be called a kind of commentary, while commissioned to remove the defect of the aforesaid odes, may perhaps in certain places be a little difficult itself, which difficulty is here designed to avoid a greater defect, and not in ignorance. 
oh that it had pleased the disposer of the universe that the occasion of my excuse had never been for then neither would others have sinned against me nor should i have unjustly suffered penalty the penalty i mean of exile and of poverty since it was the pleasure of the citizens of the most beauteous and the most famous daughter of rome florence to cast me forth from her most sweet bosom wherein i was born and nurtured until the culmination of my life wherein with their good leave i long with all my heart to repose my wearied mind and end the time which is granted me through well nigh all the regions whereto this tongue extends a wanderer almost a beggar have i paced revealing against my will the wound of fortune which is often wont to be unjustly imputed to him who is wounded verily have i been a ship without sail and without helm drifted upon divers ports and straits and shores by the dry wind that grievous poverty exhales and i have seemed cheap in the eyes of many who perchance had conceived of me in other guise by some certain fame in the sight of whom not only has my person been cheapened but every work of mine already accomplished or yet to do has become of lower price the reason why this comes to pass not only in me but in all it is my pleasure here briefly to touch upon and first why a man's reputation dilates things more than truth demands and then why more than truth demands his presence makes them shrink good report begotten at the beginning in the mind of a friend by a good action is first brought to birth by this mind for the mind of an enemy even though it receive the seed doth not conceive this mind which first gives it birth further to adorn its present and also for love of the friend who receives it does not restrain itself within the limits of the truth but passes beyond them and when it passes beyond them in order to adorn its utterances it speaks against conscience when it is the illusion of love that makes it pass beyond them it does not speak against it the second mind which receives it thus is not contented to abide by the dilating of the first mind but sets about to adorn its own report as being its own proper effect in the matter and so both for the sake of so adorning it and also by means of the illusion which it receives from the love begotten in it it makes the dilation more ample than it was when it came to it and this in concord and in discord with conscience as before and the like does the third receiving mind and the fourth and so to infinity it dilates and in like manner reversing the aforesaid causes we may see the reason why infamy is magnified in like fashion wherefore virgil saith in the fourth of the aeneid that fame lives by moving and grows by going clearly then may whoso will perceive that the image begotten by fame alone is ever more ample whatsoever it may be than the imagined thing in its true state
Chapter 4 The reason having now been shown why fame dilates the good and the evil beyond their true magnitude, it remains in this chapter to show the reasons which reveal to us why a man's presence contracts them in the other direction. And when these have been shown, we shall easily advance to our main purpose, which concerns the above-mentioned excuse. I say, then, that for three causes presence makes a person count for less than his real worth, the first of which is childishness. I do not mean of age, but of mind. The second is envy and these two exist in the judge. The third is the alloy of humanity, and this is in the person judged. The first can be briefly discoursed of thus. The greater part of men live after sense, and not after reason, like children and such know not things save only on their outer surface, and their excellence, which has reference to their due end, they do not see, because they have the eyes of their reason shut, which penetrate to the perception of that end, whence they quickly perceive everything that they can perceive at all, and judge according to their vision and because they form a certain opinion on the strength of a man's fame by hearsay wherefrom in the man's presence the imperfect judgment which judges not after reason but after sense alone is at variance they hold all that they have heard before to be a lie and despise the person whom before they prized wherefore with such as these and almost every one is such a man's presence makes the one and the other quality shrink such as these are quickly set a-longing and are quickly satisfied they are often rejoiced and often saddened with brief delights and glooms and they quickly become friends and quickly enemies they do all things like children without use of reason the second may be understood by these considerations likeness in the vicious is the cause of envy and envy is the cause of hostile judgment because it suffers not reason to plead on behalf of the object of envy. And the power of judgment is then like to the judge who listens only to one side. Wherefore, when such as these see the famous person, they are straightway envious, because they look upon his members and upon his faculties, which are like their own, and they fear, because of the excellence of such a one, to be the less prized. And these not only pass a hostile judgment under the influence of passion, but by defaming cause others also to pass a hostile judgment. Wherefore with them presence makes the good and the ill in every one presented to them shrink and i say the ill because many taking delight in ill deeds envy ill-doers the third is the alloy of humanity which has its source in him who is judged and works not save by some familiarity and intercourse to make which clear be it known that man is blemished in many directions, and as Augustine says, no man is without blemish. One while the man is blemished by some passion, which maybe he cannot resist. Another while he is blemished by some distorted member, 
and another by some stroke of fortune, or he is blemished by the infamy of his parents, or of some one nigh of kin to him, which things are not borne by fame, but by the man's presence, and by his intercourse, he reveals them. And these blemishes throw some shadow over the brightness of his excellence, so as to make it seem less clear and less worthy. And this is why every prophet is less honoured in his own country. This is why a man of excellence should grant his presence to few, and his intimacy to fewer that his name may have acceptance and not be despised. And this third cause may operate in the case of evil as well as good, if each element in the argument concerning it be turned the opposite way. Wherefore, it is clearly seen, because of the alloy from which no man is free, presence contracts the good and the ill in every man further than truth wills wherefore because as said above i have exposed myself to nearly all the italians and therefore have perchance cheapened myself more than the truth wills not only to them whom my reputation has reached but to others also whereby all that I have done has doubtless been more lightly esteemed, together with myself. It behoves me to give something of weight to the present work by a loftier style, that it may seem a thing of more authority. Ha, and let this excuse for the severity of my comment suffice. End of section one Section two of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Chapter five. Now that this bread has been cleansed of the accidental blemishes, it remains to apologize for a substantial one, to wit, that it is vernacular and not Latin, which by similitude may be called oaten instead of wheaten. And in brief, the apology consists in three considerations which moved me to choose this rather than the other. The first springs forth from the desire to avoid undue inversion of order, the second from zealous liberality, the third from natural love of one's own speech. And these reasons, and the grounds on which they rest, that I may satisfy the objections that might be urged on the aforesaid ground, I purpose duly to discuss in fashion as follows. That which most adorns and commends the doings of man, and which most directly leads them to a prosperous end, is the habit of those dispositions which are ordained to the end in view, as, for instance, courage of mind and strength of body are ordained to the end of chivalry. And so he who is appointed to the service of another should have those dispositions which are ordained to that end, to wit, subjection, knowledge, and obedience, without which a man is not duly disposed for service. For if he be not subject in all his conditions, he ever goeth irksomely and heavily in his service, and seldom continueth therein. And if he be not obedient, he serveth not save at his own discretion and will, which is rather the service of a friend than of a servant. Wherefore, to avoid this inversion of order, it behoves this command, which is made to be servant of the oaths hereinafter written, to be subject to them in its whole ordainment and it should have acquaintance with the affairs of its lord, and should be obedient to him. All which dispositions would be lacking to it were it Latin and not vernacular, seeing that the odes are vernacular. For firstly, if it were Latin, it would not be subject but sovereign, 
both by reason of nobility and of virtue and of beauty of nobility because latin is stable and uncorruptible and the vernacular is unstable and corruptible wherefore we see in the ancient writings of the latin comedies and tragedies which cannot be changed that same speech that we have to-day and this is not the case with the vernacular which takes fashion at our will and changes whence we see in the cities of italy if we choose to look closely that within fifty years from now many words have been quenched and born and changed and if a short time makes so much change far more change does greater time effect so that i assert that if they who parted from this life a thousand years agone were to return to their cities they would believe them to be inhabited by a strange folk because of the tongue discordant from their own of this i shall discourse more at large elsewhere in a book which i intend to make god granting concerning vernacular discourse further latin was sovereign rather than subject by reason of its virtue everything hath virtue of nature which accomplishes that for which it was ordained and the better it doth it the more virtue it hath whence we call the man virtuous who lives in the life of contemplation or action to which he is naturally ordained we speak of the equine virtue of pacing swift and far where to the horse is ordained we speak of the virtue of a sword which smartly cuts things hard where to it is ordained thus speech which is ordained to manifest human conceptions hath virtue when it doth this thing and that speech hath the most virtue which doth it most wherefore since latin revealeth many things conceived in the mind which the vernacular may not reveal as they know who have the habit of the one speech and the other its virtue is more than that of the vernacular again it were sovereign rather than subject by reason of its beauty men call that thing beautiful the parts whereof duly correspond because from their harmony pleasure results wherefore we think a man beautiful when his members duly correspond to each other and we call singing beautiful when the voices correspond mutually according to the requirements of the art therefore that speech is the more beautiful wherein the words correspond more duly and they correspond more duly in latin than in the vernacular because the vernacular followeth use and the latin art wherefore it is admitted to be of more beauty of more virtue and of more nobility and hereby the chief contention of this discourse is established to wit that a latin comment would not have been the subject of the odes but their sovereign chapter six having shown how the present comment would not have been subject to the odes had it been in latin it remains to show that it would not have been familiar with them nor obedient to them and then the conclusion will follow that to avoid undue inversion of order it was needful to speak in the vernacular i say that latin would not have been familiar with its vernacular master for this reason the servant's familiarity with his master is chiefly needed in order to give him perfect understanding of two things the first is the nature of his master for there be masters of such asinine nature that they order the contrary of what they desire and others who desire to be served and understood without giving orders at all and others who will not have the servant go about to do any needful thing except they command it and why there be such varieties amongst men i do not purpose at present to expound for it would make the discretion too multiplex save so far as to say generically that such are little other than beasts who have small good of their reason wherefore if the servant does not understand his master's nature it is manifest that he cannot perfectly serve him the second thing is that the servant must needs be acquainted with his master's friends for otherwise he would neither honour nor serve them and so would not perfectly serve his own master for friends are as it were parts of a single whole that whole being unity in willing and in not willing 
now the latin comment would not have had knowledge of these things whereas the vernacular itself has that latin hath no familiarity with the vernacular and its friends is thus proved to know a thing generically is not to know it perfectly just as he who perceives an animal afar off has no perfect understanding of it not knowing whether it be dog or wolf or goat latin has cognizance of vernacular speech generically but not in its distinctions for if it recognized its distinctions it would recognize all the vernaculars since there is no reason why it should recognize one more than another and therefore if any man had acquired complete command of latin he would enjoy discriminating familiarity with vernacular speech but this is not so for he who has perfect command of latin if he be of italy does not recognize the vernacular of the german nor if a german the italian or the provencal whence it is manifest that latin is not familiar with vernacular speech again it is not familiar with its friends because it is impossible to know the friends having no knowledge of the principle wherefore if latin is not acquainted with the vernacular and it has been shown above that it is not it is impossible for it to be acquainted with its friends again without intercourse and familiarity it is impossible to be acquainted with men and latin hath not intercourse with so many in any tongue as the vernacular of that tongue hath to which they all are friends and consequently it cannot know the friends of the vernacular and this is not contradicted by what might be urged namely that latin does converse with certain of the friends of the vernacular for it is not therefore familiar with them all and so it is not completely acquainted with the said friends and it is complete and not defective knowledge that is needed chapter seven having shown that the latin comment would not have served with understanding i will tell how it would not have been obedient he is obedient who possesses that excellent disposition which is called obedience true obedience must needs have three things without which it may not be it must be sweet not bitter and completely under command not self-moved and measured not out of measure the which three things it were impossible for the latin comment to have and therefore it were impossible for it to be obedient that it would have been impossible for the latin to be obedient is manifested by the argument that follows whatsoever proceeds in inverted order is irksome and therefore bitter and not sweet like sleeping by day and watching by night or going backwards and not forwards for the subject to command the sovereign is proceeding in inverted order for the right order is for the sovereign to command the subject wherefore it is bitter and not sweet and since it is impossible sweetly to obey a bitter command it is impossible when the subject commands for the obedience of the sovereign to be sweet wherefore if the latin the sovereign of the vernacular as has been shown above by many arguments and the odes which take the place of commanders are vernacular it is impossible that their relation should be sweet further obedience is wholly commanded and in no part self-moved when he who does a thing in obedience would not unless commanded have done it of his own motion either in whole or in part wherefore if i were ordered to bear two cloaks on my back and should have borne one without orders i say that my obedience is not wholly under command but is in part self-moved and such would have been the obedience of the latin comment and consequently it would not have been in obedience wholly under command that it would have been such appears hereby that latin without the command of this master would have expounded many parts of his meaning and actually expounds it if any one closely inspect writings that are written in latin which the vernacular does not in any degree again obedience is measured and not out of measure when it goes to the edge of the command and not beyond it just as particular nature is obedient to universal nature when it gives a man thirty-two teeth neither more nor less 
and when it gives five fingers to the hand, neither more nor less. And man is obedient to justice when he does what she commands to the evildoer. Now this the Latin would not have done, but would have sinned not only in defect, and not only in excess, but in both and thus its obedience would not have been measured but out of measure and consequently it would not have been obedient that latin would not have filled out its master's command and that it would also have exceeded it may easily be shown this master to wit these odes to which this command is ordained as servant command and will that they be expounded to all such to whom their meaning can so come that when they speak they shall be understood and no one doubts that if they could utter their commands in words, this is what they would order. Now, Latin would only have expounded them to the lettered, for others would not have understood it. Wherefore, inasmuch as there are far more unlettered than lettered who desire to understand them, it follows that Latin would not have fully accomplished their order, as does the vernacular, which is understood alike by the lettered and the unlettered moreover latin would have expounded them to folk of another tongue such as germans and english and others and here it would have exceeded their command for speaking at large i declare that it would have been against their will that their meaning should be expounded where they themselves could not carry it together with their beauty and therefore let every one know that nothing which hath the harmony of musical connection can be transferred from its own tongue into another without shattering all its sweetness and harmony and this is the reason why homer is not translated from greek into latin as are the other writings that we have of theirs and this is the reason why the verses of the psalter are without the sweetness of music and harmony for they were translated from hebrew into greek and from greek into latin and in the first translation all their sweetness perished and thus is the conclusion reached which was promised at the beginning of the chapter immediately before this chapter eight now that it has been shown by sufficient reasons how to avoid undue inversion of order the aforesaid odes must needs have a vernacular and not a latin common to reveal and expound them i purpose to show how zealous liberality likewise made me choose the one and rob the other zealous liberality then is marked by three things which cleave to this vernacular and would not have cleft to the latin the first is giving to many the second is giving things useful the third is giving the gift without its being asked for to give to and to help one is good but to give to and to help many is zealous goodness inasmuch as it taketh its likeness from the benefactions of god who is the most universal benefactor and moreover it is impossible to give to many without giving to one inasmuch as one is included in many but it is entirely possible to give to one without giving to many wherefore he who helps many doth the one good deed and the other he who helps one doth the one good deed only whence we see the makers of the laws keeping their eyes chiefly fixed on the general good in making them again to give things that are of no use to him who receives them is indeed good in so far as he who gives shows at least his friendship but it is not perfectly good and so is not zealous giving as if a knight should give a shield to a doctor and the doctor should give a copy of the aphorisms of hippocrates or the art of galen to the knight wherefore the wise say that the face of the gift ought to resemble that of the receiver that is to say should be suitable to him and should be useful and herein is the liberality deemed zealous of the man who is thus discerning in his gifts but inasmuch as moral counsellings are one to create a desire to investigate their origin in this chapter i purpose to briefly expound four reasons why a gift must needs be useful to him who receives it in order that there may be zealous liberality therein firstly because virtue should be cheerful and not gloomy in its every act wherefore 
if the gift be not cheerful in the giving and in the receiving there is not perfect nor zealous virtue in it this cheerfulness naught else can secure save utility which abides in the giver by the giving and which comes to the receiver by the receiving the giver then must show foresight in so doing that on his side remains the utility of the comeliness which is above all utility and in so doing that to the receiver shall go over the utility of the use of the thing given and thus the one and the other will be cheerful and consequently there will be more zealous liberality secondly because virtue should always move things for the better thus as it would be blameworthy action to make a spade out of a beautiful sword or to make a beautiful goblet out of a beautiful lyre so it is blameworthy to move a thing from a place where it is useful and bear it to a place where it will be less useful and because futile action is blameworthy it is blameworthy not only to put a thing where it will be less useful but also to put it where it will be equally useful wherefore in order that the changing of things may be praiseworthy it must ever be for the better because it should aim at being praiseworthy in the highest degree and the gift cannot effect this except it become more dear by the change nor can it become more dear except it become more useful for the receiver to use than the giver whence the conclusion follows that the gift must be useful to him who receives it in order that there may be zealous liberality in the giving thirdly because the operation of virtue ought in itself to acquire friends since our life has need of such and the end of virtue is that our life should be satisfied wherefore in order that the gift may make the receiver friendly it should be useful to him because utility stamps the memory with the image of the gift which same is the food of friendship and it stamps the more strongly in measure as the utility is greater wherefore martin is wont to say i shall not forget the present which john made me so that in order for its proper virtue to reside in the gift to wit liberality and for it to be zealous the gift must be useful to him who receives it finally because virtue should be free and not constrained in its actions action is free when a person goes spontaneously in any direction and it is shown by his turning his face that way action is constrained when a man goes against his will and it is shown in his not looking in the direction in which he is going now the gift looks that way when it is directed to the need of him who receives it and since it cannot be directed thereto unless it is useful in order that the virtue may be free in its action the gift must have free course in the direction in which it travels together with the receiver and consequently the utility of the receiver must be comprised in the gift in order that there may be zealous liberality in it the third thing wherein zealous liberality may be noted is giving without being asked because when a thing is asked for then the transaction is on one side not a matter of virtue but of commerce inasmuch as he who receives buys though he who gives sells not wherefore seneca saith that nothing is bought more dear than that on which prayers are spent wherefore in order that there may be zealous liberality in the gift and that it may be noted therein it behoves that it be clear of every feature of merchandise and so the gift must be unasked why the thing begged for costs so dear i do Section three of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise one chapters nine through thirteen 
chapter nine now from all the three above-named conditions which must unite in order that zealous liberality may reside in a benefaction the latin commentary would have been remote whereas the vernacular is accompanied by them as may be manifestly demonstrated thus the latin would not have served many for if we call to mind what was said above lettered men who have not the italian tongue could not have enjoyed this service and as for those who have this tongue should we choose to examine closely who they are we shall find that they would have been served by it perhaps in the proportion of one to a thousand for the rest would not have received it so zealous are they towards avarice which parts them from all nobility of mind which is the chief cause for desiring this food and in reproof of them i say that they ought not to be called lettered because they do not acquire literature for its own use but just in so far as they may gain money or office by it just as we ought not to call him a harper who hath a harp in his house to hire out for a price and not to use it to play upon returning then to the main proposition i say that it is clear enough how the latin would have conferred its benefit upon few whereas verily the vernacular will be of service to many for goodness of mind which awaits this service is to be found in them who by the grievous disuse of the world have abandoned literature to such as have made her a harlot instead of a lady which noble ones are princes barons and knights and many other noble folk not only men but women of which men and women alike there are many of this tongue who command the vernacular but are not lettered further latin would not have been the giver of a useful gift which the vernacular will be because nothing is useful save in so far as it is used nor does its excellence consist in potentiality which is not perfected existence as in the case of gold gems and other treasures which be buried albeit those which are in the hand of a miser are in a baser place than is the earth wherein the treasure is hidden now what this comment gives verily is the meaning of the odes for which purpose it is made the principal design whereof is to lead men to knowledge and virtue as will be seen in the progress of the treatment of them of this meaning none can avail themselves save such in whom true nobility is sown after the fashion which will be related in the fourth treatise and almost all of these command the vernacular only even as those noble ones named above in this chapter and this is not contradicted by a lettered man here and there being one of them for as saith my master aristotle in the first of the ethics one swallow does not make spring it is plain then that the vernacular will give a useful thing whereas the latin would not have given it further the vernacular will give a gift unasked which the latin would not have done for it will give itself as a commentary which was never yet asked by any one and this cannot be said of the latin for it has been demanded ere now as commentary and gloss to many writings as may be seen clearly at the head of many of the same and thus it is manifest 
that zealous liberality moved me to the vernacular rather than to the latin chapter ten great must be the excuse when at a banquet so noble in its viands and so distinguished in its guests oaten and not wheaten bread is presented and evident must be the reason which shall make a man depart from that which hath long been observed by others to wit commenting in latin and therefore the reason must be made manifest for the issue of new things is uncertain because there hath never been experience thereof by which things of usage and tradition are regulated both in their progress and in their end and this is why reason was moved to command that men should have careful respect of entering on a new path saying that in ordaining new things the reason must be evident which shall make us depart from that which hath long been of use let none marvel then if the digression of my apology be long but let him patiently endure its length as necessary and following it out i declare that inasmuch as it hath been shown how i was moved to the vernacular and forsook the latin commentary to prevent undue inversion of order and in zeal of liberality the order of the whole apology will have me show how i was moved thereto by the natural love of my own tongue which is the third and last reason which moved me to it here too i say that natural love chiefly moves the lover to three things the first is to magnify the loved object the next to be jealous for it the third is to defend it as every one may see continually happening and these three things made me adopt it to wit the vernacular for both naturally and incidentally i love it and have loved i was moved in the first place to magnify it and that herein i do magnify it may be seen by this reason albeit things can be magnified that is made great by many conditions of greatness none of them make so great as the greatness of their own proper excellence which is the mother and preserver of the other greatnesses wherefore a man can have no greatness more than that of the virtuous operation which is his own proper excellence whereby the greatness of true dignities and of true honours of true power of true riches of true friends of true and clear fame are both acquired and preserved and this greatness do i give to this friend inasmuch as the excellence which it had in potentiality and in secret i make it have in actuality and publicity in its own proper operation which is to make manifest the thought conceived i was moved in the second place by jealousy for it jealousy for a friend makes a man take anxious thought for his distant future wherefore reflecting that the desire to understand these odes would have induced some unlettered man to have the latin commentary translated into the vernacular and fearing lest the vernacular should be set down by one who should make it appear hideous as did he who translated the latin of the ethics i was careful myself to set it down trusting rather in myself than in another i was further moved to defend it from its many detractors who dispraise it and commend the others 
especially the long dock, saying that this is more beauteous and better than that, departing herein from the truth. For by this comment the great excellence of the vernacular of C will be perceived, to wit how by it the most lofty and most novel conceptions are expressed, well nigh as aptly, as adequately, and as gracefully as in Latin itself. For in rhymed compositions, because of the incidental adornments which are inwoven therein, to wit, rhyme and rhythm and regulated number, its own excellence cannot be made manifest, no more than the beauty of a woman can when the adornment of decking and of garments brings her more admiration than she brings herself. Wherefore, let him who would rightly judge of a woman look on her when only her natural beauty accompanies her, severed from all incidental adornment. Even as this comment will be, wherein shall be perceived the smoothness of its syllables, the propriety of its rules, and the sweet discourses that are made of it, all which he who shall rightly consider it will perceive to be full of sweetest and most attractive beauty. But since it is a most effective part of invention to demonstrate the viciousness and malice of the accuser, I will tell, to the confusion of those who accuse the Italian speech, what it is that moves them thereto. And of this I will presently make a separate chapter, that their infamy may be the more conspicuous. CHAPTER Eleven, To the perpetual infamy and suppression of the evil men of Italy, who prize the vernacular of another, and disprize their own, I declare that their impulse arises from five detestable causes. The first, blindness in discernment. The second, disingenuous excusing. The third, desire of vain glory. The fourth, the prompting of envy. The fifth and last, abjectness of mind or pusillanimity. And each one of these guilty tendencies has so great a following that there be few exempt from them. Of the first, one may thus discourse. Like as the sensitive part of the mind hath its eyes whereby it apprehendeth the difference of things, in so far as they are colored externally, even so hath the rational part its eye, whereby it apprehendeth the difference of things, in so far as they be ordained to some certain end. And this same eye is discernment. And like as he who is blind with the eyes of sense must ever judge of evil or good according to others, so he who is blind of the light of discernment must ever follow in his judgment after mere report, true or false. And so, whensoever the leader is blind, he himself, and also the one blind likewise, who leaneth upon him, must needs come to an evil end. Wherefore it is written that the blind shall lead the blind, and so shall they both fall into the ditch. Now this same report hath long been counter to our vernacular, for reasons which shall be discoursed of below, following the which the blind ones spoken of above, who are almost without number, with their hands upon the shoulders of these liars, have fallen into the ditch of the false opinion 
from which they know not how to escape to the habit of this light of discernment the populace are specially blinded because they are occupied from the beginning of their lives with some trade and so direct their minds to it by force of necessity that they give heed to naught else and because the habit of a virtue whether moral or intellectual may not be had of a sudden but must needs be acquired by practice and they devote their practice to some art and are not careful to discern other things it is impossible for them to have discernment wherefore it comes to pass that they often cry long live their death and death to their life if only some one raised the cry and this is the most perilous defect involved in their blindness wherefore boethius considers popular glory an empty thing because he sees that it has no discernment such are to be regarded as sheep and not men for if one sheep were to fling itself over a precipice of a thousand paces all the others would go after it and if one sheep leap for any reason as it passes a street all the others leap although they see nothing to leap over and ere now i myself have seen one after another leap into a well because one leapt into it thinking i suppose that it was leaping over a wall although the shepherd wailing and shouting set himself with arms and breast before them the second sect who oppose our vernacular is made up by disingenuous excusings there are many who love to be thought masters rather than to be such and to avoid the opposite to wit not being thought such they ever find fault with the material of their art that is furnished them or else the instrument for example a bad smith finds fault with the iron furnished him and a bad harper finds fault with the harp thinking to throw the blame of the bad knife or the bad music upon the iron and upon the harp and to remove it from himself and in like manner there be some and they are not few who would have men think them poets and to excuse themselves for not poetizing or for poetizing badly they accuse and blame the material to wit their own vernacular and praise that of others which they are not required to forge and if any one would see how far this iron is really to be blamed let him look upon the works which the good artificers make from it and he will recognize the disingenuousness of those who by blaming it think to excuse themselves against such as these tully cries out in the beginning of a book of his which is called the book concerning the goal of good because in his time they found fault with the latin of the romans and commended the grammar of the greeks for the like reasons for which these others now make the italian speech cheap and that of provence precious the third sect against our vernacular is made up by desire of vain glory there are many who by handling things composed in some tongue not their own and by commending the said tongue look to be more admired than by handling things in their own tongue and doubtless it is a matter of some praise of intellect rightly to apprehend a foreign tongue 
but it is blameworthy to commend it beyond the truth in order to vaunt oneself for such acquirement the fourth is made up by the prompting of envy as was said above there is envy wherever there is similarity amongst men of one tongue there is similarity in vernacular and because one cannot handle it as another can envy springs up so the envious man goes subtly to work and doth not find with him who poetizes the fault of not knowing how to write but finds fault with that which is the material of his work so that by sliding the work on that side he may deprive the poet of honor and of fame as one should find fault with the steel of a sword for the sake of discrediting not the steel but the whole work of the master the fifth and last sect is impelled by abjectness of mind the large-souled man ever exalts himself in his heart and so counterwise the small-souled man ever holds himself less than he really is and because magnifying and minifying always have regard to something in comparison to which the large-souled man makes himself great and the small-souled man makes himself little it comes to pass that the large-souled man always makes others of less account than they are and the small-souled man of more and because with the same measure wherewith a man measures himself he measures the things that are his which are as it were a part of himself it comes to pass that the large-souled man's things always seem to him better than they are and the things of others worse and the small-souled man always thinks of his things of little worth and the things of others of much wherefore many by reason of this abjectness depreciate their own vernacular and praise that of others and all these together make up the detestable wretches of italy who hold cheap that costly vernacular if which be vile in aught it is only in so far as it sounds upon the prostitute lips of these adulterers by whose guidance the blind men go of whom i made mention under the head of the first cause chapter twelve if the flame of fire were issuing plain to see from the windows of a house and one should ask whether there was a fire therein and another should answer him yea i could not well judge which of the two were most to be derided and of no other fashion were his question and my answer should one ask me after the reason set forth above whether love of my own tongue is in me and should i answer him yea but none the less i have yet to show that not only love but most perfect love of it abides in me and i have yet further to denounce its adversaries and in demonstrating this to whoso shall rightly understand i will tell how i became its friend and then how the friendship was confirmed i say then as tully may be seen to write in that of friendship not departing therein from the teaching of the philosopher set forth in the eighth and ninth of the ethics that nearness and excellence are the natural causes which generate love and benefaction 
community of study and comradeship are the causes which foster love and all these causes have been at work begetting and strengthening the love which i bear to my vernacular as i will briefly show a thing is near in proportion as of all the things of its kind it is most closely united to a man wherefore a son is nearest to his father and of all arts medicine is nearest to the doctor and music to the musician because they are more closely united to them than are the rest of all lands that is nearest to a man wherein he maintains himself because it is more closely united to him and thus a man's proper vernacular is nearest to him inasmuch as it is most closely united to him for it is singly and alone in his mind before any other and not only is it united to him essentially in itself but also incidentally inasmuch as it is conjoined with the persons closest to him as his relatives his fellow-citizens and his own people such then is a man's own vernacular which we will not call near but most nearest to him wherefore if nearness be the seed of friendship as was said above it is clear that it is amongst the causes of the love which i bear to my tongue which is most near to me above the others it was the above said cause namely that that is most closely united which at first has sole possession of the mind that gave rise to the custom which makes first-born sons succeed alone as the closer and because closer more loved again its excellence makes me its friend and here you are to know that every excellence proper to a thing is to be loved in that thing as in masculinity to be well bearded and in femininity to be well smooth of beard over all the face as in a setter good scent and in a boarhound good speed and the more proper is the excellence the better is it to be loved wherefore though every virtue is to be loved in man that is most to be loved in him which is most human and that is justice which abides only in the rational or intellectual part that is in the will this is so much to be loved that as the philosopher says in the fifth of the ethics they who are its foes as are robbers and plunderers love it and therefore we see that its contrary to wit injustice is most hated as treachery ingratitude forgery theft rapine cheating and their likes which be such inhuman sins that to shield himself from the infamy thereof long usage alloweth that man may speak of himself as was said above and that he have leave to declare himself faithful and loyal of this virtue i shall hereafter speak more at length in the fourteenth treatise and here leaving it i return to the matter in hand that has been shown then to be the most proper excellence of a thing which is most loved and praised in it and we must see in each case what that excellence is now we see that in all matters of speech rightly to manifest the conception is the most loved and commended this then is its prime excellence 
and inasmuch as this excellence abideth in our vernacular as hath been shown above in another chapter it is clear that it is of the causes of the love which i bear to the said vernacular because as already said excellence is a cause that generates love chapter thirteen having told how these two things exist in my own tongue whereby i was made its friend to wit its nearness to myself and its own excellence i will tell how by benefaction and harmony of study and the good will of long comradeship the friendship has been confirmed and fostered i say first that i in myself have received the greatest of benefactions from it and therefore be it known that amongst all benefactions that is greatest which is most precious to him who receives it and nothing is so precious as that for the sake of which all the others are desired and all other things are desired for the perfection of him who desires them wherefore since a man hath two perfections the first and the second the first gives him being and the second gives him well-being if my proper tongue hath been the cause both of the one and of the other i have received the very greatest benefaction from it and that it hath been the cause of my existence if my being here at all did not establish it may be briefly shown may not there be many efficient causes with respect to one thing though one of them be so in a higher degree than the others for the fire and the hammer are efficient causes of the knife though the smith is so in chiefest place now this my vernacular it was that brought together them who begat me for by it they spoke even as the fire disposes the iron for the smith who is making the knife wherefore it is manifest that it took part in my begetting and so was a certain cause of my being moreover this my vernacular led me into the way of knowledge which is our specific perfection inasmuch as by it i entered upon latin which was explained to me in it which latin was then my path to further advance wherefore it is plain and is acknowledged by me that it hath been my benefactor in the highest degree also it hath been of one same purpose with me which i can thus prove everything naturally studies its own preservation wherefore if the vernacular could in itself pursue any purpose it would study this preservation and this would be adapting itself to greater stability and greater stability it could not have save by binding itself in numbers and in rhymes and this same study hath been mine as is so manifest as to need no witness wherefore one same study hath been common to it and to me whence by this harmony our friendship hath been confirmed and fostered further ours is the good will of comradeship for from the beginning of my life i have abode in good will and communion with it and have used it in pondering in explaining and in questioning wherefore if friendship grows by comradeship as is plain to the sense it is manifest that it hath grown in me to the highest 
since I have passed all my time in company with this same vernacular. Wherefore it appears that all the causes which can generate and foster friendship have combined for this friendship. Whence the conclusion that not only love, but most perfect love for it, is that which I ought to have, and which I have. So, turning back our eyes, and gathering up the reasons already noted, it may be seen that this bread with which the viands of the odes written below must be eaten is sufficiently purged from its blemishes, and from being made of oats. Wherefore it is time to set about serving the viands. This shall be that oaten bread whereby thousands shall be sated, and my baskets shall be left full for me. This shall be the new light, the new sun, which shall rise when the wonted sun shall set, and shall give light to them who are in darkness and in shadow as to the wonted sun which shines not for them. Section 4 of The Convivial This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivial by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip K. Wicksteed. Ode 1. Voi che intendendo il terzo ciel movete. Ye who by understanding move the third heaven, hearken to the discourse which is in my heart for I may not tell it to any other, so strange it seemeth me. Tis the heaven which followeth your worth, gentle creatures that ye be, that draweth me into the state wherein I find me. Wherefore the discourse of the life which I endure, me seems, were worthily directed unto you. Therefore I pray that ye give me heed anent it. I will tell the wondrous story of my heart, how the sad soul waileth in it, and how a spirit discourseth counter to her that cometh upon the rays of your star. Is wont to be the life of my grieving heart, a sweet thought that would take its way many a time to the feet of your sire, where it beheld a lady in glory of whom it discoursed to me so sweetly that my soul said ever, Fain would I go thither. Now one appears who puts him to flight and lords it over me with such might that my heart so trembles thereat as to reveal it in outward semblance. He makes me gaze upon a lady and saith, Who would behold salvation, heedfully let him look upon this lady's eyes if he fear not the anguish of sighings. Findeth such an adversary as destroyeth him the humble thought that is wont to discourse to me of an angel who is crowned in heaven. The soul wails, so doth she still grieve thereat, and saith, O wretched me, how fleeth that tender one who hath consoled me! Of my eyes this afflicted one exclaimeth, What hour was that wherein such a lady looked upon them? And wherefore did they not believe me concerning her? I ever said, Verily in her eyes must he need stand who slays my peers. And my perceiving it availed me naught against their gazing upon such a one that I am slain thereby. Thou art not slain, only thou art dismayed, O soul of ours who dost so lament thee, saith a little spirit of gentle love. For this fair lady, whom thou perceivest, hath so transformed thy life that thou art terrified, 
so cowardly hast thou become see how tender she is and humble sage and courteous in her greatness and think henceforth to call her lady for if thou deceive not thyself thou shalt see adornment of such lofty miracles that thou shalt say love very lord behold thy handmaid do as pleaseth thee tornata ode i believe that they shall be but rare who shall rightly understand thy meaning so intricate and knotty is thy utterance of it wherefore if perchance it come about that thou take thy way into the presence of folk who seem not rightly to perceive it then i pray thee to take heart again and say to them o my beloved Section 5 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Section 5. Treatise 2, Chapters 1 to 6. Chapter 1. Now that, by way of introductory discourse, my bread has been sufficiently prepared by my ministration in the preceding treatise, time calls and requires that my ship should issue from the port. Wherefore, adjusting the sail of reason to the breeze of my longing, I enter upon the open sea, with the hope of a fair journey and of a wholesome port and praiseworthy, at the close of this my feast. But that this my food be the more profitable, ere the first viands are served, I would show how it must be eaten. I say that, as was told in the first chapter, this exposition must be both literal and allegorical, and that this may be understood it should be known that writings may be taken and should be expounded chiefly in four senses. The first is called the literal, and it is the one that extends no further than the letter as it stands. The second is called the allegorical, and is the one that hides itself under the mantle of these tales, and is a truth hidden under beauteous fiction. As when Ovid says that Orpheus, with his lyre, made wild beasts tame and made trees and rocks approach him, which would say that the wise man with the instrument of his voice maketh cruel hearts tender and humble, and moveth to his will such as have not the life of science and of art. For they that have not the rational life are as good as stones. And why this way of hiding was devised by the sages will be shown in the last treatise but one. It is true that the theologians take this sense otherwise than the poets do, but since it is my purpose here to follow the method of the poets, I shall take the allegorical sense after the use of the poets. The third sense is called the moral, and this is the one that lecturers should go intently noting throughout the scriptures for their own behoof and that of their disciples. Thus we may note in the gospel, when Christ ascended the mountain for the transfiguration, that of the twelve apostles he took with him but three, wherein the moral may be understood that in the most secret things we should have but few companions. The fourth sense is called the anagogical, that is to say, above the sense, and this is when a scripture is spiritually expounded, which even in the literal sense, by the very things it signifies, signifies again some portion of the supernal things of eternal glory, as may be seen in that song of the prophet which saith that when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, Judea was made whole and free, which, although it be manifestly true according to the letter, is none the less true in its spiritual intention to wit, that when the soul goeth forth out of sin, it is made holy and free in its power. And in thus expounding, the literal sense should always come first, as the one in the meaning whereof the others are included, and without which it were impossible and irrational to attend to the others, and especially to the allegorical. It is impossible, because in everything that has an inside and an outside it is impossible to come at the inside, save we first come at the outside. Wherefore, inasmuch as in the scriptures, the literal sense, is ever outside, it is impossible to come at the others without first coming at the literal. Again it is impossible, because in every natural and artificial thing it is impossible to proceed to the form without first duly disposing the subject on which the form must be impressed. Just as it is impossible for the form of gold to accrue if the material, to wit its subject, be not first digested and prepared, or for the form of a chest to come if the material, to wit the wood, be not first disposed and prepared. 
wherefore inasmuch as the literal meaning is always the subject and material of the others especially the allegorical it is impossible to come at the knowledge of the others before coming at the knowledge of it further it is impossible because in every natural or artificial thing it is impossible to proceed unless the foundation be first made as in a house and as in study wherefore since the demonstration is the building up of knowledge and the literal demonstration is the foundation of the others especially the allegorical it is impossible to come at the others before coming at this again suppose it were possible it would be irrational that is to say out of order and would therefore be carried on with much irksomeness and with much error wherefore saith the philosopher in the first of the physics nature wills that we should proceed in due order in our learning to wit by proceeding from that which we know better to that which we know not so well i say that nature wills it inasmuch as this way of learning is naturally born in us and therefore if the other senses are less known than the literal which it is manifestly apparent that they are it would be irrational to proceed to demonstrate them if the literal had not been demonstrated first i shall always first discourse concerning each ode as to the literal sense of the same and after that i shall discourse of its allegory that is its hidden truth and from time to time i shall touch upon the other senses incidentally as shall suit place and time chapter two to begin with then i say that the star of venus had twice already revolved in that circle of hers which makes her appear at even or at morn according to the two diverse periods since the passing away of that blessed beatrice who liveth in heaven with the angels and on earth with my soul when that gentle lady of whom i made mention in the end of the vita nuova first appeared to my eyes accompanied with love and took some place in my mind and as is told by me in the aforesaid book more of her gentleness than of my choice it came to pass that i consented to be hers for she showed herself to be impassioned by so great pity for my widowed life that the spirits of my eyes became in supreme degree her friends and when thus affected they so wrought within me that my pleasure was content to put itself at the disposal of this image but because love cometh not to birth and growth and perfect state in a moment but needeth some certain time and nourishment of thoughts especially where there be counter thoughts that impede it it was necessary ere this new love became perfect that there should be much strife between the thought which nourished it and that which was counter to it and which still held the citadel of my mind on behalf of that glorified beatrice wherefore the one was constantly reinforced from before and the other by memory from behind and the reinforcement from before increased day by day which the other might not as hindering me in a certain sense from turning my face backwards wherefore it seemed to me so strange and also so hard to endure that i might not sustain it and with a kind of cry to excuse myself for the change wherein methought i showed lack of firmness i directed my voice to that quarter whence came the victory of the new thought and the same being a celestial virtue was most victorious and i began to say ye who by understanding move the third heaven rightly to grasp the meaning of the ode it is necessary first to understand its divisions so that it may thereafter be easy to perceive its meaning and that there may be no need of setting these same words in front of the expositions of the other odes i say that this same order which will be observed in this treatise it is my intention to follow in all the others i say then that the ode before us is composed of three chief parts the first is the first verse of it wherein are introduced that they may hearken to that which i intend to say certain intelligences or to name them after the more customary use certain angels which are said over the revolution of the heaven of venus as its movers the second is the three verses which follow after the first wherein is shown that which was heard in the spirit within as between the diverse thoughts the third is the fifth and last verse wherein a man is wont to address the work itself as though to hearten it and all these three parts in order are to be expounded after the fashion above expressed chapter three the more clearly i discern the literal sense which is our present concern of the first part according to the above division we must know who and how many are they who summon to hear me and what is this third heaven which i declare that they move and first i will speak of the heaven and then i will speak of those to whom i address myself and albeit these things in proportion to the reality may be but little known yet what little human reason sees of them hath more delight than the much and certain concerning things whereof we judge more fully according to the opinion of the philosopher in that of the animals i say then that concerning the number of the heavens and their position diverse opinions have been held by many although the truth hath at last been found aristotle following only the ancient grossness of the astrologers 
believed that there were no more than eight heavens, the extremest of which, containing all the sum of things, was that whereon the stars are fixed, to wit, the eighth sphere, and that outside of that there was no other. Moreover, he believed that the heaven of the sun came next after that of the moon, and that it was the second from us. In this so erroneous opinion of his, who so wills may see in the second of heaven in the world, which is in the second of the books of nature. But truly he shows his excuse for this in the twelfth of the metaphysics, where he lets us clearly see that he was just following the opinion of others, where he had to speak of astrology. Thereafter Ptolemy, perceiving that the eighth sphere had more than one movement, since he saw that its circle departed from the direct circle, which turns the whole from east to west, constrained by the principles of philosophy, which of necessity will have a prima mobile of perfect simplicity, laid down the existence of another heaven, outside that of the stars, which should make that revolution from east to west. And I say that it is completed in about four and twenty hours. That is, in twenty hours, in three hours and fourteen out of fifteen parts of another, roughly reckoning so that according to him and according to the tenets of astrology and philosophy, after the observation of these motions, the moving heavens are nine, and their relative position is manifested and determined according as, by the arts of perspective, arithmetic, and geometry, it is perceived by sense and reason, and by further observation of the senses, as in the eclipse of the sun, it appears sensibly that the moon is beneath the sun, and by the testimony of Aristotle, who saw with his own eyes, as he tells us in the second, of heaven and the world, the moon, being at the half, passed below Mars with her darkened side, and Mars remained hidden till he reappeared from the other shining side of the moon, which was facing the west. Chapter 4 And the order of their position is this. The first in the enumeration is that wherein is the moon. The second is that wherein is Mercury. The third is that wherein is Venus. The fourth is that wherein is the sun. The fifth is that wherein is Mars. The sixth is that wherein is Jupiter, the seventh is that wherein is Saturn, the eighth is that of the fixed stars, the ninth is that which is not perceived by the senses save by that movement which was spoken of above, and it is called by many the crystalline heaven, that is, the diaphanous, or all transparent. But beyond all these the Catholics assert the empyrean heaven, which is as much as to say the heaven of flame, or the luminous heaven, and they assert it to be immovable because it hath in itself with respect to every part that which its manner demandeth. And this is the cause of the prima mobile having the swiftest motion, because by reason of the most fervid appetite wherewith every part of this ninth heaven, which is the next below it, longeth to be conjoined with every part of this divinest and tranquil heaven, it revolves therein with so great yearning that its swiftness is scarce to be comprehended. But still and tranquil is the place of that supreme deity which alone completely perceiveth itself, this is the place of the blessed spirits, according as holy church, which may not lie, will have it. And Aristotle likewise seemeth to agree hereto, to who so rightly understandeth, in the first of heaven and the world. This is the sovereign edifice of the world, wherein all the world is included, and outside of which there is not. And it is not itself in space, but was formed only in the primal mind, which the Greeks call protonoi. This is that magnificence whereof the psalmist spoke, when he saith to God, Thy magnificence is exalted above the heavens. And thus, gathering up what hath been discovered, it appears that there are ten heavens, of which that of Venus is the third, whereof mention is made in that passage which I am intent on expounding. And be it known that every heaven beneath the crystalline has two poles fixed with respect to itself, and the ninth has them firm and fixed, and immutable in every respect, and each one the ninth as well as the rest, has a circle which may be called the equator of its proper heaven, which is equally distant in every part of its revolution from either pole, as he may see by the senses who revolves an apple or other circular thing. And this circle in each heaven hath greater swiftness of motion than any other part in that heaven, as may be seen by whoso rightly considereth, and each part, in proportion, as it is nearer thereto, moveth more rapidly and in proportion as it is remote therefrom and nearer to the pole more slowly, because its revolution is smaller and must of necessity take place in the same time as the greater. I say further that in proportion as the heaven is nearer to the equatorial circle, it is more noble in comparison to its poles, because it hath more movement and more actuality and more life and more form, and it touches more of the one which is above, and by consequence hath more virtue. 
and so the stars of the starry heaven are fuller of virtue, as between themselves, the nearer they are to this circle. And upon the hump of this circle, in the heaven of Venus, of which we are at present treating, is a spherule, which revolves on its own account in that heaven, the circle of which the astrologers call an epicycle. And even as the great sphere revolves on two poles, so does this little one, and so has this little one its equatorial circle, and so is it more noble in proportion as it is nearer thereto, and upon the arc or hump of this circle is fixed the most shining star of Venus. And although it be said that there are ten heavens, according to very truth this number doth not embrace them all. For this, of which mention hath been made, to wit the epicycle whereon the star is fixed, is a heaven or sphere of itself, and it hath not one same essence with that which beareth it, though it be more co-natural to it than to the others. It is spoken of as one heaven with it, and the one and the other is called the heaven of the star. How the other heavens and the other stars be, we are not at present to treat. Let that suffice which hath been said of the truth of the third heaven, with which I am at present concerned, and as to which all that is needful for us for the present purpose has been completely expounded. CHAPTER Five. Now that it has been demonstrated in the preceding chapter what this third heaven is, and how it is disposed in itself, it remains to expound who they be who move it. Be it known, therefore, firstly, that the movers thereof are substances, say junct from matter, to wit intelligences, which are vulgarly called angels. And of these creatures, as of the heavens, diverse have held diverse opinions, albeit the truth has been now found. There were certain philosophers, of whom Aristotle appears to be in his metaphysics, although in the first of heaven and the world he incidentally appears to think otherwise, who believed that there were only so many of them as there were circulating in the heavens, and no more, saying that the rest would have been eternally in vain without operation, which they held was impossible, inasmuch as their being consists in their operation. Others were there, such as Plato, a man of supreme excellence, who laid down not only as many intelligences as there are movements of heaven, but just as many as there are kinds of things. As all men one kind, and all gold another kind, and all riches another, and so throughout the whole. And they would have it, that as the intelligences of the heavens are the generators of the same, each of his own, so those others were the generators of the other things, and the exemplars each one of its own kind. And Plato calls them ideas, which is as much as to say forms and universals. The Gentiles called them gods and goddesses, though they did not conceive them so philosophically as did Plato, and they adored images of them, and made most magnificent temples for them. For Juno, for example, whom they called the goddess of power, for Vulcan, whom they called god of fire, for Pallas, or Minerva, whom they called goddess of wisdom, and for Ceres, whom they called goddess of corn. The which opinion is manifested by the testimony of the poets, who from time to time outline the fashion of the Gentiles both in their sacrifices and in their faith, and it is also manifested in many ancient names, which survive either as names or as surnames of places and of ancient buildings, as whoso will may easily discover." And although the above-mentioned opinions were furnished by human reason and by no small observation, the truth was not yet perceived, and this both by defect of reason and by defect of instruction. For even reason may perceive that the above-said creatures are in far greater number than are the effects which men are able to note. And one reason is this. No one, neither philosopher, nor Gentile, nor Jew, nor Christian, nor any sect, doubts that either all of them, or the greater part, are full of all blessedness, or doubts that these blessed ones are in the most perfect state. And as, inasmuch as human nature, as it here exists, hath not only one blessedness but two, to wit that of the civil life and that of the contemplative life, it were irrational that we perceive those others to have the blessedness of the active, that is the civil life, in guiding the world, and not that of the contemplative life, which is more excellent and more divine." And inasmuch as the one that hath the blessedness of guiding may not have the other, because their intellect is one and continuous, there must needs be others exempt from this ministry whose life consists only in speculation. And because this life is the more divine, and because in proportion as a thing is more divine it is more like to God, it is manifest that this life is more loved by God. And if it be more loved, its share of blessedness hath been more ample. And if it be more ample, he hath assigned more living beings to it than to the other." Wherefore we conclude that the number of these creatures is very far in excess of what the effects reveal. And this is not counter to what Aristotle seems to say in the tenth of the Ethics, to wit that the speculative life alone fits with the sejunct substances. 
for if we allow that the speculative life alone fits with them, yet upon the speculation of certain of these followeth the circulation of the heavens, which is the guiding of the world, which world is a kind of ordered civility perceived in the speculation of its movers. The second reason is that no effect is greater than its cause, for the cause cannot give what itself hath not. Wherefore, since the divine intellect is the cause of everything, especially of the human intellect, it follows that the human intellect transcendeth not the divine, but it is out of all proportion transcended by it, so that if we, for the reason above given, and for many others, understand that God could have made almost innumerable spiritual creatures, it is manifest that he hath indeed made this greater number. Many other reasons may be perceived, but let these suffice for the present." nor let any marvel if these and other reasons which we may have for this belief are not brought to complete demonstration. Because for that very reason we should wonder at the excellence of these beings, which transcends the eyes of the human mind, as saith the philosopher in the second of the metaphysics, and should affirm their existence. For albeit we have no perception of them by sense, wherefrom our knowledge hath its rise, yet is there in our intellect a kind of reflected glow of the light of their most vivid existence, in so far as we perceive the above said reasons and many others, just as a man whose eyes are closed may affirm that the air is luminous because of some certain glow, or as a ray that passes through the pupils of the bat. For even so are the eyes of our intellect closed, so long as the mind is bound and imprisoned by the organs of our body. CHAPTER six. It hath been said that by defect of instruction the ancients perceived not the truth concerning the spiritual creatures, albeit the people of Israel were in part instructed by their prophets, through whom, after many manners of speech and by many modes, God spoke to them, even as saith the Apostle. But as for us, we have been taught about this by him who came from him, by him who made them, by him who preserves them, to wit the Emperor of the universe, who is Christ, son of the sovereign God, and son of the Virgin Mary, very woman, and daughter of Joachim and Anna, very man who was slain by us whereby he brought us life. And he was the light which lightens us in the darkness, as says John the Evangelist. And he told us the truth of these things, which we might not know without him, nor see them as they are in truth. The first thing, and the first secret which he showed us there anent, was one of the aforesaid creatures themselves, which was that great ambassador of his who came to marry, a young damsel of thirteen years, on the part of the holy king celestial. This our Saviour said with his own mouth, that the Father could give him many legions of angels. When it was said to him that the Father had given commandment to his angels to minister unto him and serve him, he denied it not. Wherefore it is manifest to us that these creatures exist in most extended number, because his spouse and secretary, Holy Church, of whom Solomon saith, Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, full of those things that give delight, leaning upon her friend? Affirms, believes, and preaches that these most noble creatures are, as it were, innumerable, and she divides them into three hierarchies, which is to say, three holy or divine principalities. And each hierarchy has three orders, so that the church holds and affirms nine orders of spiritual creatures. The first is that of the angels, the second of the archangels, the third of the thrones. And these three orders make the first hierarchy, not first in the order of nobility, nor in order of creation, for the others are more noble, and all were created at once, but first in the order of our ascent to their loftiness, Next come the dominations, afterwards the virtues, then the principalities, and all these make the second hierarchy. Above these are the powers and the cherubim, and above all are the seraphim, and these make the third hierarchy. And the number of the hierarchies, and that of the orders, constitutes a most potent system of their speculation. For inasmuch as the divine majesty is in three persons which have one substance, they may be contemplated in threefold manner for the supreme power of the Father may be contemplated. And this it is that the first hierarchy, to wit first in nobility and last in our enumeration, gazes upon. And the supreme wisdom of the Son may be contemplated. And this is that the second hierarchy gazes upon. And the supreme and most burning love of the Holy Spirit may be contemplated. And this is that the third hierarchy gazes upon. The which, being nearest unto us, gives us of the gifts which it receiveth and inasmuch as each person of the divine trinity may be considered in threefold manner, there are in each hierarchy three orders diversely contemplating. The Father may be considered without respect to aught save himself. In this contemplation the seraphim do use, who see more of the first cause than any other angelic nature. 
the father may be considered according as he hath relation to the son, to wit how he is parted from him and how united with him. In this do the cherubim contemplate. The father may further be considered according as from him proceedeth the Holy Spirit, and how he is parted from him and how united with him. In this contemplation the powers do use. And in like fashion there may be speculation of the son and of the Holy Spirit. Wherefore it behoves that there be nine manners of contemplating spirits to gaze upon the light which alone seeth itself completely. And here is a word which may not be passed in silence. I say that out of all these orders some certain were lost so soon as they were created. I take it to the number of a tenth part, for the restoration of which human nature was afterward created. The revolving heavens, which are nine, declare the numbers, the orders, and the hierarchies, and the tenth proclaimeth the very oneness and stability of God. And therefore, saith the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament proclaimeth the works of his hands. Wherefore it is rational to believe that the movers of the moon be of the order of angels, and those of Mercury be archangels, and those of Venus be thrones, the which, taking their nature from the love of the Holy Spirit, make their work co-natural thereto, to wit the movement of that heaven, which is full of love. Whence the form of the said heaven conceiveth an ardor of virtue to kindle souls down here to love, according to their disposition. And because the ancients perceived that this heaven was the cause of love down here, they said that love was the son of Venus. Even as Virgil testifieth in the first of the Aeneid, where Venus saith to love, My son, my power, son of the supreme father, who heedest not the darts of Typhius. And Ovid in the fifth of the Metamorphosis, when he tells how Venus said to love, My son, my arms, my might. And it is these thrones that be appointed for the guidance of this heaven, in no great number. But the philosophers and the astrologers have diversely estimated it, according as they diversely estimated the circulation of the heavens, although all be at one, in this that they be so many as the movements which the heaven makes, which movements, according as we find the best demonstration of the astrologers summarized in the book of the Collection of the Stars, three, one according to which the star moves in its epicycle, the second according as the epicycle moves together with its whole heaven, equally with that of the sun, the third according as that same whole heaven moves, following the movement of the starry sphere, from west to east one degree in a hundred years. So that for these three movements there are three movers, Further, the whole of this heaven is moved and revolves together with the epicycle, from east to west, once every natural day. Whether which movement be of some intellect, or whether it be of the swaying of the prima mobile, God knoweth. For me it seemeth presumptuous to judge. It is by understanding solely that these movers produce the circulation in that proper subject which each moveth. The most noble form of heaven, which hath in itself the principle of this passive nature, revolves at the touch of the moving virtue which understandeth it, and I mean by touch, not bodily touch, but virtue which directeth itself thereto. Section 6 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Section 6. Treatise 2. Chapters 7 through 12. Chapter 7. According as was said above in the third chapter of this treatise, rightly to understand the first part of the ode before us, it was needful to discourse of those heavens and of their movers. And discoursed it hath been in the three preceding chapters. I say then to those whom I have shown to be the movers of the heaven of Venus, ye who by understanding, to wit with intellect alone, as said above, move the third heaven, hearken to the discourse. And I say not, hearken, as though they hear any sound, for they have not sense, but I say hearken to wit, that hearing which they have, which is understanding by the intellect. I say, Hearken to the discourse which is in my heart, to wit inside of me, for it hath not yet appeared without. Be it known that in all this ode, according to one sense and the other, the heart is to be taken as the secret recess within, and not as any other special part of the soul or of the body. When I have called them to hearken to that which I would say, I assign two reasons I should fitly speak to them. The one is the strangeness of my state, 
which, since it hath not been experienced by other men, might not be so well understood by them as by those beings who understand their own effects in their operation. And this reason I hint at when I say, for I may not tell it to any other, so strange it seemeth me. The other reason is that when a man receiveth a benefit or a hurt, he should rehearse it to him who doth it to him, if he may, ere he rehearse it to another. So that if it be a benefit, he who receiveth it may show himself grateful towards the benefactor, and if it be a hurt, he may lead the doer by his gentle words to salutary compassion. In this reason I hint at, when I say, "'Tis the heaven which followeth your worth, gentle creatures that ye be, that draweth me into the state wherein I find me. That is to say, your operation, to wit, your circulation, is it that has drawn me into my present state. Wherefore I conclude, and say, that my speech ought to be to them, as was declared above, and this I say here. Wherefore the discourse of the life which I endure, me seems, were worthily directed unto you. And after assigning these reasons, I pray them to give heed, when I say, Therefore I pray that ye give me heed anent it. But inasmuch as in every manner of discourse the speaker should be chiefly intent on persuasion, to wit, on the propitiating those who hear him, which is the beginning of all other persuasions, as the rhetoricians know, and since the most potent persuasion to render the hearer attentive is the promise to tell novel and imposing things, I add this persuasion, or propitiation, to the prayers which I have made for a hearing, announcing to them my intention, which is to relate strange things to them, to wit, the strife which there is in my mind, and great things, to wit, the worth of their star. And this I say in these last words of the first part. I will tell the wondrous story of my heart, how the sad soul waileth in it, and how a spirit discurseth counter to her, that cometh upon the rays of your star. And for the full understanding of these words I say that this spirit is not else than a frequent thinking upon and commending and propitiating of this new lady, and this soul is not else than another thought, accompanied by assent, which, repelling the former, commends and propitiates the memory of Beatrice in glory. But inasmuch as the final verdict of the mind, that is, its assent, was still retained by that thought which supported the memory, I call it the soul, and the other a spirit. Just as when we speak of the city we are wont to mean those who are in possession of it, not those who are attacking it, albeit the one and the other be citizens. I say, then, that this spirit comes upon the rays of the star, because you are to know that the rays of each heaven are the path whereby their virtue descends upon things that are here below, and inasmuch as rays are no other than the shining which cometh from the source of the light through the air even to the thing enlightened, and the light is only in that part where the star is, because the rest of the heaven is diaphanous, that is, transparent, I say not that this spirit, to wit, this thought, cometh from their heaven in its totality, but from their star, which star, by reason of the nobility in them who move it, is of so great virtue that it has extreme power upon our souls and upon other affairs of ours, notwithstanding that it be distant, when nighest to us, one hundred and sixty-seven times as far as it is to the middle of the earth, which is a space of three thousand two hundred and fifty miles. And this is the literal exposition of the first part of the Ode. CHAPTER Eight. A sufficient understanding may be had by the above words of the literal meaning of the first part, wherefore attention is to be turned to the second, wherein is declared what I experienced within in the matter of this conflict. And this part hath two divisions, for in the first, to wit, in the first verse, I tell the quality of these conflicting thoughts according to their root, which was within me. Then I tell that which was urged by the one and the other conflicting thought, and so first that which the losing side urged. And this is in the verse, which is the second of this part, and the third of the ode. To make evident, then, the meaning of the first division, be it known that things should be named from the distinguishing nobility of their form. As man from reason, and not from sense, nor from aught else that is less noble. Hence, when we say that a man is living, it should be understood that the man hath the use of his reason, which is his special life, and is the actualizing of his most noble part. And therefore he who severs himself from reason, and hath only use of his sensitive part, doth not live as a man, but liveth as a beast, as saith that most excellent Boethius, he liveth as an ass. Rightly, as I maintain, because thought is the proper act of the reason, since beasts think not, because they have not reason, 
and I affirm this not only of the lesser beasts, but of those who have the semblance of man and the spirit of sheep or some other detestable beast. I say, then, that the life of my heart, that is, my inner life, was wont to be a sweet thought. Sweet is the same as suasive, that is, ingratiated, dulcet, pleasing, delightsome. Namely, that thought which often went to the sire of them to whom I speak, which is God, that is to say that I, in thought, contemplated the kingdom of the blessed. And straightway I declare the final cause why I rose up there in my thought, when I say, Where it beheld a lady in glory, to give to understand that I was certain, as I am by her gracious revelation, that she was in heaven. Wherefore, many a time, pondering on her as deeply as I might, I went thither as though rapt. Then following on I tell the effect of this thought, to give to understand its sweetness, which was so great that it made me long for death, to go thither where it went, and this, I say here, of whom it discoursed to me so sweetly, that my soul said ever, Fain would I go thither. And this is the root of one of the conflicting sides in me. And you are to know that I call it a thought, and not the soul which rose to look upon this one in bliss, because it was the special thought addressed to this act. Soul, as was said in the preceding chapter, means thought in general with assent. Then, when I say, Now one appears who putteth him to flight, I tell of the root of the other conflicting side, saying that even as this thought, spoken of above, was wont to be my life, so another appeareth which maketh it cease. I say putteth him to flight, to show that this is an adversary, for naturally one adversary flees the other, and the one that flees shows that it is by defect of valour that it flees, and I say that this thought, which newly appears, has power to lay hold of me, and to conquer the whole soul, saying that it so lords it that the heart, that is my inward self, trembles, and it is revealed without, by a certain changed semblance. Following on, I show the power of this new thought by its effect, saying that it maketh me gaze upon a lady, and saith flattering words to me, that it discurseth before my eyes of my intellectual affection, the better to draw me over promising me that the sight of her eyes is its wheel. And the better to gain this credence with the experienced soul, it says that the eyes of this lady are not to be looked upon by any who fears anguish of sighs. And this is a fine figure of rhetoric, when there is the outward appearance of depreciating a thing, and the inward reality of embellishing it. This new thought of love could not better draw my mind to consent than by so deeply discursing of the virtue of that lady's eyes. CHAPTER Nine. Now that it has been shown how and why love was born, in the conflict which distracted me, it is meet that we proceed to unveil the meaning of that part wherein diverse thoughts fight within me. I say that it is meet first to speak on the side of the soul, that is to say, the ancient thought, and then of the other. For this reason, that that upon which the speaker doth purpose to lay chiefest stress should ever be reserved for the last— because that which is last said doth most abide in the mind of the hearer. Wherefore, since it is my purpose to speak and to discourse more fully of that which the work of those beings whom I address makes than of that which it unmakes, it was reasonable first to speak and discourse of the condition of that side which was being destroyed, and then of that side which was being produced. But here arises a difficulty which is not to be passed over without explanation. Since love is the effect of these intelligences whom I am addressing, and the former thought was love as much as the latter, someone may ask why their power destroys the one and produces the other, whereas it should rather preserve than destroy the former, for the reason that every cause loves its effect, and loving it preserves it. To this question the answer may easily be given, to wit that their effect is indeed love, as hath been said, and inasmuch as they cannot preserve it, save in those objects which are subject to their circulation, they change it from that region which is outside their power to that which is within it that is to say, from the soul which has departed from this life to the soul which is yet in it. Just as human nature transfers its preservation of the human form from father to son, because it may not perpetually preserve its effect in the father himself. I say its effect inasmuch as the soul united with the body is in truth its effect, for the soul which is parted endureth perpetually in a nature more than human. And so is the problem solved. But inasmuch as the immortality of the soul has here been touched upon, I will make a digression. I will make a digression, discursing thereof, for in such discourse will be a fair ending of my speech concerning that living Beatrice, in bliss, of whom I propose to speak no further in this book. 
and by way of preface I say that of all stupidities that is the most foolish, the basest, and the most pernicious, which believes that after this life there is no other. For if we turn over all the scriptures, both of the philosophers and of the other sage writers, all agree in this that within us there is a certain part that endures. And this we see in the earnest contention of Aristotle, in that of the soul, this the earnest contention of all the Stoics, this the contention of Tully, especially in that booklet of old age. This we see in the contention of every poet who has spoken according to the faith of the Gentiles, this the contention of every religion, Jews, Saracens, and Tartars, and all others who live according to any law, so that if all of them were deceived, there would follow an impossibility which it would be horrible even to handle. Everyone is assured that human nature is the most perfect of all other natures here below, and this is denied of none. And Aristotle averreth it when he saith in the twelfth of the animals that man is the most perfect of all the animals. Whence, inasmuch as many living creatures are entirely mortal, as are the brute beasts, and all are, so long as they live, without this hope to wit of another life, if our hope were vain, the flaw in us would be greater than in any other animal, because there have been many ere now who have surrendered this life for the sake of that, and so it would follow that the most perfect animal, to wit, man, was the most imperfect, which is impossible. In that part, to wit, the reason, which is his chief perfection, would be the cause to him of having this greater flaw, which seemeth a strange thing indeed to have err. Further, it would follow that nature had set this hope in the human mind in opposition to herself, since we have said that many have hastened to the death of the body for to live in the other life, and this is also impossible. Further, we witness unbroken experience of our immortality in the divinations of our dreams, which might not be if there were not some immortal part in us, inasmuch as the reveller, whether corporeal or incorporeal, must needs be immortal if we think it out subtly. And I say, whether corporeal or incorporeal, because of the diversity of opinion which I find in this matter, and that which is set in motion or informed by an immediate informer must stand in some ratio to the informer, and between the mortal and the immortal there is no ratio. And further we are assured of it by the most truthful teaching of Christ, which is the way, the truth, and the light, the way because in it we advance unimpeded to the blessedness of this very immortality, the truth because it suffereth no error, the light because it lighteth us in the darkness of earthly ignorance. This teaching, I say, assureth us above all other reasons, because he hath given it to us who seeth and measureth our immortality, the which we ourselves may not perfectly see, so long as our immortal part is mingled with our mortal part. But by faith we see it perfectly, and by reason we see it with a shadow of obscurity, which cometh about because of the mingling of the mortal with the immortal. In this should be the most potent argument that both the two exist in us. And so I believe, so aware, that I am assured of the passage after this life to another better life, where this lady liveth in glory, of whom my soul was enamoured when I strove in such fashion as shall be told in the following chapter. CHAPTER Ten. Returning to the subject, I say that in this verse which begins, Findeth such an adversary as destroyeth him, I intend to reveal what my soul discoursed within me, that is to say, the discourse of the ancient thought in opposition to the new. And first I briefly reveal the cause of her woeful speech when I say, Findeth such an adversary as destroyeth him, the humble thought that is wont to discourse to me of an angel who is crowned in heaven. This is that special thought of which it is said above, that it was wont to be the life of the grieving heart. Then, when I say, The soul wails, so doth she still grieve thereat, I show that my soul is still on its side, and speaks with sadness, and I say that she speaks words of lamentation, as though amazed at the sudden change, saying, O wretched me, how fleeth that tender one who hath consoled me! She may rightly say, consoled, for in her great loss this thought, which would ascend to heaven, had given her great consolation. Then afterwards, in her excuse, I say that all my thought, to wit, my soul, of whom I use the phrase, this afflicted one, turns upon the eyes and denounces them, and this is manifested here. Of my eyes this afflicted one exclaimeth. And I tell how she says three things of them, and against them. The first is that she curses the hour when this lady looked upon them. And here be it known, that though many things may pass into the eye at the same time, yet the one which comes along the straight line into the centre of the pupil is the only one that is really and truly seen, and that stamps itself upon the imagination. And this is because the nerve along which the visual spirit runs faces in this direction, 
and therefore one eye cannot really look upon another without being seen by it. For just as the one which looks receives the form in the pupil along the straight line, so along that same straight line its form proceeds into the one whereon it is looking. And many times it is in thus directing the straight line that his bow is discharged against whom all arms are light. Wherefore, when I say that, such lady looketh upon them, it is as much as to say that her eyes and mine looked upon one another. The second thing that she saith is that she rebukes their disobedience, when she saith, And wherefore did they not believe me concerning her? Then she proceeds to the third thing, and says that the reproach is not hers, as though she had not foreseen, but theirs, in that they did not obey. Wherefore she says that, from time to time, discursing of this lady, she said, In her eyes must needs reside a power over me, were the path of access open to it. In this she saith here, I ever said, Verily in her eyes must he needs stand who slays my peers. And in truth we are to believe that my soul recognized its own disposition, prone to receive the efficacy of this lady, and therefore feared her. For the efficacy of the agent is apprehended in the duly disposed patient, as saith the philosopher in the second, of the soul. And therefore, if wax had the spirit of fear, it would more greatly dread coming into the ray of sun than would a stone, because its disposition receiveth it in more potent operation. Finally, the soul makes manifest in her discourse that their presumption was perilous, when she saith, In my perceiving it avoided me not against their gazing upon such a one, that I am slain thereby. She means, from looking there upon him of whom she has before said, that he slays my peers, and so she ends her words, to which the new thought answers as shall be set forth in the following chapter. CHAPTER Eleven. The meaning has been expounded of that part wherein the soul speaks, to wit, the ancient thought, which was being destroyed. And now, in sequence, the meaning should be explained of the part wherein the new and adverse thought speaks. And this part is all contained in the verse which begins, Thou art not slain, which part, that it may be rightly understood, is to be divided into two. For in the first part, which begins, Thou art not slain, and the rest, he proceeds to say, attaching himself to her two final words, it is not true that thou art slain, but the reason that it seemeth thee that thou art slain is a certain dismay wherein thou art basely fallen, because of the lady who hath appeared to thee. And here be it noted that, as Boethius saith in his consolation, no sudden change of things cometh to pass without some certain running asunder of the mind. And this is the meaning of the reproof made by that thought, and he is called a little spirit of love to give to understand that my assent was swaying towards him. And thus what follows may be better understood, and his victory recognized, since he says already, O soul of ours, making himself her familiar. Then, as was said, he gives command as to what this soul that he reproves is to do to come to this lady, and he thus discurses to her. See how tender she is, and humble. Now these are two things which are the proper remedy for fear, whereby the soul was seen to be impassioned, and especially when united, they beget good hope concerning a person and chiefly tenderness, which maketh every other excellence glow with its light. Wherefore Virgil, speaking of Aeneas, calls him tender as his greatest praise. And tenderness is not what the common herd suppose it to be, namely, grieving at another's woe, which is rather a special effect of it which is called pity, and is an emotion. But tenderness is not an emotion, but rather a noble disposition of mind, ready to receive love, pity, and other charitous emotions. Then he saith, See also how, sage and courteous in her greatness she is. Here he mentions three things, which, amongst things which we have the power to acquire, most chiefly make a person pleasing. He says, sage. Now, what is more beautiful in a woman than to be wise? He says, courteous. Nothing is more becoming in a woman than courtesy. And let not the wretched vulgar be deceived as to this word also, thinking that courtesy is no other than open-handedness, for open-handedness is a special form of courtesy, and not courtesy in general. Courtesy and honor are all one, and because in courts of old time virtuous and fair manners were in use, as now the contrary, this word was derived from courts, and courtesy was as much as to say after the usage of courts. Which word, if it were now taken from courts, especially of Italy, would mean not else than baseness. He says, in her greatness, temporal greatness, which is here intended, is then most comely when accompanied by the two aforesaid excellencies, because it is the light which brings out with clearness the good in a person and its opposite. 
and how much wisdom and how much virtuous disposition remains concealed by not having this light and how great madness and how great vices are exposed to view by having this light better were it for the wretched magnates mad foolish and vicious to be in base estate for so neither in the world nor after their lives end would they be infamous truly it is for them that solomon saith in ecclesiastes another most grievous infirmity have i seen beneath the sun to wit riches kept to the hurt of their master then in sequence he lays it upon her to wit upon my soul that she is henceforth to call her her lady promising her that therefrom she will have much solace when she shall be aware of her graces and this he saith here for if thou deceive not thyself thou shalt see nor does he speak of aught else even to the end of this verse and here endeth the literal meaning of all that I say in this ode addressing these celestial intelligences. CHAPTER Twelve. Finally, as the text of this comment said above, when dividing out the chief parts of this ode, I turn me with the face of my discourse to the ode itself, and speak to it. And in order that this part may be the more fully understood, I say that generally, in every ode, it is called the tornata, because the poets who were first used to make it did so in order that when the ode had been sung they should return to it again with a certain part of the air. But I seldom made it with this intention, and that folk might perceive this, I seldom composed it after the arrangement of the ode, in point of numbers, which is essential to the music. But I made it when there was need to say something for the adornment of the ode outside of its own purport, as may be seen in this and in the others. And therefore I say, for the present turn, that the excellence and the beauty of every discourse are separate and diverse the one from the other for its excellence lies in its meaning, and its beauty in the adornment of the words, and both the one and the other give delight, although the excellence is most delightsome. And so, since the excellence of this ode was difficult to perceive, because of the diverse persons who are introduced as speaking, wherein many divisions are needful, and since the beauty was easy to perceive, meseemed it was for the behoof of the ode that folk should pay more heed to its beauty than to its excellence. And this it is that I declare in this part." But inasmuch as it often comes to pass that admonishment seems presumptuous under certain conditions, the rhetorician is wont to speak indirectly to a man, addressing his words not to him on whose account he is speaking, but to another. And this method is in fact observed in this instance, for the words are addressed to the ode, and their purport to men. I say then, Ode, I believe that they shall be but rare, that is to say few, who rightly understand thee, and I tell the reason which is twofold. First, because thy speech is intricate, I call it intricate for the reason that has been said. And secondly, because thy speech is naughty, I call it naughty with reference to the strangeness of the meaning. Now afterwards I admonish it, and say, If perchance it come about, that thou go where are folk who seem to thee to be perplexed by thy discourse, be not thou dismayed, but say to them, Since ye perceive not my excellence, give heed at least to my beauty. For herein I aim at saying not else, as declared above, save, O men who cannot perceive the meaning of this ode, do not therefore reject it, but give heed to its beauty, which is great, both in virtue of syntax, which pertains to grammarians, and in virtue of the ordering of the discourse, which pertains to rhetoricians, and by virtue of numbers in its parts, which pertains to musicians. Which thing may be seen to be beautiful in it by him who Section 7 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Section 7. Treatise 2, Chapters 13 through 16. Chapter 13. Now that the literal meaning has been adequately explained, we are to proceed to the allegorical and true exposition and therefore, beginning again from the beginning, I say that when I lost the first delight of my soul, whereof mention is made above, I was pierced by so great sorrow that no comfort availed me. Yet after a certain time my mind, which was casting about to heal itself, made proof, since neither my own consolation nor that of others availed, to fall back upon the manner which a certain disconsolate one had erst followed to console himself. And I set myself to read that book of Boethius, not known to many, wherein, a captive in an exile, he had consoled himself. 
and hearing further that Tully had written another book wherein, treating of friendship, he had touched upon words of the consolation of Lelius, a man of highest excellence, on the death of Scipio his friend. I set myself to reading it, and although it was at first difficult for me to enter into their meaning, finally I entered as deeply into it as my command of Latin, and what little wit I had, enabled me to do, by which wit I already began to perceive many things as in a dream, as may be seen in the Vita Nuova. And as it is wont to chance that a man goeth in search of silver, and beyond his purpose findeth gold, the which some hidden cause presents, not, I take it, without divine command, so I, who was seeking to console myself, found not only a cure for my tears, but words of authors, and of sciences, and of books, pondering upon which I judged that philosophy, who was the lady of these authors, of these sciences, and of these books, was a thing supreme, and I conceived her after the fashion of a gentle lady, and I might not conceive her in any attitude save that of compassion. Wherefore the sense for truth so loved to gaze upon her that I could scarce turn it away from her. And impelled by this imagination of her, I began to go where she was in very truth revealed, to wit, to the schools of the religious orders, and to the disputations of the philosophers, so that in a short time, I suppose some thirty months, I began to feel so much of her sweetness that the love of her expelled and destroyed every other thought. Wherefore, feeling myself raised from the thought of that first love even to the virtue of this, as though in amazement I opened my mouth in the utterance of the O before us, expressing my state under the figure of other things, because rhyme in any vernacular was unworthy to speak in open terms of the lady of whom I was enamoured. Nor were the heavens so well prepared as to have easily apprehended straightforward words, nor would they have given credence to the true meeting, as they did to the fictitious. And accordingly folk did, in fact, altogether believe that I had been disposed to this love, which they did not believe of the other. I began therefore to say, Ye who by understanding move the third heaven, and since, as has been said, this lady was daughter of God, queen of all, most noble and most beauteous philosophy, we are to consider who were these movers, and this third heaven. And first of the third heaven, according to the order already observed. And there is no need here to proceed dividing and expounding text by text, for by turning fictitious words from their sound to their import the exposition that has already been made will adequately explain this present meaning. CHAPTER fourteen. To see what is meant by the third heaven, we must first consider what I mean by the word heaven taken by itself, and then it will be clear how and why this third heaven was to our purpose. I say that by heaven I mean sincere, and by the heavens the sciences, because of the three points of similarity which the heavens have with the sciences, especially in connection with their order and their number, wherein they seem to agree, as will be seen when we treat of the word third. The first point of similarity is that the one and the other revolves round a something that it does not move. For each moving heaven revolves upon its own centre, which is not moved by the motion of that heaven, and in like manner each science moves around its own subject, but does not move it, because no science demonstrates its own subjects, but presupposes it. The second point of similarity is the illuminating power of the one and of the other. For each heaven illuminates visible things, and in like manner each science illuminates intelligible things. And the third point of similarity is that they infuse perfection into things that are duly disposed, of which infusion, so far as the first perfection, to wit substantial generation, is concerned, all philosophers agree that the heavens are the cause, although they lay it down in different ways, some attributing it to the movers, as Plato, Avicenna, and Algazel, some to the stars themselves, especially in the case of human souls, as Socrates and Plato, and Dionysius, and the Academician and some to celestial virtue, which is in the natural heat of the seed, as Aristotle and the other peripatetics. And in like manner the sciences are the cause in us of the infusion of the second perfection, by the habit of which we can speculate concerning the truth, which is our distinguishing perfection, as saith the philosopher in the sixth of the Ethics, when he says that truth is the good of the intellect. Because of these, together with many other points of similarity, science may be called heaven. We are now to examine why the third heaven is mentioned, whereto we must needs consider a comparison that holds between the order of the heavens and that of the sciences. As was narrated above, then, the seven heavens that are first with respect to us are those of the planets. Next come two moving heavens above them, and one above them all, which is quiet. To the seven first correspond the seven sciences of the trivium and of the quadrivium, to wit, grammar, dialect, rhetoric, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astrology. 
to the eighth, to wit, the starry sphere, answers natural science, which is called physics, and first science, which is called metaphysics. To the ninth sphere answers moral science, and to the quiet heaven answers divine science, which is called theology. And the reason that all this is so must be briefly inspected. I say that the heaven of the moon is like grammar, as being comparable to it. For if the moon be rightly examined, two special things are perceived in her which are not perceived in the other stars. The one is the shadow upon which is not else than the rarity of her substance, whereon the rays of the sun may not be stayed and thrown back, as from her other parts. The other is the variation of her luminosity, which now shines from the one side and now from the other, according as the sun looks upon her. And these two properties grammar possesses, for because of its infinity the rays of reason cannot be arrested, especially in the direction of words, and it shines now on this side, now on that, in so far as certain words, certain declensions, certain constructions are now in use, which were not of old, and many once were, which shall be again, as Horace says in the beginning of his poesy, when he says, Many words shall be born again, which have now fallen, and the rest. And the heaven of Mercury may be compared to dialectic in virtue of two special properties, for Mercury is the smallest star of heaven, for the magnitude of his diameter is not more than two hundred and thirty-two miles, as Alfreganna states it, saying that it is one twenty-eighth part of the diameter of the earth, which is six thousand five hundred miles. The other special property is that its orbit is more veiled by the rays of the sun than that of any other star. And these two properties belong to dialectic, for dialectic is smaller in its body than any other science. For it is completely constructed and terminated in so much of text as is contained in the old art and in the new, and its orbit is more veiled than that of any other science, inasmuch as it proceeds with more sophisticated arguments and more disputable than any other. And the heaven of Venus may be compared to rhetoric because of two special properties. The one is the brightness of her aspect, which is sweeter to look upon than any other star. The other is her appearing now at morn and now at even. And these two properties characterize rhetoric, for rhetoric is the sweetest of all the other sciences since this is what it chiefly aims at. It appears at morn when the rhetorician speaks before the face of his hearer. It appears at even, that is, from behind, when the rhetorician discurses through writing, from the distant side. And the heaven of the sun may be compared to arithmetic, because of two special properties. The one is that all the other stars are informed by his light, the other that the eye may not look on him. And these two properties are seen in arithmetic, for by its light all the sciences are lightened for all their subjects are considered under some numerical aspect, and in the consideration of them there is always a numerical process. As in natural science, mobile matter is the subject, which mobile matter has in itself the principle of continuity, and this has in itself the principle of infinite number. And as for the speculations of natural science, they are chiefly concerned with the principles of natural things, which are three, to wit, material, privation, and form, in which we see that there is not only number collectively, but there is also number in each one severally, if we consider subtly. Wherefore Pythagoras, as Aristotle says in the first of the Metaphysics, laid down even and odd as the principles of natural things, considering all things to be number. The second property of the sun is also seen in number, with which arithmetic is concerned, for the eye of the intellect may not look upon it, because the number considered in itself is infinite, and such we may not understand. And the heaven of Mars may be compared to music by two properties— the one is the special beauty of its relation to the others. For if we count the revolving heavens, whether we begin from the lowest or the highest, this same heaven of Mars is the fifth. And so it is halfway between every pair, that is to say, the two first, the two second, the two third, the two fourth. The second is that this same Mars drieth and burneth things, because his heat is like to the heat of fire. And this is why he appeareth enkindled in color, sometimes more and sometimes less, according to the thickness and rarity of the vapours which follow him, which vapours often blaze up of themselves, as is established in the first of the meteorics. And therefore Abu Masar says that the kindling of these vapours signifies the death of kings and transmutation of kingdoms, because they are effects of the lordship of Mars. And therefore Seneca says that at the death of the Emperor Augustus he saw aloft a globe of fire. It in Florence at the beginning of its ruin, was seen in the air, in the figure of a cross, a great quantity of these vapours that follow the star of Mars. And these two properties are found in music, which all consist in relations, as we perceive in harmonized words and in tunes, wherefrom the resulting harmony is the sweeter in proportion as the relation is more beauteous. Which relation is the chiefest beauty in that science, because this is what it chiefly aims at. 
Moreover, music so draweth to itself the spirits of men, which are in principle, as though vapours of the heart, that they well nigh cease from all operation, so united is the soul when it hears it. And so does the virtue of all of them, as it were, run to the spirit of sense, which receiveth the sound. And the heaven of Jove may be compared to geometry for two special properties. The one is that it moveth between two heavens repugnant to its own fair temperance, to wit that of Mars and that of Saturn. Wherefore Ptolemy saith, in the book I have cited, that Jove is a star of temperate composition betwixt the cold of Saturn and the heat of Mars. The other is that he shows white among the stars, as though of silver, and these things characterize the science of geometry. Geometry moves between two things repugnant to itself, to wit the point and the circle, and I use circle in the larger sense of everything round, whether body or surface. For according to Euclid, the point is its beginning, and according to what he says, the circle is its most perfect figure, which must, therefore, needs have the nature of an end, so that geometry moves between the point and the circle as between its beginning and its end. And these two are repugnant to its certainty, for the point, because of its indivisibility, cannot be measured, and the circle, because of its curve, is impossible to square perfectly, and therefore is impossible to measure exactly. And moreover, geometry is supremely white, in so far as it is without taint of error, and is most certain both in itself and in its handmaid, which is called perspective. And the heaven of Saturn has two properties by which it may be compared to astrology. The one is the slowness of its movement through the twelve signs, for its orbit needs the time of twenty-nine years and more, according to the writings of astrologers. The other is that it is exalted above all the other planets. These two properties characterize astrology, for in completing its circle, that is to say, in learning it, a most long space of time revolves, both because of its demonstrations, which are more than those of any other of the above-named sciences, and because of the observation which is needed rightly to judge it. And further, it is more exalted than all the rest, because, as Aristotle says in the beginning of the soul, a science is exalted in nobility by the nobleness of its subject matter and by its certainty. And this, more than any of the above mentioned, is noble and exalted by the nobility and exaltation of its subject matter, which concerns the movement of heaven. And it is exalted and ennobled by its certainty, which is without any flaw, being that it cometh from the most perfect and regular principle. And if any suppose that there be a flaw in it, it is not on its side, but, as Ptolemy says, it is because of our negligence— and there, too, should it be imputed. CHAPTER fifteen. After the comparisons made concerning the seven first heavens, we are to proceed, as more than once declared, to the others, which are three. I say that the starry heaven may be compared to physics because of three properties, and to metaphysics because of three others, for it displays to us two visible objects, to wit the multitude of stars in the Milky Way which is that white circle which the vulgar call St. Jacob's Way, and it reveals one of its poles to us, and conceals the other from us, and it reveals one only motion to us, from east to west, and the other which it makes from west to east, it well nigh conceals from us. Wherefore, in due order, we are to consider first its comparison with physics, and then with metaphysics. I say that the starry heaven reveals a multitude of stars to us, for according to the observation of the sages of Egypt, they reckon, inclusive of the extremest star, which appears to them in the south, a thousand and twenty-two separate stars, and it is of them that I am speaking, and herein it hath the greatest resemblance to physics, if we subtly consider these three numbers, to wit two, twenty, and a thousand, for by two we understand local movement, which is of necessity from one point to another, and by twenty is signified movement by modification, for since after ten we can only proceed by modifying ten itself, by means of the other nine, and of itself, the most elegant modification it receives being its own modification by itself. And since the first which it receives is twenty, it is fitting that the said movement should be signified by this number. And by a thousand is signified the movement of growth, for this thousand is the highest number that has a name of its own, and there can be no further growth save by multiplying it. And physics manifests these three movements only, as is proved in the fifth of the fundamental treatise about it. And because of the Milky Way this heaven hath great likeness to metaphysics, wherefore we are to know that concerning this Milky Way philosophers have held diverse opinions. For the Pythagoreans said that once upon a time the sun strayed in his course, and passing through other portions not suited to his heat scorched the place along which he passed, and this appearance of scorching was left there. 
and I believe that they were moved there too by the fable of Phaeton, which Ovid tells in the beginning of the second of the Metamorphoses. Others, of whom were Anaxagoras and Democritus, said that it was caused by the light of the sun reflected in this part, and these opinions they support by arguments to prove them. What Aristotle may have said on this point cannot be rightly known, because his opinion does not appear the same in one translation as in the other, and I suppose there must have been a mistake made by the translators, for in the new he seems to say that it is a congregation of vapors beneath the stars of that region which ever draw them up, and this doth not seem to set forth a true cause. In the old he says that the Milky Way is not else than a multitude of fixed stars, in that region so small that from here below we may not distinguish them though they produce the appearance of that glow which we call the Milky Way. And it may be that the heaven in that region is denser, and therefore arrests and throws back the light. And this opinion seems to be shared with Aristotle, by Avicenna and Ptolemy. Wherefore, inasmuch as the Milky Way is an effect of those stars which we may not see, save that we are aware of these things by their effect, and metaphysics treats of the primal existences, which, in like manner, we may not understand, save by their effects, it is manifest that the starry heaven hath great similitude to metaphysics. Further, the pole that we see signifies the things of sense, of which, taken in their full compass, physics treat, and the pole that we see not signifies things that are immaterial and are not sensible, whereof metaphysics treats, and therefore the said heaven hath great similitude to the one science and to the other. Further, by its two movements it signifies these two sciences, for by the movement wherewith it revolveth day by day, and maketh a fresh return from point to point, it signifieth the corruptible things of nature, which day by day complete their course, and their material changeth from form to form, and of these physics treats. And by the almost insensible movement which it makes from east to west, at the rate of a degree in a hundred years, it signifieth the incorruptible things which had of God a created beginning, and shall have no end. And of these metaphysics treats. And this is why I say that this movement signifieth them, because the circulation in question had a beginning, and shall have no end. For the end of a circulation is returning to one identical point, and this heaven shall never return to such with reference to this movement. For since the beginning of the world it has revolved little more than one-sixth part, and we are already in the final age of the world, and are verily awaiting the consummation of the celestial movement." And so it is manifest that the starry heaven, because of many properties, may be compared to physics and to metaphysics. The crystalline heaven, which has been counted above as the prima mobile, has very manifest comparison with moral philosophy, because, as Thomas, on the second of the Ethics, says, it disposes us rightly for other sciences. For, as says the philosopher in the fifth of the Ethics, legal justice regulates the sciences with a view to learning, and commands them to be learnt and taught, that they be not forsaken. And so doth the said heaven regulate with its movement the daily revolution of all the others, whereby every day they all receive from above the virtue of all their parts. For if the revolution of this heaven did not thus regulate the same, little of their virtue would come down here, and little sight of them. Wherefore suppose it were possible for this ninth heaven not to move, in any given place on earth a third part of the heaven would never yet have been seen and Saturn would be fourteen years and a half concealed from any given place on the earth, and Jove would be concealed for six years, and Mars about a year, and the sun one hundred and eighty-two days and fourteen hours, I say days to signify the length of time which so many days measure, and Venus and Mercury would be concealed and revealed about like the sun, and the moon for fourteen days and a half would be hidden from all folk. Of a truth there would be no generation here below, nor life of animal nor plant. Night would not be nor day, nor week, nor month, nor year, but all the universe would be disordered, and the movement of the other heaven would be in vain, and not otherwise were moral philosophy to cease, the other sciences would be hidden a certain space, and there would be no generation, nor life, nor felicity, and in vain would the other sciences have been written down and discovered of old, whereby it is right clear that this heaven may be compared to moral philosophy. Further, the Empyrean heaven, in virtue of its peace, is like the divine science, which is full of all peace, which suffereth not any strife of opinions, or of sophistical arguments, because of the most excellent certainty of its subject matter, which is God. And of it saith he himself unto his disciples, My peace I give unto you, my peace I leave with you, giving and leaving them his teaching, which is this science whereof I speak. Of her saith Solomon, Sixty are the queens, and eighty are the concubines. 
and of the young maidens there is no number. One is my dove, and my perfect one. All the sciences he calls queens and paramours and handmaidens, and this he calls dove, because it is without taint of strife, and this he calls perfect, because it makes us see the truth perfectly, wherein our soul is quieted. And so this comparison of the heavens and the sciences being expounded, we may perceive that by the third heaven I mean rhetoric, which resembles the third heaven as appears above. Chapter 16 In virtue of the similitudes now expounded, it may be seen who are those movers whom I address, which move this heaven, such as Boethius and Tully, who with the sweetness of their discourse set me upon the way of love as related above, that is to say, devotion to this most gentle lady philosophy, with the rays of their star, which is the scripture that concerns her. For in every science scripture is a star, full charged with light which showeth forth that science. And when this is understood we may see the true meaning of the first verse of the ode before us, by means of the fictitious and literal exposition. And by means of this same exposition we may adequately understand the second verse, up to the place where it says, He makes me gaze upon a lady, where you are to know that this lady is philosophy, who in truth is a lady full of sweetness, adorned with honor, wondrous in wisdom, glorious in freedom, as in the third treatise, where her nobleness will be dealt with, shall be made manifest. And in the place where it says, Who would behold salvation, let him look upon this lady's eyes. The eyes of this lady are her demonstration, the which, when turned upon the eyes of the intellect, enamour that soul which is free in its conditions. O oh, most sweet and unutterable looks, of a sudden ravishing the human mind, which appear in the demonstrations in the eyes of philosophy when she discourses to her lovers. Verily in you is the salvation whereby whoso looketh on you is blessed, and saved from the death of ignorance and of vice. Where it says, If he fear not the anguish of sighings, there must be understood, if he fear not the toil of study, and the strife of perplexities which rise in manifold fashion, from the beginning of the glances of this lady. And then, as her light continueth, fall away like morning clouds from the face of the sun. In the intellect that hath become her familiar remains free and full of certainty, even as is the air purged, enlightened by the midday rays. The third verse, likewise, may be understood by the literal exposition up to where it says, The soul wails. Here we must give good heed to a certain moral which may be noted in these words namely, that a man ought not, because of a greater friend, to forget the services received from the lesser. But if it really behoves him to follow the one and leave the other, when he follows the better, the other is not to be abandoned without some fitting lamentation, wherein he giveth cause to the one he followeth of all the greater love. Then, when it saith, Of my eyes, it means not else, save that mighty was the hour when the first demonstration of this lady entered into the eyes of my intellect, which was the most immediate cause of this enamorment. And where it saith, My peers, souls are meant that are free from wretched and vile delights, and from the ways of the vulgar, endowed with intellect and memory. And then it saith, Slays, and then saith, Am slain, which seems counter to what was said above of this lady's saving power. And therefore be it known that here one of the sides is speaking, and there the other, which two contend diversely, according as was expounded above. Wherefore, it is no marvel if the one says yea, and the other nay, if it be rightly noted which is declining and which ascending. Then in the fourth verse, where it says, A little spirit of love, it means a thought which springs from my study. Wherefore, be it known that by love in this allegory is always meant that very study which is the application of the mind enamoured of a thing to that thing itself. Then, when it saith, Thou shalt see adornment of such lofty miracles, it declares that through her shall be perceived the adornments of the miracles, and it says true, for the adornment of marvels is the perception of the causes of them, which is what she demonstrates, as the philosopher appears to feel in the beginning of the metaphysics, when he says that by perceiving these adornments men begin to be enamoured of this lady. And of this word, to wit, marvel, there will be fuller discourse in the following treatise. All the rest of this ode which follows is adequately explained by the other exposition, and so, at the close of this second treatise, I declare and affirm that the lady of whom I was enamoured after my first love was the most fair and noble daughter of the Emperor of the Universe, to whom Pythagoras gave the name of
Section 8 of The Convivio This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug The Convivio by Dante Alighieri Translated by Philip K. Wicksteed Ode 2 Amor che nella mente mi ragiona Love that discourses to me in my mind Yearningly of my lady Moveth many a time such things with me anent her That my intellect loses its way concerning them His discourse soundeth so sweetly That the soul that heareth him and feeleth Crieth O oh, me, that I have not power to tell that which I hear about my lady! And verily it behoveth me first to drop, Would I treat of that which I hear of her, All that my intellect apprehendeth not, And of that which it understandeth great part, Because I should not know to tell it. Wherefore, if defect shall mark my rhymes, Which shall enter upon her praises, For this, let our feeble intellect be blamed, and our speech which hath not power to tell again all that love speaketh. The sun seeth not, who circleth all the world, a thing so gentle as in that hour when he shineth on the place where sojourneth the lady of whom love constraineth me to speak. Every supernal intellect gazes upon her, and such folk as are here enamoured, still find her in their thoughts, when love maketh them feel of his peace. Her being is to him who gives it her so pleasing, that he ever poureth his power into her, beyond what our nature asketh. Her pure soul, which receiveth from him this salvation, maketh it show forth in that which she doth guide, for her beauties are things clear to view and the eyes of those in whom she shineth send messages thereof to the heart filled with longings which gather air and turn to sighs. On her descendeth the divine power as it doth upon an angel who beholdeth it, and whatsoever gentle lady not believeth this, let her go with her and mark well her gestures. Where she speaks, there cometh down a spirit from heaven who gives us faith that the lofty worth which she possesses transcends all that consorts with our nature. The sweet gestures which she shows to others go calling upon love, each vying with the other in that voice which maketh him to hear. Of her it may be said, Gentle is that in lady which in her is found, and beauteous is so much only as is like to her. And affirm we may that to look on her gives help to accept that which seems a miracle, whereby our faith is aided, therefore from eternity such was she ordained. Things are revealed in her aspect which show us of the joys of paradise, I mean in her eyes and in her sweet smile, which love assigneth there as to their proper place. They transcend our intellect, as the suns raise the feeble vision, and because I may not gaze fixedly upon them, needs must I content me with scant speech of them. Her beauty rains down flamelets of fire, made living by a gentle spirit, which is the creator of every good thought and they shatter like thunder the inborn vices that make folk vile. Wherefore whatsoever lady heareth her beauty blamed for not seeming tranquil and humble, let her gaze on her who is the pattern of humility. It is she who humbleth each perverse one. Of her was he thinking who set the universe in motion. Tornata Ode it seemeth that thy speech is counter to the utterance of a little sister whom thou hast. For this lady, whom thou makest to be humble, she calleth cruel and disdainful. Thou knowest that the heaven is ever shining and clear, and, as concerns itself, 
is disturbed never, but our eyes, for many a cause, call the star clouded time and time again. So when she calleth her Orgulus, she considereth her not according to the truth, but only according as to her she appeared. For the soul was in terror, ay, and is in such terror yet, that it seemeth to me a dire thing, whensoever I look where she perceiveth me. Thus plead thy excuse, if thou have need, and when thou canst, present thyself to her, and say, My lady, Section 9 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri, translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Section 9, Treatise 3, Chapters 1 through 5. Chapter 1. As hath been told in the preceding treatise, my second love took its beginning from the compassionate semblance of a lady, which love afterward, finding my life disposed for its ardor, kindled after the fashion of fire, from a little flame to a grate, so that, not only when I woke, but when I slept, into my head was light from her guided. And how great was the yearning which love gave me to see her, could neither be uttered nor comprehended. And not only of her was I thus desirous, but of all those persons who were in any way connected with her, whether by intimacy or by any tie of kinship. Oh, how many nights there were wherein the eyes of others were resting, closed in sleep, and mine were fixedly gazing on the abiding place of my love. And since the redoubled conflagration must needs reveal itself outwardly, because it cannot possibly remain concealed, a wish came upon me to speak of love, which I was utterly unable to restrain. And though I might have but little command over my own counsel, yet I so far approached it from time to time, either by the will of love or by my own eagerness, that I comprehended and perceived that, in speaking of love, there was no more fair nor profitable discourse than that which commended the loved person. And this deliberation was inspired by three reasons, of which the first was the proper love of myself, which is the beginning of all the rest, even as everyone perceives that there is no more legitimate nor more gracious method of a man doing honor to himself than by honoring his friend, for, inasmuch as friendship may not be between unlikes, wheresoever friendship is perceived, likeness is understood to be, and wheresoever likeness is understood to be, praise and blame run common. And from this argument two great lessons may be learnt. The one is, not to be willing that any vicious one should show himself to be our friend, because therein an evil opinion of him, to whom he shows himself friendly, is conceived. And the other is that no one should blame his friend publicly, because, if the preceding reason be rightly considered, he is thereby thrusting a finger into his own eye. The second reason was the desire to perpetuate this friendship. Wherefore you are to know that, as saith the philosopher in the ninth of the Ethics, in the friendship of folk of unlike condition there must be, in order to preserve it, a certain proportion between them, which shall in a way reduce the unlikeness to likeness. As in the case of a master and servant." For although the servant cannot render a like benefit to his master when he receives a benefit from him, he must nevertheless render such as he best can, with so much zeal and openness, that that which is unlike in itself shall be made like by the manifestation of good will, which reveals and confirms and preserves the friendship. Wherefore I, reflecting upon my inferiority to this lady, and seeing myself benefited by her, resolved to commend her according to my power." If the which be not like in itself to hers, at least my zealous will shows that, if I could do more, more would I do, and so it likens itself to that of this gentle lady. The third reason was a motive prompted by forethought, for, as says Boethius, it doth not suffice to look only upon that which is before the eyes, to wit the present, and therefore forethought is given to us, which looks beyond, even to that which may come to pass. I mean that I reflected that by many who come after me, I might perchance be reproved for lightness of mind, when they heard that I had changed from my first love. Wherefore, to remove this blame, there was no better means than to tell of the quality of the lady who had changed me, for by the manifestation of her excellence, consideration of her power might accrue, 
and when her supreme power was understood, it might be thought that no stability of mind could resist being changed by her, and so I might not be deemed light or unstable. I undertook, therefore, to speak this lady's praise, and, if not in fashion as were fitting, at least so far forth as I might, and I began to say, Love that discurses to me and my mind. This ode has three chief parts. The first is all the first verse, wherein the discourse is by way of proem. The second is all the three following verses, wherein is treated that which it is the purport of the ode to utter, to wit the praise of this gentle one. And the first of these begins, The sun seeth not, who circleth all the world. The third part is the fifth and last verse, wherein, directing my words to the ode, I purge her of a certain difficulty, and of these three parts we are to discourse in order. CHAPTER Two, Addressing myself then to the first part, which was ordained as proem of this ode, I say that we must divide it into three parts, for first the ineffable quality of the theme is touched upon, secondly my insufficiency to deal perfectly with it is set forth, and this second part begins, and verily it behoveth me first to drop. Finally, I excuse myself for my insufficiency, for which no fault should be found with me. And this I begin when I say, Wherefore, if defect shall mark my rhymes, I say then, Love that discourses to me and my mind, where in the first place we are to consider who this is who discourses, and what that place is wherein I assert that he makes discourse. Love, truly taken and subtly considered, is not else than a spiritual union of the soul and of the loved thing to which union the soul, in virtue of its own nature, runs swift or slow according as it is free or impeded. And the reason of this natural property may be that every substantial form proceeds from its own first cause, which is God, as is written in the Book of Causes, and they derive their diversities not from it, for it is most simple, but from the secondary causes, or from the material upon which it descends. Wherefore, in that same book, in treating of the infusion of the divine goodness, it is written, and make the excellences and the gifts diverse, in virtue of the cooperation of the thing which receives. Wherefore, inasmuch as every effect retains something of the nature of its cause, as Alpetragius says, when he affirms that what is caused by a circular body has, in a certain fashion, a circular existence, every form possesses, in a fashion, the existence of the divine nature, not that the divine nature is divided and communicated to them, but it is participated by them." something after the mode wherein the sun is by participation in the other stars. And the more noble the form is, the more does it retain of this nature. Wherefore the human soul, which is the noblest form of all those that are generated beneath the heaven, receives more of the divine nature than any other. And since it is most germane to the nature of God to will to be, because, as we read in the aforesaid book, being comes first of all, and before that there is not, the human soul naturally desires with the whole force of its longing to be and because its being depends on God, and by him is preserved. It naturally desires and wills to be united to God in order to fortify its own being. And because it is in the excellences of nature that the divine principle reveals itself, it comes to pass that the human soul naturally unites herself with them in spiritual fashion, the more swiftly and the more mightily in proportion, as they appear more perfect. And they so appear in proportion as the soul's power of recognition is clear or obstructed. In this union it is which we call love, whereby the inner quality of the soul may be recognized by examining outwardly the things which it loves. This love, to wit the union of my soul with this gentle lady, in whom full much of the divine light was revealed to me, is he who discourses, and of whom I speak, because from him unbroken thoughts had birth, by gazing and pondering upon the worth of this lady, who is spiritually made one thing with my soul. The place wherein I say that he discoursed is the mind, but to say that it is the mind gives us no more understanding of it than before, and therefore we are to examine what this word mind properly signifies. I say then that the philosopher in the second of the soul, when analyzing its powers, says that the soul has in the main three powers, to wit, life, sense, and reason, and he also mentions motion, but this may be united with sense, for every soul that has sense, either with all the senses or some one of them only, has motion also, so that motion is a power inseparable from sense." And, as he says, it is quite plain that these powers are so related to each other that one is the foundation of the other, and that which is the foundation may exist by itself apart, but the other which is founded upon it may not exist apart from it. Wherefore, the vegetative power, whereby things live, is the foundation upon which rests the sensitive life, to wit, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. 
and this vegetative power may constitute a soul in itself, as we see in all the plants. The sensitive power cannot exist without this. There is nothing that feels without being alive, and the sensitive power is the foundation of the intellectual power, to wit, the reason. And therefore, amongst mortal things that have life, the rational power without the sensitive is not to be found. But the sensitive power is to be found without the other, as we see in the beasts and in the birds and in the fishes and in every brute animal. And that soul which embraces all these powers is the most perfect of all the rest. In the human soul, which is associated with the nobility of the highest power, to wit, reason, participates in the divine nature after the fashion of an eternal intelligence, because the soul is so ennobled and stripped of material in this sovereign power that the divine light shines in it as an angel. And therefore man has been called by the philosophers the divine animal. In this most noble part of the soul exist many faculties, as says the philosopher, especially in the sixth of the ethics, where he says that there is a capacity in it which is called scientific, and another which is called ratiocinative, or counseling. And together with this are certain faculties, as Aristotle says in that same place, such as the inventive faculty and the judicial. And all these most noble faculties, and the rest that abide in this excellent power, are called collectively by this name, as to the meaning of which we are inquiring, to wit, mind. Whereby it is manifest that by mind we understand this highest and most noble part of the soul, and that this is the meaning is seen from the fact that it is only of man and of the divine substances that this mind is predicated, as may be plainly seen from Boethius, who first predicates it of men, when he says to philosophy, Thou and God who place thee in the minds of men, and afterwards predicates it of God, when he says to God, Thou dost produce all things after supernal pattern, O thou most beauteous, bearing the beauteous world in thy mind. Nor ever was it predicated of a brute animal. Nay, rather there are many men who seem lacking in this most perfect part, of whom it seems that we neither should nor can predicate it, and therefore such are called in grammar amenti and dementi, that is, without mind. So now we can see what is that mind, which is the culmination and the most precious part of the soul, which is deity. And this is the place wherein I declare that love discourseth to me of my lady. Chapter 3 Not without cause do I say that this love plies his operation in my mind, but this is said with reason to give to understand what manner of love this is by telling of the place wherein it operates. Wherefore be it known that everything, as said above, and for the reason above set forth, hath its specific love, as, for example, the simple bodies have a love which has an innate affinity to their proper place, and that is why earth ever drops to the center. But the love of fire is for the upper circumference, under the heaven of the moon, and therefore it ever riseth thereto. Primary compound bodies, like the minerals, have a love for the place where their generation is ordained, and therein they grow, and thence draw vigor and power, whence we see the magnet ever receive power from the direction of its generation. Plants, which are the primary living things, have a more manifest love for certain places, according as their composition requires, and therefore we see certain plants almost always gather along watercourses, and certain on the ridges of mountains, and certain on slopes, and at the foot of hills. The which, if we transplant them, either die altogether or live as if in gloom, like things parted from the place dear to them. As for the brute animals, not only have they a more manifest love for their place, but we see that they love one another. Men have their proper love for perfect and comely things, and because man, though his whole form be one sole substance, has in himself by his nobility something of the nature of each of these things, he may have all these loves, and has them all indeed. For in virtue of the nature of the simple body, which predominates in the subject, he naturally loves to descend, and therefore when he moves his body upward it is more toilsome. By the second nature of a complex body, he loves the place and further the time of his generation, and therefore every one is naturally of more efficient body at the place where he was generated, and at the time of his generation, than at any other. Wherefore we read in the stories of Hercules and in the great Ovid and in Lucan, and in other poets, that when he was fighting with the giant called Antaeus, whenever the giant failed, and his body was stretched upon the earth, whether of his own will or by the might of Hercules, force and vigor rose up again in him, renovated by the earth, wherein and wherefrom he had been generated. Perceiving which, Hercules, at the last, grasping him and lifting him from the earth, held him so long and suffered him not to reunite himself with the earth, that with overmastery he conquered and slew him. In this battle was in Africa, according to the testimony of the scriptures. And by the third nature, to wit that of plants, 
Man hath love for certain food, not in so far as it affects the sense, but in so far as it is nutritious. And such food maketh the working of this nature most perfect, and other food does not so, but makes it imperfect. And therefore we see that some certain food shall make men fair of face, and stout of limb, and of a lively color, and certain other shall work the contrary of this. And in virtue of the fourth nature, that of animals, to wit the sensitive, man hath another love, whereby he loveth according to sensible appearance, like to a beast. And this is the love in man which most needeth a ruler, because of its overmastering operation, especially in the delight of taste and touch. And by the fifth and last nature, that is to say, the truly human, or rather say, the angelic, to wit the rational, man hath love to truth and to virtue. And from this love springeth the true and perfect friendship, drawn from nobility, whereof the philosopher speaks in the eighth of the ethics, when he treats of friendship. Wherefore, inasmuch as this nature is called mind, as shown above, I declare that love discoursed in my mind, to give to understand that this love was that which is native to this most noble nature, to wit the love of truth and of virtue, and to exclude every false opinion concerning me, whereby my love might have been suspected to be love for delight of sense. And then I say yearningly to give to understand its continuity and its fervor, and I say that he often moveth things which make my intellect lose its way. And I speak truth, because my thoughts, when discoursing of her, often strove to bring things to an issue about her which I might not comprehend. And I was all astray, so that outwardly I appeared as though distraught, like to a man who looks with his sight along a straight line, and first clearly sees the things nighest to him. Then, as he goes on, sees them less clearly, then further on is at a loss concerning them. Then going on even to the furthest of all, his sight is unfocused, and he sees not. And this is the one source of the unutterableness, of that which I have taken as my theme. And then, in sequence, I tell of the other, when I say, his discourse, and the rest. And I say that my thoughts, which are the discourse of love, have sweet sound, that my soul, that is, my affection, burns to be able to relate this with the tongue. And because I may not tell it, I say that the soul laments thereat, saying, O oh me, that I have not power. And this is the other source of unutterableness, namely, that the tongue cannot completely follow that which the intellect perceives. And I say, the soul that heareth him and feeleth, heareth as touching the words, and feeleth as touching the sweetness of sound. CHAPTER Four. Having discoursed of the twofold unutterableness of this subject matter, it is fitting to proceed to tell of my own insufficiency. I say, then, that my insufficiency hath a twofold origin, even as the loftiness of that lady hath a twofold transcendency, after the fashion expounded. For, though poverty of intellect needs must drop much of that which is true concerning her, and which raise in some sort into my mind, which, like a transparent body, receives without arresting it. And this I say in this following clause, And verily it behoveth me first to drop. And when I say, And of that which it understandeth, I assert that not only am I insufficient for that which my intellect cannot support, but even for that which I understand, because my tongue hath not such eloquence as to be able to utter the discourse which is held of her in my thought, whereby it is seen that, in proportion to the truth, that which I shall say will be but little, and the outcome of this is greatly to her praise if rightly considered, and that is the main purpose. And that discourse, which at every point has its hand on the main purpose, may well be said to come from the workshop of the rhetorician. Then, where it says, Wherefore, if defect shall mark my rhymes, I excuse myself for my fault, for which, when folks see that my words are beneath her dignity, I ought not to be blamed. And I say that if there be defect in my rhymes, that is to say, in my words, which are ordained to treat of her, the blame must fall upon the weakness of intellect and the scant power of our speech, which is vanquished by the thought, so that it may scarce follow it, especially where the thought springs from love, because there the soul exercises herself more profoundly than elsewhere. It might be said, Thou art excusing, and at the same time accusing thyself, for it is a conviction of blame, and not a purgation from it, in so far as the blame is thrown upon the intellect and upon speech, which are mine, so that if the same be good, I ought to be praised, therefore, to the extent of the goodness, and if defective, to be blamed. To this it may be answered briefly that I do not accuse myself, but do genuinely excuse myself. And here, too, be it known that, according to the philosopher in the third of the ethics, man deserves praise or blame only for those things which it is in his power to do or not to do. But in those things wherein he has no power, he deserves neither praise nor blame, inasmuch as both are to be rendered to some other, 
albeit the things themselves be part of the very man. Wherefore we should not blame a man because of a body deformed from his birth, because it was not in his power to make himself beautiful. But we are to blame the faulty disposition of the material whereof he was made, which was the source of the failure of nature. And in like manner we should not praise a man for any beauty of body which he may have from his birth, for he was not the maker thereof, but we ought to praise the artificer, to wit, human nature, which produces such great beauty in its material when it is not impeded by it. And therefore the priest well answered the emperor, who laughed and scoffed at his deformity of body. God is the Lord, he made us, and not we ourselves. And these are the words of the prophet in a verse of the Psalter, written as they stand in the priest's answer, without addition or subtraction. And therefore let the ill-conditioned wretches look to it, who make it all their study to deck out their person, which should be treated with all dignity. For this is not else than to ornament the work of another and neglect one's own. Returning then to the purpose, I affirm that our intellect, by defect of that power whence it draws whatsoever it contemplates, which is an organic power, to wit the fantasy, may not rise to certain things, because the fantasy may not aid it, for it hath not wherewithal. Such are the substances, say junct from matter, which, even though a certain consideration of them be possible, we may not understand nor comprehend perfectly. And for this a man is not to blame, for he was not the maker of this deficiency. Nay, rather it is the work of universal nature, that is, of God, who willed that we should lack such light in this life. And why he did this it were presumptuous to argue, so that if my consideration transported me into a region where fantasy failed the intellect, I am not to blame for not being able to understand. Further, a limit is fixed for our intelligence in each one of its operations, not by us, but by universal nature, and therefore be it known that the limits of intelligence are wider in thought than in speech, and wider in speech than in signals. Therefore, if our thought surpasses speech, not only in matters which attain not to perfect understanding, but also in those which only just attain to it, we are not to blame for this, because it is not we who make it so. And thus I show that my excuse is a genuine one when I say, For this let our feeble intellect be blamed, and our speech, which hath not power to tell again all that love telleth. For the good will should be right clearly seen, and this is what we ought to consider in the matter of human deserts. This, then, is how we are to understand the first chief section of this ode which is at hand. Now that the discussion of the first section has revealed its meaning, we are duly to proceed to the second, whereof, for its better inspection, three divisions should be made according as it is embraced in three verses. For in the first I commend this lady in her entirety and without distinction, alike in soul and in body. In the second I come down to the special praise of the soul, and in the third to the special praise of the body. The first division begins... The sun seeth not who circleth all the world. The second begins. On her descendeth the divine power. The third begins. Things are revealed in her aspect. And these divisions are to be discussed in order. I say then, The sun seeth not who circleth all the world, wherein, for perfect understanding, we must know how the world is circled by the sun. In the first place, I say that by the world I do not here understand the whole body of the universe, but only this region of sea and land, according to the common speech which uses so to call it. Just as one says, such a one has seen all the world, meaning the region of sea and land. Pythagoras and his followers declared that this world was one of the stars, and that there was another of like fashion opposite to it. In this they called Antichthon, and he said that they were both on one sphere which turned from east to west and that it was in virtue of this revolution that the sun circled round us and was now visible and now invisible. And he said that fire was betwixt these two, laying it down that it was a nobler substance than water in the earth, laying it down that the center was the noblest among the places of the four simple bodies. And therefore he said that fire, when it seemed to rise, was really descending to its own center. Afterwards Plato adopted another opinion, and wrote in a book of his which is called Timaeus, that the earth, with the sea, was really the center of the whole, but that its whole globe turned round on its center, following the primal movement of heaven, but very slowly, because of its gross material and because of its extreme distance from that primal movement. These opinions are refuted as false in the second of heaven and earth by that glorious philosopher to whom nature opened her secrets more than to any other, and by him it is there shown that this world, to wit the earth, stands forever stable and fixed in herself." In the proofs which Aristotle enunciates to crush these others and to establish the truth, it is not my purpose here to relate, because it is enough for those whom I am addressing to be assured on his great authority 
that this earth is fixed and revolves not, and that it, together with the ocean, is the center of the heaven. This heaven revolves round this center, as we perceive, without break, in the revolution of which there must needs be two fixed poles, and a circle equally distant from them both, which revolves most rapidly. Of these two poles, the one, that is to say this northern one, is apparent to almost all the land which is uncovered. The other, to wit the southern one, is concealed from almost all the uncovered land. The circle which is perceived midway between them is that path of the heaven under which the sun revolves when he goes in company with the ram, or with the scales. Wherefore be it known that if a stone should fall from this our pole, it would fall away yonder into the ocean, right upon the hump of the sea, at the spot where, if there were a man, he would always have the star right above his head. And I suppose that from Rome to this spot, measuring straight to the north, there would be a space of some two thousand six hundred miles, or a little more or less. Let us imagine, then, for a better understanding, that there be a city on that spot which I have named, and that it be called Maria. I say further that if a stone should fall from that other pole, that is, the southern one, it would fall upon that hump of the ocean sea which is exactly opposite to Maria on this ball. And I suppose that from Rome to the place where that second stone would fall, measuring straight to the south, would be a space of six thousand five hundred miles, a little more or less. And here let us imagine another city, and let it be called Lucia, and the space in whatever direction we draw the cord would be ten thousand two hundred miles between the one and the other, just half the circumference of this ball, so that citizens of Maria would have their feet opposed to the feet of those of Lucia. Let us further imagine a circle upon this ball, which at every point should be the same distance from Maria as from Lucia. I suppose that this circle, as I understand by the teachings of the astrologers, and by that of Albert of Germany in his book, Of the Nature of Places, and of the Properties of the Elements, and also by the testimony of Lucan in his ninth book, would divide this uncovered land from the ocean, down there towards the south, almost along the whole extremity of the first climate, where are, amongst other nations, the Garamanti, who are almost always naked, to whom Cato came with the people of Rome, fleeing the lordship of Caesar. When we have marked these three places upon this ball, it is easy to perceive how the sun circleth it. I say, then, that the heaven of the sun revolves from west to east, not directly counter to the diurnal movement, that is, the movement of day and night, but obliquely against it, so that its mid-circle, which lies symmetrically between its poles, whereon is the body of the sun, cuts the circle of the two first poles, at two opposite points, to wit, at the beginning of the ram and at the beginning of the scales, and it departs from it along two arcs, one toward the north and the other toward the south, and the summits of these arcs depart equally from the first circle on either side by twenty-three degrees and a point more, and one summit is the beginning of the crab, and the other is the beginning of Capricorn. Wherefore, at the beginning of the ram, when the sun travels beneath the mid-circle of the first poles, Maria must needs see him circling the world around, down upon the earth, or the ocean, like a millstone, from which not more than half of his body should appear. And she would see him continually rising after the manner of the screw of a press, until he had completed ninety-one revolutions and a little more. When these revolutions are completed, his elevation at Maria is about as much as it is for us at mid tierce when the day and night are equal. And if a man were standing erect in Maria, with his face ever turned to the sun, he would see it ever moving toward his right hand. Then, following the same path, he seems to descend for another ninety-one circlings, and a little more until he is circling around, down upon the earth or the sea, not displaying his whole bulk. And then he passes out of sight, and Lucia begins to see him, and perceives him mounting and descending around her as many circles as Maria does. And if a man were standing erect at Lucia, and ever turning his face toward the sun, he would see him moving toward his left hand, whereby it may be perceived that these places have one day in the year six months long, and a night of equal time, and when the one has day, the other night. Again it follows that the circle upon this ball where, as already stated, the Garamanti are, must see the sun circling right above it not after the fashion of a millstone, but of a wheel, not more than half of which can be seen in any region, when the sun is traveling under the ram, and then it perceives him departing from itself, and working towards Maria ninety-one days and a little more, and returning towards itself for as many days, and then, when he has come back, he travels beneath the scales, and again departs and approaches Lucia ninety-one days and a little more, and returns during as many. In this locality, which girds the whole ball, 
always has the day equal to the night, whichever side of it the sun is traveling, and it has twice in the year a most fierce summer of heat, and two little winters. It follows further that the two spaces intermediate between the two imagined cities and the mid-circle must see the sun in varied fashion according as they are remote or nigh to these places, as may now, by what has been said, be perceived by whosoever hath a noble intellect, to which it is well to leave a little effort. Wherefore it may now be seen that, by divine provision, the world is so ordained that when the sphere of the sun has revolved and returned to any point, this ball, on which we are placed, has received in its every region an equal time of light and of darkness. O oh, unutterable wisdom that didst thus ordain! How poor is our mind to comprehend thee! And ye for whose behoof and delight I am writing, Section 10 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Section 10. Treatise 3. Chapters 6 through 9. Chapter 6. In the preceding chapter it has been shown in what way the sun circles, so that we may now proceed to explain the meaning of the division which we are considering. I say, then, that in this first division I begin to commend this lady by comparing her with other things, and I say that the sun, circling the world, sees not anything so noble as her, wherefore it follows that she, according to these words, is the most noble of all the things that the sun shines upon. And I say, in that hour, and the rest, wherefore be it known that hour is understood in two ways by the astronomers, one by making twenty-four hours of the day and night, to wit twelve of the day and twelve of the night, whether the day be long or short. And these hours are short or long, in the day or in the night, according as the day or night waxes or wanes. In these hours the church uses when she says, primes, tierce, sext, and nones. And these are called the temporal hours. The other is to make day and night twenty-four hours, of which the day one while has fifteen hours and the night nine, and another while the night sixteen and the day eight, according as day or night waxes or wanes, and these are called equal hours. And ever at the equinox these, and those which are called temporal, are one and the same thing, because the day being equal to the night it must needs so be. Then when I say, every supernal intellect gazes upon her, I commend her without reference to aught else, and I say that the intelligence of heaven marvel at her, and that noble folk down here below think of her, when they have most of that which is their delight. And here be it known that every supernal intellect, according as it is written in the book of causes, hath knowledge of that which is above itself, and of that which is below itself. It hath knowledge, then, of God as its cause. It hath knowledge, then, of that which is beneath it as its effect." And because God is the most universal cause of all things, by having knowledge of him they have knowledge of all things according to the measure of intelligence. Wherefore all the intelligences have knowledge of the human form, in so far as it is regulated by intention in the divine mind. But the motor intelligences have highest knowledge of it, because they are the most especial causes of it, and of every general form. And they know it as perfectly as can possibly be, even as their rule and example. And if the human form itself, when copied and individuated, is not perfect, the defect is not of the example, but of the material, which is individual. Wherefore, when I say, every supernal intellect gazes upon her, I would say not else, save that she is made as she is, even as the intentional example of the human essence, which is in the divine mind, and made by that power which exists in highest degree in those angelic minds which, with the heavens, fashion these things here below. And in confirmation of this, I go on and say, and such folk as are here enamoured, and the rest, where you are to know that each thing most chiefly desires its own perfection, wherein its every longing is stilled, and it is for its sake that any other thing is desired. And it is this longing which always makes every delight seem defective to us, for no delight in this life is so great as to be able to take away the thirst from our soul so that the longing spoken of shall not remain in our thought. And since this lady is in very truth that perfection, I affirm of the folk that here below receive the greatest delight, that when they are most at peace, she still abides in their thoughts. 
whereby I assert that she is as perfect as the human essence can supremely be. Then, when I say, her being is to him who gives it to her so pleasing, I show that not only is this lady the most perfect in the human generation, but more than most perfect, in so far as she receives of the divine excellence beyond the due of humanity. Whence we may reasonably believe that as every master loves his best work more than the rest, so God loves the best human person more than all the rest. And since his generosity is not confined by the necessity of any limit, his love hath not regard to the due of him who receiveth it, but surpasses it in the gift and benefaction of power and of grace. Whence I say here that God himself, who gives her being, for love of her perfection, infuses of his excellence into her beyond the limits of the due of our nature. Then, when I say, her pure soul, I prove what has been said by the testimony of sense, where you are to know that, as saith the philosopher in the second of the soul, the soul is the actualizing of the body, and if it is its actualizing, it is its cause. And, because, as is written in the book of causes already cited, every cause infuses into its effect some of the excellence which it receives from its own cause, it infuses and renders to its body something of the excellence of its cause, which is God. Wherefore, inasmuch as wondrous things are perceived in her under the bodily aspect, so as to make every one who looks on her long to behold them, it is manifest that her form, to wit her soul, which guides the body as its proper cause, miraculously receives the gracious excellence of God. And so do I prove, by this her appearance, that beyond the due of our nature, which is in her most perfect, as has been said above, this lady has been endowed and ennobled by God. And this is all the literal meaning of the first division of the second main section. CHAPTER Seven, After commending this lady generally, with reference both to the soul and to the body, I go on to commend her specially with reference to the soul. And first I commend her according as her excellence is great in itself, then I commend her according as her excellence is great upon others and useful to the world. And this second division begins where I say, of her it may be said. I say then first, on her descendeth the divine power. Where be it known that the divine excellence descends upon all things, and otherwise they could not exist? But although this goodness springs from the most simple principle, it is diversely received, in greater or smaller measure, by the things that receive it. Wherefore, it is written in the book of causes, the primal excellence makes its excellences flow upon things with one flowing. But each thing receives of this flowing according to the fashion of its power and of its being, and of this we may have an example patent to the senses from the sun. We see the light of the sun, which is one, derived from a single source, diversely received by the several bodies. As Albertus says in the book he has made on the intellect, that certain substances, because they have a large measure of the clearness of the transparent mingled in their composition, so soon as the sun sees them become so luminous that their aspect consists in the multiplication of the light in them, and they cast a great splendor from themselves upon other substances, as are gold and certain stones. Certain there are which, because they are together diaphanous, not only receive the light, but without impeding it render it again, colored with their color, to other things. And certain there are so supreme in the purity of their transparency as to become so radiant that they vanquish the temper of the eye, and cannot be looked on without trouble of the sight, as are mirrors. Certain others are so completely without transparency that they receive but little of the light, as is earth. In like manner the excellence of God is received after one fashion by the sejunct substances, to wit the angels, which are without grossness of material, as though diaphanous, in virtue of the purity of their form, and after another fashion by the human soul, which, although on one side it is free from material, on another side is impeded, like a man who is immersed in the water all except his head, of whom it cannot be said that he is all in the water or all out of it. And after another fashion by animals whose soul is entirely embraced in material, but I speak of it in the measure to which it is ennobled, and after another fashion by the minerals, and by the earth, otherwise than by the other elements, because it is the most material and therefore the most remote, and most out of proportion to the prime, most simple, and most noble power, which alone is intellectual, to wit God. And though here it is the general degrees that are laid down, nevertheless individual degrees may also be laid down, inasmuch as, of human souls, one receiveth otherwise than another. And because in the intellectual order of the universe the ascent and descent is by almost continuous steps, from the lowest form to the highest, and from the highest to the lowest, as we see is the case in the sensible order, between the angelic nature, which is an intellectual thing, 
in the human soul there is no intermediate step, but the one is, as it were, continuous with the other in the order of steps, and between the human soul and the most perfect soul of the brute animals there is also no intermediary, and we see many men so vile and of such base condition as scarce to seem other than beasts, in like manner we are to lay it down and firmly to believe that there be some so noble and of so lofty condition as to be scarce other than angels. Otherwise the human species would not be continued in either direction, which may not be. Such as these Aristotle, in the sixth of the Ethics, calls divine, and such I assert this lady to be, so that the divine virtue descends upon her after the fashion wherein it descends upon an angel. Then when I say, and whatsoever gentle lady not believeth this, I prove it by the experience which may be had of her in those doings which are proper to the rational soul, wherein the divine light most freely rays, that is to say, in speech and in expression, which we are wont to call gestures and bearing. Whence you are to know that man alone amongst the animals speaks and has gestures and expression which we call rational, because he alone has reason in him. And if any one should say in contradiction that certain birds talk, as seems to be the case with some, especially the magpie and the parrot, and that certain beasts have expression or gestures, as the ape and some others seem to have, I answer that it is not true that they speak, nor that they have gestures, because they have no reason, from which these things must needs proceed nor have they the principle of these things within them, nor do they understand what it is, nor do they purpose to signify anything by them, but they merely reproduce what they see and hear. Wherefore, even as the image of bodies is reproduced by certain shining things, for instance a mirror, and the corporeal image that the mirror displays is not real, so the semblance of reason, namely the expression and the speech which the brute beast reproduces or displays, is not real. I say that, whatsoever gentle lady not believeth, what I assert is to go with her and mark well her gestures. I say not whatsoever man, because the experience may be gained in more comely fashion by woman than by man, and I tell that which will be perceived concerning her in her company by telling the effect of her speech and the effect of her bearing, for her speech, by its loftiness and by its sweetness, begets in the mind of him who hears it a thought of love, which I call a celestial spirit, because its origin is from above, and from above cometh her teaching as has been told already. From which said thought proceeds the firm belief that she is a miraculous lady of power, and her gestures, by their sweetness and their harmony, make love wake and come to consciousness, wherever his potentiality has been sown by a sound nature. Which natural sowing comes about as is set forth in the following treatise. And when I say, of her it may be said, and the rest, I purpose to narrate how the excellence and power of her soul is good and profitable to others, and first how it is profitable to other ladies, saying, Gentle is that in lady which in her is found, where I render a manifest example to women, gazing upon which they may, by following it, make a gentle semblance. Secondly, I tell how she is profitable to all folk, saying that her aspect aideth our faith, which is profitable more than all other things to the human race, as that whereby we escape from eternal death and acquire eternal life. And it helps our faith because, inasmuch as the chiefest foundation of our faith is the miracles wrought by him who was crucified, which same created our reason and willed that it should be inferior to his power, and wrought afterwards in his name by his saints, and inasmuch as many are so stubborn as to doubt of these same miracles, with some certain shade of doubt, who may not believe any miracle unless they have experience of the same. And inasmuch as this lady is a thing visibly miraculous, whereof the eyes of men may take daily experience, and which may assure us of the possibility of the others, it is manifest that this lady, with her wondrous aspect, aideth our faith. And therefore I finally say that, from eternity, that is to say eternally, she was ordained in the mind of God in testimony of the faith to those who live in these times. In this ends the second division of the second chief section according to its literal meaning. CHAPTER Eight. Amongst the effects of the divine wisdom, man is the most marvellous, seeing how the divine power has united three natures in one form, and how subtly his body must be harmonized for such a form, having organs for almost all its powers. Wherefore, because of the complex harmony among so many organs, which is required to make them perfectly answer to one another, few of all the great number of men are perfect, and if this creature be so marvellous, verily we must fear to treat of the conditions of the same, not only in words, but even in thought, according to those words of Ecclesiasticus the wisdom of God, preceding all things, who hath searched out. And those others where it saith, 
Seek not out things that are too high for thee, and search not out things too hard for thee. But whatsoever things God hath commanded, think thereupon, and in his further works be not curious, that is, anxious. I, then, who in this third section purpose to speak of certain conditions of such a being, in so far as in her body, by reason of the excellence of her soul, sensible beauty appeareth, timorously, and with no hardihood, purpose to begin to untie so great a knot, if not entirely yet, at least in some measure. I say, then, that after revealing the meaning of this section, wherein this lady is commended under the aspect of her soul, we are to proceed, and are to consider how I commend her under the aspect of the body, when I say, things are revealed in her aspect. And I say that in her aspect things appear which reveal of the pleasures, amongst the rest, of paradise. The most noble thing, and that which is written down as the goal of all others, is to be satisfied. And this is being blessed. And this pleasure is verily, although in another way, in her aspect, for by gazing upon her folk are satisfied, so sweetly doth her beauty feed the eyes of those who look upon her, but in another fashion than by the satisfaction of paradise, which is unbroken, for this may not come to any. And since some might ask where this wondrous pleasure appears in her, I distinguish in her person two parts wherein human pleasure and displeasure are most apparent. Wherefore you are to know that in whatsoever part the soul doth most of her office, this she most fixedly purposes to adorn, and worketh most subtly upon it. Whence we see that in the face of man, wherein she doth more of her office than in any other external part, she designeth so subtly that, by reason of her refining there to the utmost capacity of her material, no one face is like to any other. Because the distinguishing potentiality of the matter, which is, in a way, unlike in every individual, is here reduced to actuality. And inasmuch as the soul operates in the face chiefly in two places, because in these two places the three natures of the soul have some kind of jurisdiction, to wit, in the eyes and in the mouth, it chiefly adorns these, and there sets its whole purpose of beautifying, if it may. And in these two places I say that these pleasures appear, saying, in her eyes and in her sweet smile, which two places by a beautiful simile may be called the balconies of the lady who dwelleth in the edifice of the body, to wit the soul, because here, albeit in a measure veiled, she doth many times reveal herself. She revealeth herself in the eyes so manifestly that her present emotion may be recognized by who so closely looketh there. Wherefore, since there are six emotions proper to the human soul, whereof the philosopher makes mention in his rhetoric, to wit, grace, jealousy, pity, envy, love, and shame, by none of these may the soul be impassioned without the semblance thereof appearing at the window of the eyes, unless it be shut within by great exertion of power. Whence, ere now, certain have plucked out their eyes, lest their inward shame should outwardly appear. As Statius the poet tells us of the Theban Oedipus, when he says that, with external night, he solved his convicted shame. It is revealed in the mouth, like a color behind glass. And what is laughter, save a coruscation of the delight of the soul? That is to say, a light appearing outwardly, according as it exists within. And therefore it is fitting that a man, in order to show his soul moderate in merriment, should laugh in moderation, with a dignified severity, and with slight movement of his features, so that the lady who is then revealed, as said above, may appear modest and not dissolute. Wherefore the book, of the four cardinal virtues, bids us to observe this. Let thy laughter be without cachinnation, that is to say, without clucking like a hen. Ah, wondrous laughter of my lady, whereof I speak, which is never perceived save by the eye. And I say that love conveys these things to her there as to their proper place. And here love may be considered in two ways. Firstly, the special love of the soul for these places, and secondly, the universal love which disposes things to love and to be loved, and which ordains the soul to adorn these parts. Then, when I say, they transcend our intellect, I plead my excuse for seeming to utter but little, when I dwell upon it, of so great excellence of beauty, and I affirm that I say so little of it for two reasons. The one is that the thing which appears in her aspect transcend our intellect, to wit the intellect of man, and I tell the manner of this transcending, which is after the fashion wherein the sun transcends feeble vision, not only that wherein he transcends the sound and strong. The other is that the said intellect may not fixedly gaze on it, because the mind becomes intoxicated there, so that straight away after gazing it goes astray in all its activities. Then, when I say, her beauty rains down flamelets of fire, I have recourse to treating of its effect, since it is impossible to treat completely of itself. Wherefore, you are to know that all those things that overcome our intellect, so that it cannot see what they are, 
are most suitably treated in their effects, whence, treating thus of God, and of his sage young substances, and of first matter, we may have a certain knowledge, and therefore I say that her beauty rains down flamelets of fire, to wit the ardor of love and of charity, and sold by a gentle spirit, that is to say, the ardor informed by a gentle spirit, to wit right appetite, by the which and from the which springs the beginning of good thoughts. And it not only makes this, but it unmakes and destroys its opposite, to wit, the innate vices which are chief foes to good thoughts. And here we are to know that there are certain of the vices in a man whereto he is naturally disposed, as, for instance, some men in virtue of a choleric complexion are disposed to anger, and such vices are inborn or co-natural. Others are vices of habit, for which not complexion but habit is to blame, for instance, intemperance, especially in wine. And these vices are to be escaped and overcome by good habit, whereby a man so becomes virtuous that his moderation needs no effort, as saith the philosopher in the second of the ethics. But there is this difference between co-natural passions and those of habit, that those of habit disappear entirely on the strength of good habit, because their source, to wit the bad habit, is destroyed by its opposite. But the co-natural ones, the source of which is in the nature of him who experiences the passion, though they may be much lightened by good habit, never entirely disappear, so far as their first movement is concerned, but do completely disappear so far as their enduring is concerned, because habit is not an equipoise to the nature wherein is their source. And therefore that man deserves more praise who, though of bad natural disposition, corrects and rules himself contrary to the impulse of his nature, than he who, being good by natural disposition, retains himself in good conduct, or recovers the way when he has lost it. Just as it is worthy of more praise to manage an intractable horse than another which is not vicious. I say, then, that these flamelets which rain from her beauty, as has been said, shatter the innate, that is, the co-natural vices, to give to understand that her beauty has power to make a new nature in those who gaze upon it, which is a miraculous thing. In this confirms what is said above in the next preceding chapter, when I say that she is the supporter of our faith. Finally, when I say, Whatsoever lady heareth her beauty, under color of an admonition I draw a conclusion as to the end whereto so great a beauty was made, and I say that whatever lady hears her beauty blamed for defect is to gaze upon this most perfect example, wherein it is to be understood that this said example was made not only to improve the good, but also to make a good thing out of an evil one. And it adds, in fine, of her was he thinking who set the universe in motion, that is God, to give to understand that nature produced such an effect by divine determination. And thus ends all the second main section of this ode. CHAPTER Nine. The arrangement of the present treatise requires, now that two parts of this ode have first been explained according to my intention, that we proceed to the third, wherein I intend to clear the ode of an accusation that might have told against her. It is this, that before I came to compose this ode, thinking that this lady had become somewhat stern and haughty towards me, I made a little ballad wherein I called this lady proud and pitiless, which appears contrary to what is said of her here above. And therefore I turned to the ode, and under color of teaching her how she must excuse herself, I excuse her. And this is a figure, when any moment things are addressed, which is called by the rhetoricians prosopopeia, and the poets very frequently employ it. Ode, oh, it seemeth that thy speech is counter, and the rest. Now the better to give the meaning of this to be understood, I must divide it into three sections, for in the first is set forth the thing which needs excusing, then the excuse is proceeded with when I say, Thou knowest that the heaven. Finally I address the ode as a person instructed as to what is to be done, when I say, Thus plead thy excuse, if thou have need. So I say first, Thou ode who dost speak of this lady with so much praise, it seems that thou art contrary to a sister of thine. I say sister by similitude. For as a woman begotten by the same begetter is called sister, so may a man call a work that is done by the same doer a sister. For our doing is in a kind of way begetting. And I say why she seems counter to the other, saying, Thou makest her humble, and the other made her proud, that is to say, haughty and disdainful, which is the same thing. Having set forth this accusation, I go on to the excuse by means of an analogous instance, wherein sometimes the truth is at discord with the appearance, and, under sundry aspects, may be differently spoken of. I say, Thou knowest that the heaven is ever shining and clear. That is to say, it never loses its brightness. But for certain reasons it is sometimes permissible to speak of it as being darkened. 
where be it known that the proper objects of sight are color and light, as Aristotle has it in the second of the soul, and in the book of sense and its object. It is true that the other things are visible, but they are not the proper objects of sight, because some other sense perceives them, so that they cannot be called proper to sight, nor proper to touch. And such are shape, size, number, movement, rest, which we call sensibles, and which we perceive with more than one sense. But color and light are properly visible, because we apprehend them by sight alone, that is to say, with no other sense. These visible things, both proper and common, in so far as they are visible, pass into the eye. I do not mean the things themselves, but their forms, through the diaphanous medium, not in reality, but in intention, much as in transparent glass. And in the water which is in the pupil of the eye, this passage which the visible form makes through the medium is completed, because this water is bounded, something like a mirror, which is glass with lead behind it. So it cannot pass any further on, but is arrested there after the fashion of a smitten ball, so that the form, which does not appear nor shine in the transparent medium, is arrested. And this is why an image is seen on leaded glass, but not on other. From this pupil the visual spirit, which extends continuously from it to the front part of the brain, where the sensitive power exists, as in its fontal principle, instantaneously, without any interval of time, makes a representation of it. And thus we see, wherefore, in order that its vision may be true, that is to say, such as the visible thing is in itself, the medium through which the form comes to the eye must be colorless, and so must the water of the pupil be, otherwise the visible form would be tainted with the color of the medium and with that of the pupil, and therefore they who desire to give some particular color to the things in a mirror interpose of that color between the glass and the lead, so that the glass is embraced by it. It is true that Plato and other philosophers declared that our seeing was not due to the visible coming into our eye, but to the visual power going out to the visible. And this opinion is refuted as false by the philosopher in that of sense and its object. Now that we have thus explained the mode of vision, it is easy to perceive that although the star is always equally clear and shining and experiences no mutation, save that of local movement, as is proved in that of heaven and earth, there may be many causes why it seems not clear and not shining, since it may so appear because of the medium which is continually changing. This medium changes from abundance to paucity of light, as at the presence or absence of the sun, and in his presence the medium, which is diaphanous, is so full of light that it overcomes the star, and seems to be brighter than it is. This medium also changes from subtle to gross, and from dry to moist, by reason of the vapors of earth which are continually rising. Which medium, by these changes, changes the image of the star which comes through it, its grossness affecting it in dimness, and its moisture or dryness affecting it in color. And it may also appear so by reason of the visual organ, that is to say the eye, which by reason of weakness, or exhaustion may acquire a certain color or a certain feebleness, as it often happens that the tunic of the pupil becoming violently bloodshot because of some disorder caused by illness, almost everything looks red, and therefore the star seems colored thereby. And when the sight is enfeebled, a certain dispersion of the spirit takes place in it, so that things no longer seem knit together but sprawling, much as letters of our writing do on damp paper. And this is why many, when they have a mind to read, Remove the writing to a distance from their eyes, that the image may enter the more lightly and subtly, and thereby the letter remains more distinct in their sight. And so the star, too, may seem blurred. And I experienced this in that same year wherein this ode was born. For greatly taxing my sight and eagerness of reading, I so weakened the visual spirits that all the stars appeared to me to be shadowed by a kind of halo. And by long repose in dark and cool places, and cooling the body of the eye in clear water, I knit together again the disintegrated power, so as to return to my former good condition of sight. Section 11 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 3, Chapters 10 through 12. Quitting this digression, which was necessary for the apprehension of the truth, I return to the matter in hand, 
and declare that as sometimes our eyes call that is judge the star other than its real estate is so this little ballad considered this lady according to the appearance discordant with the truth that sprang from the infirmity of my mind which was impassioned by excessive longing and this i make clear when i say for the soul was in such terror that methought dire that which i saw in her presence where it be known that the more closely the agent is united with the patient so much the stronger is the passion as may be understood by the opinion of the philosopher in that of generation wherefore the nearer the desired thing approaches to him who desires it the greater is the desire and the more the soul is impassioned the more does it concentrate itself upon the appetitive part and the more does it retreat from reason so that in such a state a person does not judge as a man but pretty nearly as some other animal according to appearance only not according to truth and this is why the semblance which in truth was august seemed to me disdainful and cruel and it was in accordance with this judgment of sense that this little ballad spoke and hereby it is given sufficiently to be understood that this ode considers this lady according to the truth because of its discord with that other and not without reason do i say where she perceiveth me and not where i perceive her but herein i would give to understand the great power that her eyes had over me for even as though i had been diaphanous the ray passed through me on every side and here natural and supernatural reasons might be assigned but let it suffice here to have said so much elsewhere i shall discourse of it on more fitting occasion then when i say thus plead thy excuse if thou have need i enjoin upon the ode how to excuse itself by the reasons assigned where there is need to writ where any is in difficulty because of this contradiction which is no other than to say that if any is in difficulty as concerns a contradiction between this ode and that little ballad he is to consider the reason which has been told and this figure in rhetoric is worthy of much praise and moreover is necessary I mean when words are addressed to one person and intended for another for admonition is ever laudable and necessary yet it is not always suitable in every one's mouth wherefore when a child is aware of a father's vice and when a servant is conscious of a master's vice and when a friend knows that his friend's shame would be increased or his honor depressed were he to admonish him or knows that his friend is not patient but irritable under admonition this figure is most beautiful and most profitable and it may be called disguising and it resembles the action of the skilful warrior who attacks the fortress on one side to withdraw the defense from the other for then the intention of the succor goes not to the same quarter as the battle and i enjoin upon her also to ask leave from this lady to speak of her where it may be understood that a man should not presume to praise another without rightly considering whether such is the pleasure of the person praised for many a time he who thinks he is praising is in truth blaming either through the fault of himself who speaks the praise or of him who hears it whence there is need of much discretion herein which discretion is a kind of asking leave after the fashion wherein i bid this ode ask it and so ends all the literal meaning of this treatise wherefore the arrangement of the work demands that following up the truth we proceed to the allegorical exposition chapter eleven according as the order requires returning again to the beginning i declare that this lady is that lady of the intellect which is called philosophy but inasmuch as praises naturally produce a longing to know the person praised and since knowing a thing means understanding what it is considered in itself and in all its causes as saith the philosopher in the beginning of the physics and inasmuch as the name does not expound this although this is what it signifies as the philosopher says in the fourth of the metaphysics where it is asserted that the definition is that conception which the name signifies it is fitting at this point before proceeding farther in her praises to show and declare what it is that is called philosophy that is to say what this name signifies and afterwards when she herself has been explained the present allegory will be more effectively treated and first i will tell who first gave this name and then i will proceed to its meaning i say then that of old in italy almost at the beginning of the foundation of rome which as paulus orusis writes was six hundred and fifty years 
were little more or less before the saviour came about in the time of numa pompilius second king of the romans there lived a most noble philosopher who was called pythagoras and that this was the time when he lived titus livius seems incidentally to indicate in the first part of his volume and before him the followers after knowledge were not called philosophers but sages as were those seven most ancient sages whose fame folk still preserve the first of whom was solon the second kilo the third periander the fourth thales the fifth cleobulus the sixth bias the seventh pittacus this pythagoras when asked whether he regarded himself as a sage refused to appropriate the word to himself and said that he was not a wise man but a lover of wisdom and hence it afterwards came about that every one who was devoted to wisdom was called a lover of wisdom that is a philosopher for in greek philos is as much amator in latin and hence we say philos for lover and sophia for wisdom wherefore philos and sophia are as much to say lover of wisdom wherefore it may be noted that it is a name not of arrogance but of humility hence is derived the word for the proper act of such an one philosophy as from friend is derived a word for the proper act of such friendship whence may be seen by considering the significance of the first and the second word that philosophy is no other than friendship to wisdom or to knowledge whence in a certain sense every one may be called a philosopher in virtue of the natural love for which begets in every one the longing to know but since the essential passions are common to all we do not speak of them under a word which singles out some particular participant in the essential thing thus we do not call john martin's friend when we simply mean to indicate the natural friendship whereby we are all friends to all but the friendship which has been generated over and above that which is natural and which is proper and distinct in individual persons thus no man is called a philosopher in virtue of the common love aristotle proposes in the eighth of the ethics to call him a friend whose friendship is not hidden from the person loved and to whom the person loved is also friendly so that the good will is on both sides and this must be in virtue of profit or of delight or of worthiness and thus in order that a man may be called a philosopher there must be the love of wisdom which creates good will on the one side and there must be the zeal and eagerness which begets good will on the other side also so that intimacy and the manifestation of good will spring up between them wherefore a man cannot be called a philosopher without both love and zeal for both the one and the other must be present and inasmuch as friendship contracted for delight or for profit is not real but only incidental friendship as the ethics show so philosophy for delight or for profit is not real but only incidental philosophy wherefore we are not to call any man a real philosopher who is friendly with wisdom in some direction because of some certain delight as are many who delight in composing odes giving their zeal thereto and who delight in the zealous study of rhetoric and music but who flee and desert the other sciences all of which are members of wisdom we are not to call him a real philosopher who is a friend of wisdom for profit as are lawyers physicians and almost all the members of the religious orders who do not study in order to know but in order to get money or office and if any one would give them that which it is their purpose to acquire they would linger over their study no longer and as amongst the different kinds of friendship that which is for the sake of profit is least to be called friendship so these such as i speak of have less share in the name of philosopher than any other folk wherefore just as friendship contracted in virtue of worthiness is real and perfect and abiding so is that philosophy real and perfect which is generated by worthiness alone with no other respect and by the excellence of the soul that feels this friendship in virtue of right appetite and right reason so that here we may say that just as there is real friendship between men when each one loves the other in entirety so the real philosopher loves every part of wisdom and wisdom every part of the philosopher so as to draw him entirely to herself and allow him to dissipate no thought of his upon other things wherefore wisdom herself says in the proverbs of solomon i love those that love me and as real friendship abstracted from the mind and considered only in itself has as its subject the knowledge of the well-doing and has for form the attraction thereto so philosophy considered in itself apart from the soul has as its subject understanding and as its form an almost divine love of the thing understood and as virtue is the efficient cause of real friendship so truth is the efficient cause of philosophy 
and as the goal of true friendship is the excellent delight which proceeds from intercourse according to what is proper to humanity that is according to reason as aristotle seems to think in the ninth of the ethics so the goal of philosophy is that most excellent delight which suffers no interruption nor defect to wit the true blessedness which is gained by the contemplation of the truth and thus it may be perceived who this my lady now is in all her causes and in her constituent principle and why she is called philosophy and who is the true philosopher and who the philosopher incidentally but since sometimes in a certain fervour of mind the source or goal of action and passion is called by the name of the action or passion itself as virgil does in the second of the aeneid when he calls aeneas o light which was an act a hope of the trojans which is a passion though he was neither a light nor a hope but was the source whence came to them the light of counsel and was the object in whom reposed all the hope of their deliverance and as statius says in the fifth of the theobus when hypsipyle says to archimorus o thou comfort of my estate and my lost fatherland o glory of my service and as we constantly say pointing to a friend see my friendship and as a father says to his child my love by long want the sciences upon which philosophy plants her sight most fervently are called by her name such as natural science moral science and metaphysic science which last is called philosophy because on her most necessarily and most fervently does she plant her vision whence may be seen how the sciences are called philosophy in a secondary sense now that we have perceived how the primary is the real philosophy in her essence which is the lady of whom i am speaking and how her noble name is communicated by want and use to the sciences i shall proceed with her praises chapter twelve in the first chapter of this treatise the cause which moved me to compose this ode has been so fully explained that there is no occasion to discourse further of it because it may easily be reduced to the exposition which has already been given and therefore according to the divisions made i will run through the literal meaning in quest of the other translating the literal sense where necessary i say love that discourses to me in my mind by love i mean the study which i devoted to acquiring the love of this lady where it be known that study may here be considered in two ways there is one kind of study which brings a man to the habit of the art or the science and there is another study which works in the habit when acquired and plies it and this first it is that i here call love which formed in my mind continuous new and most lofty ponderings on this lady who has been indicated above for this is the want of study which is devoted to acquiring a friendship because in the first place it ponders on the great significance of this friendship while longing for the same this is that study and that affection which is wont to precede the generating of friendship amongst men when love is already born on the one side and he who already loves longs and strives that it may spring up on the other side for as said above philosophy is there when the soul and wisdom have become friends so that each is entirely loved by the other as in the fashion stated above nor is there need of further discourse by way of the present exposition concerning this first verse which was discoursed as of a proem in the literal exposition inasmuch as the understanding may very easily turn by means of its first significance to this its second wherefore we are to proceed to the second verse which begins the treatise in which i say the sun seeth not who circleth all the world here you are to know that just as it is suitable to treat of an object of sense by means of a thing which is not an object of sense so it is suitable to treat of an object of the intellect by means of a thing which is not an object of the intellect and so since in the literal exposition the discourse opened with the corporeal sun accessible to sense we are now to discourse of the spiritual sun accessible to the intellect that is god no object of sense in all the universe is more worthy to be made the symbol of god than the sun which enlightens with the light of sense itself first than all the celestial and elemental bodies and in like manner god illuminates first himself with intellectual light and then the celestial and other creatures accessible to the intellect the sun quickens all things with his heat and if he destroys certain things thereby that is not of the intention of the cause but is an incidental effect and in like manner god quickens all things in goodness and if any of them be evil it is not of the divine intention but must needs be in some way incidental to the progress of the effect intended for if god made both the good and the bad angels he did not make them both by intention but only the good ones then the wickedness of the bad ones followed 
beside the intention, yet not so beside the intention, but that God foreknew their wickedness. But so great an affection had he to produce spiritual creatures, that the foreknowledge of some who must needs come to an ill end should not, nor could not, hinder God from this producing. For nature would not be to praise if, well knowing that the blossoms of a tree must perish in some certain part, she were not to produce blossoms thereon, and because of the barren were to abstain from producing the fertile ones. I say then that God, who understandeth all, for his circling is his understanding, sees not so noble a thing as he sees when he looks upon the place where is this philosophy. For albeit God, looking upon himself, sees all things at once, yet inasmuch as the distinction between things exists in him, after the fashion wherein the effect exists in the cause, he sees them distinct from one another. He sees this most noble of all things absolutely, then inasmuch as he sees her most perfectly in himself and in his essence. For if we call to mind what has been said above, philosophy is a loving exercise of wisdom, and this exists supremely in God, since in him is the highest wisdom and the highest love and the highest actuality, which may not be elsewhere save in so far as it proceeds from him. The divine philosophy, then, is of the divine essence, because in him naught may be added to his essence, and she is most noble because the divine essence is most noble, and she is in him in perfect and true fashion, as though in eternal wedlock. In other intelligences she exists in a lesser way, as though a mistress, of whom no lover has complete enjoyment, but must satisfy his longing by gazing on her. Wherefore it may be said that God sees not, that is to say understands not anything so noble as her and i say anything inasmuch as he sees and distinguishes the other things as said above since he sees himself as the cause of them all o oh, most noble and most excellent heart which is enamoured of the spouse of the emperor Section 12 of The Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 3, Chapters 13 to 15. Chapter 13. Now that we have seen it subtly declared at the beginning of her praises that primarily considered she exists in the divine substance, we are to go on and to consider how I declare that secondarily she exists in created intelligences. I say then, every supernal intellect gazes upon her. Where we are to know that I say supernal, bringing them into relation with God, who has been spoken of above, and hereby are excluded the intelligences that are in exile from the supernal fatherland, for they cannot philosophize, because love is utterly quenched in them. And to philosophize, as already said, there is need of love. Wherefore we perceive that the infernal intelligences are bereft of the aspect of this most beauteous one, and inasmuch as she is the blessedness of the intellect, to be deprived of her is most bitter and full of all sadness. Then when I say, In such folk as are here enamoured, I descend to explain how she also comes, in a secondary sense, into the human intelligence, and with this human philosophy I then proceed in the treatise, commending her. I say, then, that the folk who are enamoured here, to wit, in this life, perceive her in their thoughts, not always, but when love makes them feel of his peace. Wherein three things are to be observed, which are touched upon in this passage. The first is when it says, Such folk as here are enamoured whereby a distinction seems to be made in the human race. And it must of necessity be made, for, as is clearly apparent, and as will be expressly explained in the next following treatise, an immense proportion of mankind lives more after sense than after reason. And those who live after sense cannot possibly be enamoured of her, for they cannot have any apprehension of her. The second is where it says, When love maketh them feel, and the rest, where it seems that a distinction of time is made, and this, too, is necessary, because, albeit the sejunct intelligences gaze continuously upon this lady, the human intelligence may not do this, because human nature requires many things besides speculation, whereby the intellect and reason are fed, to sustain it. 
Wherefore our wisdom is sometimes only in habit and not in act, and this is not so with the other intelligences, whom the intellectual nature by itself completes. Wherefore, when our soul is not in the act of speculation, it cannot truly be said to be in company with philosophy, except in so far as it has the habit thereof, and the potentiality of waking it, and therefore she is sometimes with the folk who are enamoured here, and sometimes is not with them. The third is when it tells the hour when those folk are with her, that is, when love maketh them feel of his peace, which signifies no other than when man is in actual speculation, for study does not make aught of the peace of this lady felt, save in the act of speculation. And thus we see how this lady is primarily of God, and secondarily of the other sejunct intelligences by way of continuous contemplation, and afterwards of the human intelligence by way of discontinuous contemplation. But the man who has her as his lady is always to be called a philosopher, although he is not always engaged in the distinguishing act of philosophy, because folk are chiefly to be named according to habit. Wherefore we call a man virtuous even when he is not doing a deed of virtue, because he has the virtuous habit, and we call a man eloquent even when he is not speaking, because of the habit of eloquence, that is to say, of speaking well. And concerning this philosophy, in so far as she is partaken by the human intelligence, the following commendations are to show how great a part of her goodness is conceded to human nature. So I say next, her being so pleases him who gave it her, from whom she flows, as from her primal source, which doth ever attract the capacity of our nature, and make it beautiful and virtuous. Whence, although certain attain to the habit of her, yet none so attain that it can be strictly called the habit, because the first study, namely that whereby the habit is begotten, can never perfectly acquire her. And herein is perceived her distinctive praise, that whether perfect or imperfect, she never forfeits the name of perfection." And because she is thus out of measure, it says that the soul of philosophy maketh it show forth in that which she doth guide, that is to say that God ever sets of his light in her, where we must call to mind how it was said above that love is the form of philosophy, and therefore here it is called her soul, which love is manifested in the exercise of wisdom, which exercise brings with it wondrous beauties, to wit content in every temporal state, in scorn of all those things which others make their lords. Whereby it happens that the wretched others who behold this, pondering upon their defect, when the longing for perfection comes upon them, fall into labor of sighs. And this is what is meant by, The eyes of those in whom she shines send messages thereof to the heart, filled with longings, which gather air and turn to sighs. CHAPTER fourteen. As in the literal exposition, after the general praises, we descend to the special, first on the side of the soul, then on the side of the body. So now the text purposes, after the general commendations, to descend to the special ones. Wherefore, as was said above, philosophy here on earth has for her subject matter wisdom, and for her form love, and for the combination of the one and the other the exercise of speculation. Wherefore, in this verse, which begins as follows, on her descendeth the divine power, I purpose to commend love, which is a part of philosophy, where be it known that for virtue to descend from one nature into another is not else than to reduce the latter to her own likeness, just as we manifestly see that in natural agents, when their virtue descends upon things that receive it, they draw them to be so far like themselves as it is possible for them to come to be. Whence we see that the sun, when his ray descends down here, reduces things to the similitude of light, in so far as by their dispositions they have the capacity for receiving light from his power. Thus I say that God reduces this love to his own similitude, in the degree wherein it is possible for it to liken itself to him. And the quality of this creating anew is set forth in saying, as it doth upon an angel who beholdeth it, where we are further to know that the prime agent, to wit, God, stamps his power upon some things after the manner of a direct ray, and upon others after the manner of a reflected splendor. For upon the intelligences the divine light rays without medium, upon other things it is reflected by those intelligences which are first enlightened. But since we have here made mention of light and of splendor, for the sake of complete understanding I will explain the difference between these words, according to the opinion of Avicenna. I say that it is the custom of the philosophers to call the luminous principle light, 
in so far as it exists in the source from which it springs, and to call it a ray, in so far as it exists in the medium, between its source and the first body whereby it is arrested, and to call it splendor, in so far as it is thrown back upon some other part which it illuminates. I say, then, that the divine virtue draws this love to its own likeness without any intermediary, and this may be manifested chiefly herein, that as the divine love is eternal under every aspect, so of necessity it behoves its object to be eternal, so that the things which it loves must needs be eternal. And it is after this same fashion that this love makes us love, because wisdom whereupon this love strikes is eternal. Wherefore it is written of her, From the beginning before the ages was I created, and in the ages which are to come I shall not fail. And in the Proverbs of Solomon wisdom herself says, I was ordained from everlasting. And in the beginning of the Gospel of John her eternity may be clearly noted, and hence it arises that where this love grows all other loves are darkened and almost quenched, inasmuch as its eternal object conquers and overcomes all other objects out of all proportion. In this the most excellent philosophers openly reveal in their actions, whereby we know that they gave no heed to any other thing, save wisdom. Thus Democritus, taking no heed of his own person, cut neither beard nor hair nor nails. Plato, caring not for temporal goods, took no heed to his royal dignity, for he was the son of a king. Aristotle, caring for no other friend, entered into contention with his best friend save her, to wit the above-named Plato. And why do we speak of these, since we find others who despise their very lives for these thoughts, such as Zeno, Socrates, Seneca, and many others? And so it is manifest that the divine virtue, in angelic fashion, descends upon men in this love, and to furnish experience of this, the text in sequence cries out, And whatsoever gentle lady not believeth this, let her go with her and mark well and the rest. By gentle lady is understood a soul noble in intellect, and free in the exercise of its own proper power, which is reason. Wherefore other souls cannot be called ladies, but handmaids, because they exist not for their own sake, but for that of another. And the philosopher says, in the second of the metaphysics, that the thing is free, which is therefore its own sake, and not for that of another. It says, Let her go with her, and mark well her gestures. That is to say, let her go in company with this love, and look upon that which she shall find within him, of which it treats in some part, saying, Where she speaketh, there cometh down. That is to say, where philosophy is in act, a celestial thought comes down, which argues that she is a more than human activity. It says from heaven to give to understand that not only she, but the thoughts which are her friends, are removed from base and earthly things. Then, in sequence, it says how she confirms and kindles love, wheresoever she displays herself, with the sweetness of her gestures, to wit all her comely and tender semblance, free from all excess. And in sequence, the more to persuade folk to be of her company, it says, Gentle is that in lady which in her is found, and beauteous is so much only as is like to her. Further, it adds, And affirm we may that to look on her gives help. Where be it known that the power to look upon this lady was granted to us in such ample measure, not only in order that we might see the countenance which she reveals to us, but that we may long to acquire the things which she keeps concealed. Whence, even as by her means, much is perceived in its reason and in its sequence, which without her appears a marvel. So by her means it becomes credible that every miracle may have its reason for a loftier intellect, and consequently may take place, whence her excellent faith hath its origin, from which cometh the hope of that for which we long, and which we foresee, and from this is born the activity of charity, by which three virtues we rise to philosophize in that celestial Athens, where the Stoics and Peripatetics and Epicureans, by the art of the eternal truth, harmoniously unite in one will. CHAPTER fifteen. In the preceding chapter this glorious lady is commended according to one of her component parts, to wit, love. Now in this chapter, wherein I purpose to expound that verse which begins, things are revealed in her aspects, it behoves to treat in commendation of her other part, to wit, wisdom. The text says, then, that in her countenance appear things which show us of the joys of paradise, and it specifies the place of this appearance, to wit, in her eyes and in her smile, and here it is right to know that the eyes of wisdom are her demonstrations, whereby the truth is seen most certainly, and her smile is her persuasions, 
whereby the inner light of wisdom is revealed behind a certain veil, and in these two is felt that loftiest joy of blessedness, which is the supreme good and paradise. This pleasure may not be in aught else here below, save in looking upon these eyes and this smile. And the reason is this, that because everything by nature desires its own perfection, it may not without it be satisfied, which is being blessed. For however much it should have other things, without this it would still be left in a state of longing, in which it may not be with blessedness. Inasmuch as blessedness is a perfect thing, and longing is a defective thing, for no one longs for what he has, but for what he has not, which is a manifest deficiency. And in this look alone is acquired human perfection, that is, the perfection of reason, whereon, as on its chiefest factor, all of our essence depends. And all our activities, feelings, nutrition, and the rest, exist for it alone, and it exists for itself, and not for others. Therefore, if this be perfect, so is that to such a point that man, as man, sees his every longing as its goal, and so is blessed. And therefore it says in the Book of Wisdom, Unhappy is he who setteth at naught wisdom and teaching, which is the privation of being happy. It follows that by the habit of wisdom both being happy and being satisfied are attained, according to the teaching of the philosopher, wherefore we perceive that in her aspect there appear of the things of paradise, and so we read in the book of wisdom already cited, in speaking of her, she is the brightness of the eternal light, the spotless mirror of the majesty of God. Then when it says, they transcend our intellect, I plead my excuse, saying that I can speak but little of these things because of their transcendency. Where be it known that in a certain sense these things dazzled our intellect, inasmuch as they affirm certain things to be which our intellect may not look upon, to wit God and eternity and first matter, which are seen with the utmost certainty, and believed to be with absolute faith, and yet we can only understand what they are by process of negation. In this way we may approach to the knowledge of them, but no otherwise." But here certain may encounter a great difficulty as to how wisdom can make a man blessed when she cannot perfectly reveal certain things to him, inasmuch as man's natural longing is to know, and without fulfilling his longing he may not be blessed. Here too the clear answer may be given that the natural longing, in every case, is measured by the possibilities of the thing longed for, otherwise it would contradict itself, which is impossible, and nature would have created it in vain, which is also impossible. It would contradict itself, for in longing for its perfection it would long for its imperfection, inasmuch as it would long to be ever longing, and never to fulfill its longing. And this is the error into which the accursed miser falls, perceiving not that he desires himself ever to be desiring, as he pursues the sum which it is impossible to reach. Also nature would have created it in vain, because it would not have been ordained to any end. And therefore human longing is measured in this life by that degree of knowledge, which it is here possible to possess, and that point is never transgressed except by misapprehension, which is beside the intention of nature. And in like manner it is measured in the angelic nature, in limited in quantity to that knowledge which each one's nature can apprehend. And this is why the saints envy not one another, because each one attains the goal of his longing, which longing is commensurate with the nature of his excellence. Whence, since it is impossible to our nature to know concerning God, and to declare concerning certain things what they are, we have no natural longing to know this, and thus the difficulty is removed. Then, when I say, Her beauty rains down flamelets of fire, I descend to another pleasure of paradise, to wit the felicity, secondary to this primal felicity, which proceeds from her beauty. Where be it known that morality is the beauty of philosophy? For just as the beauty of the body results from the members, in proportion as they are duly ordered, so the beauty of wisdom, which, as said above, is the body of philosophy, results from the order of the moral virtues, which enable her to give pleasure that may be perceived by the senses. And therefore I say that her beauty, to wit morality, rains down flamelets of fire, that is to say, right appetite, which is begotten by the pleasure of moral teaching which appetite actually removes us from even those vices which are natural to us, to say nothing of the others, and hence springs that felicity which Aristotle defines in the first of the ethics, saying that it is activity in accordance with virtue, in a perfect life. And when it says, Wherefore whatsoever lady heareth her beauty, it proceeds with her praise. I cry out to folk to follow her, 
telling them what are her benefactions, namely that by following her every one becomes good. Wherefore it says, Whatsoever lady, that is, whatsoever soul, perceives that her beauty is blamed, because it seems not such as it should seem, let her look upon this example. Where be it known that the beauty of a soul is in its ways, especially the virtues, which are sometimes made less beautiful and less pleasing by vanity or by pride, as we shall be able to see in the last treatise. And therefore I say that to escape this we are to look upon her, to wit under that aspect wherein she is an example of humility, that is, in the part of her which is called moral philosophy. And I add that by gazing upon her, I mean wisdom, in that part every vicious man will become upright and good. And therefore I say, it is she who humbleth each perverse one, that is, gently bends back, whosoever hath been warped from the due order. Finally, in supreme praise of wisdom, I say that she is mother of all origins whatever, saying that with her God began the universe, and specifically the movement of the heaven, which generates all things, and from which every movement takes its beginning and its starting, saying, Of her was he thinking who set the universe in motion, that is to say that she existed in the divine thought, which is intellect itself when he made the universe. Whence it follows that she made it. Wherefore, in the passage in Proverbs, Solomon says in the person of wisdom, When God prepared the heavens, I was there. When he walled the abysses with a fixed law, and with a fixed circuit, when he established the heaven above, and suspended the fountains of water, when he fixed the limit for the sea, and set a decree upon the waters, that they might not pass their boundaries, when he laid down the foundations of the earth, I too was with him, ordering all things, and took my delight daily." O oh, worse than dead who flee from her friendship! Open your eyes and see that, before ye were, she loved you, preparing and ordering your progress. And after ye were made, to direct you aright, she came to you in your own likeness. And if ye may not all come to look upon her herself, do honour to her and her friends, and follow their commandments, as who proclaim to you the will of this eternal empress. Close not your ears to Solomon, who bids you thereto, when he says that the way of the righteous is a shining light that goes on and increases until the day of blessedness, following after them, gazing upon their doings, which should be a light to you on the path of this most brief life. And here may be ended the real meaning of this present ode. But the final verse, which appears as a tornata, may be very easily brought down to this exposition by means of the literal one, save in so far as it says that, in that other poem, I call this lady cruel and disdainful where be it known that at the beginning this philosophy appeared cruel to me, on the side of her body, that is, wisdom, for she smiled not upon me, inasmuch as I did not apprehend her persuasions, and scornful because she turned not her eyes to me, that is to say, I could not perceive her demonstrations, and the fault of all this was on my side, whereby, and by what has been said in the literal meaning, the allegory of the tornata is manifest. Section 13 of The Convivio This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug The Convivio by Dante Alighieri Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed Ode 3 contra gli erranti le dolci rime d'amor ch'io soglia the sweet rhymes of love which i was wont to search out in my thoughts needs must i abandon not that i have no hope of a return to them but because of the scornful and haughty gestures which in my lady have appeared have closed the way to me of wonted speech and because me seems tis time for waiting down will i lay my tender style which i have held in treating of love and i will tell of the worth whereby a man is truly gentle with harsh and subtle rhyme refuting the judgment false and base of such as would have it that of gentlehood the principle is wealth and at the outset I call upon that Lord who dwelleth in my lady's eyes, 
so that of herself she is enamoured. A certain one held empire who would have gentlehood, according as he deemed, to be the ancient possession of wealth, with gracious manners. And some other was there, of lighter wisdom, who recast such saying, and stripped it of its latter phrase, methinks, because he had it not. After him go all they who make folk gentle because of race, which has long abode in great wealth. And so inured is such false thought amongst us, that folk call that man a gentleman who can aver, I was grandson or son of such a one of worth, though he himself be naught. But basest doth he seem to whoso looks on truth, who hath been shown the way, and thereafter errs therefrom. And he hits nigh to who should be a corpse, yet walk the earth. He who defines, man is a living trunk, in the first place speaks that which is not true, and further utters the falsehood in defective guise, but haply sees no more. In like fashion did he who held empire err in definition, for in the first place he lays down the false, and on the other hand proceeds defectively. For riches cannot, as is held, either give gentlehood or take away, since in their nature they are base. Further, who paints a figure, unless himself can be it, cannot set it down, nor is an upright tower made to lean by a river that flows far away. That they be base and imperfect is apparent, for how much soever gathered, they can give no quiet, but multiply care. Wherefore the mind that is upright and true is not dismayed by their dispersion. Nor will they have it that a base man can become gentle, or that from a base father can descend a family that ever can be held as gentle. This is avowed by them. Wherefore their argument appears to halt, inasmuch as it lays down that time is requisite to gentlehood, defining it thereby. Further it followeth, from what I have above set down, that we be all gentle, or else simple, or that man had not an origin. But this I grant not, neither do they, if they be Christians. Wherefore, to sound intellects, tis manifest that what they say is vain, and thus do I refute the same as false, and therefrom dissociate me. And now, I would declare how I regard it, what is gentlehood, and whence it comes, and I will tell the tokens that a gentleman retains. I affirm that every virtue in principle cometh from one root. I mean virtue that maketh man blessed in his doing. This is, according as the ethics say, a selective habit which abideth solely in the mean such are the words set down. I affirm that nobility, in its constituent essence, ever implies the goodness of its seat, as baseness ever implies ill, and virtue, in like fashion, always carries the import of good. Wherefore, in one implication, the two agree, being to one effect. Therefore, the one needs must derive from the other, or both from the same third. But if one signifies all that the other signifies, and more as well, the derivation will rather be from it, and let this which I have now declared be presupposed. Gentlehood is wherever there is virtue, but not virtue where she is, even as the heaven is wherever is the star, but not conversely. And we, in women and in youthful age, perceive this saving thing, in so far as they are deemed alive to shame, which is diverse from virtue. Therefore shall be evolved, like purse from black, each several virtue out of her, or their generic kind, as I have laid it down above. Wherefore, 
let no one vaunt himself and say, I belong to her by race. For they are well-nigh gods who have such grace apart from all the guilty. For God alone presents it to the soul, which he sees within its person, take perfect stand. Even as to some, the seed of blessedness draws nigh, dispatched by God into the well-placed soul. The soul, whom this excellence adorns, holds it not concealed. For, from the first, when she weds the body, she shows it forth till death. Obedient, sweet, and alive to shame is she in the first age, and adorns her person with beauty, with well-according parts. In manhood she is temperate and brave, full of love and courteous praises, and delights only in deeds of loyalty. And in old age is prudent and just, and hath a name for open-handedness, rejoicing in herself to hear and to discourse of others' excellence. Then, in the fourth term of life, to God is re-espoused, contemplating the end that she awaits, and blesses the past seasons. See now how many be they deceived! Tornata Against the erring ones take thou thy way, my ode, and when thou shalt be in the region where Our Lady is, keep not thy business hid from her. Thou mayst securely Section 14 of the Convivio This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed Treatise 4, Chapters 1 through 5 Chapter 1 Love, according to the unanimous opinion of the sages who have discoursed of it, and, as we see by continuous experience, is that which brings together and unites the lover to the person loved. Wherefore Pythagoras says, In friendship many are made one. And inasmuch as many things are united, they naturally communicate their qualities to each other, insomuch that sometimes the one is completely transformed to the nature of the other, it comes to pass that the emotions of the loved person enter into the loving person, so that the love of the one is communicated to the other, and in like manner hatred and longing and every other passion. So that the friends of the one are loved by the other, and the enemies hated. Wherefore in the Greek proverb it says, All things should be common between friends. So when I became the friend of this lady, mentioned above in the real exposition, I began to love and to hate in accordance with her love and hatred. I began, therefore, to love those who follow the truth, and to hate those who follow error and falsity, even as does she. But inasmuch as everything is lovable in itself, and naught is to be hated save for the evil superinduced upon it, it is reasonable and right to hate not things, but their badness, and to strive to sever it from them. And if any other is intent upon this, my most excellent lady is most intent. I mean upon severing from things the badness which is the cause of their being hated. For in her is all reason, and in her, as in its fountain, is the right. I, following her indeed as an emotion, to the best of my power, abominated and despised the errors of men, to the infamy or blame not of the erring ones, but of the errors, blaming which I thought to make them displeasing, and when they had become displeasing, to separate them from those who for their sake were hated by me. 
amongst which errors there was one that i chiefly reprehended which inasmuch as it is not only hurtful and perilous to those who are involved in it but even to the rest who reprehend it i set about severing from them and condemning this is the error concerning human excellence in so far as it is sown by nature in us which ought to be called nobility which error by evil habit and lack of intellect was so entrenched that the opinions of almost every one had thereby been falsified and from false opinion sprang false judgments and from false judgments sprang unjust reverence and vilipending whereby the good were held in base contempt and the bad honoured and exalted which thing was the worst confusion in the world as he may see who subtly considereth what may follow therefrom and inasmuch as this my lady a little estranged her tender looks from me especially in those parts wherein i considered and searched out whether the prime matter of the elements was understood by god therefore i abstained for a season from frequenting her countenance and as though sojourning away from her presence i set about contemplating in thought and defect of men with respect to the aforesaid error and to avoid idleness which is the chief enemy of this lady and to quench that error which robs her of so many friends i purpose to cry aloud to the folk who were going on the wrong path in order that they might direct themselves on the right way and i began an ode the opening of which i said the sweet rhymes of love which i was wont wherein it is my purpose to bring back folk to the right way concerning the proper knowledge of real nobility as may be seen by making acquaintance with its text on the expounding of which i am now intent and inasmuch as in this ode i am intent on so needful a succour it was not well to speak under any figure but it behoved me to provide this medicine by the quick way in order that health the corruption of which was hurrying to so foul a death might be quickly restored there will be no need then to disclose any allegory in expounding it but only to explain the sense according to the letter by my lady i still understand the same of whom was the discourse in the preceding ode to wit that most virtuous light philosophy whose rays make the flowers bud and bears fruit the true nobility of man concerning which the ode before us purposes to speak in full chapter two at the beginning of the exposition we have undertaken the better to give to understand the meaning of the ode before us it behoves us first to divide it into two parts for in the first part the proem is spoken in the second the treatise follows and the second part begins at the beginning of the second verse where it says a certain one held empire who would have gentlehood the first part again may be comprised in three members the first contains the reason why i depart from my accustomed speech in the second i say what it is my intention to treat of in the third i ask aid of that which may most aid me namely the truth the second member begins and because me seems tis time for waiting the third begins and at the outset i call upon that lord i say then that it behoves me to drop the sweet rhymes of love which my thoughts were wont to search out and i assign the cause when i say that it is not because i purpose to make no more rhyme of love but because unwanted looks have appeared in my lady which have bereft me of matter for speaking of love at the present where be it known the gestures of this lady are not here called scornful and haughty save according to appearance even as in the tenth chapter of the preceding treatise may be seen how on another occasion i declare 
that the appearance was discordant from the reality and how this may be that one same thing may be sweet and may appear bitter or be clear and appear obscure can there be sufficiently perceived next when i say and because me seems tis time for waiting i tell as already observed whereof i purpose to treat and here we are not to pass dry shot over what is implied in time for waiting since that is the chief cause of my procedure but are to consider how reasonable it is to await the right season in all our doings and especially in our speech time as aristotle says in the fourth of the physics is the enumeration of movement in respect to before and after it is the enumeration of the movement of the heavens which disposes things here below diversely to receive the several and forming powers for the earth is one way disposed in the beginning of spring to receive into herself the power that informs grasses and flowers and in another way in winter and one season is otherwise disposed than another with regard to receiving the seed and in like manner our mind in so far as it is based upon the composition of our body which must needs follow the circulation of the heavens is one way disposed at one time and another at another wherefore words which are like the seed of activities must be very discreetly retained and let go both in order that they may be well received and brought to fruit and in order that on their own side they fail not by sterility and therefore forethought as to time must be taken both for him who speaks and for him who is to hear for if the speaker be disposed amiss his words are often hurtful and if the hearer is disposed amiss words which are good are ill received and therefore solomon says in ecclesiastes there is a time to speak and there is a time to be silent wherefore i feeling the disposition to discourse of love disturbed within me for the reason which has been told in the preceding chapter thought fit to wait on time which brings with it the goal of every longing and comes of itself as though with a gift to those who grudge not the weight wherefore says st james the apostle in the epistle in the fifth chapter behold the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth patiently enduring until he receive the early and later for well nigh all our troubles if we come to look at their origins rightly proceed in a way from not knowing how to handle time i say that since it seems well to wait i will lay down that is to say i will let be my tender style that is the tender fashion i have observed in discoursing of love and declare that i will tell of the worth whereby man is truly gentle and whereas worth may be understood in sundry ways here worth is taken as a capacity of nature or an excellence given by her as will be seen below and i promise to treat of this matter with subtle and harsh rhyme for we are to know that rhyme can be understood in two ways that is to say a larger and a narrower in the narrow sense it means that harmony which it is the custom to make in the last syllable and the last but one in the larger sense it means that whole way of discourse which in regulated numbers and time falls into rhymed consonants and it is so that it is to be taken and understood in this proem and therefore it says harsh in so far as it refers to the sound of the composition which to suit so weighty a subject should not be smooth and it says subtle with reference to the meaning of the words which proceed by subtle argument and disputation and i add 
refuting the judgment false and base, where there is further promise to refute the judgment of folk filled with error, false, that is, remote from truth, and base, that is, established and confirmed by baseness of mind. And heed must be given to this, that in this proem the promise is first to treat of the true, and then to refute the false, and in the treatise the opposite is done. For first the false is refuted, and then the true is handled, which seems not to correspond to the promise. And therefore be it known that though both the one and the other be intended, the chief intention is to treat of the true, and to refute the false is so far intended as it conduces to making the truth more plainly appear. And here the promise to treat of the truth comes first as the main intent, which brings to the mind of the hearers the longing to hear. In the treatise the false is first refuted, in order that when wrong opinions have been dissipated, the truth may be more freely received. And this method was observed by the master of human reason, Aristotle, who always first fought with the opponents of the truth, and then, when they had been convicted, demonstrated the truth. Finally, when I say, and at the outset I call upon that Lord, I summon truth to be with me, which is that Lord who dwelleth in the eyes, to wit, in the demonstrations of philosophy. And verily the truth is Lord, for when espoused thereto the mind is lady, and otherwise she is a servant, without all liberty. And it says, so that of herself she is enamoured, because philosophy, which, as was said in the preceding treatise, is the loving exercise of wisdom, contemplates herself when the beauty of her eyes is revealed to herself. And what else is this but to say that the philosophizing soul not only contemplates the truth, but also contemplates its own contemplation of the beauty thereof, turning upon itself and enamoring itself of itself by reason of the beauty of its direct contemplation? And thus ends what the text of the present treatise brings, by way of proem, in three members. Chapter 3 Having inspected the meaning of the proem, the treatise is to follow, and the better to show it forth, it behoves to divide it into its chief parts, which are three. For in the first, nobility is treated according to the opinions of others, in the second, it is treated according to the true opinion, in the third, the speech is directed to the ode, by way of a certain adorning of what has been said. The second part begins, I affirm that every virtue in principle. The third begins, Against the erring ones, take thou the way, my ode. And after these general sections, other divisions must needs be made, rightly to apprehend the meaning which is to be set forth. And let none marvel if we proceed by means of many divisions, inasmuch as it is a great and lofty work that is now under our hands, and little investigated by authors. Nor let them marvel that the treatise whereon I am now entering must needs be long and subtle to unravel the text perfectly according to the meaning which it bears. I say, then, that this first part is now to be divided into two, for in the first are laid down the opinions of others, in the second they are refuted, and the second part begins, He who defines, man is a living trunk. Again, what is still left as the first part has two members. The first is the definition of the opinion of the emperor, the second is the variation on his opinion by the vulgar herd, which is bare of all reason. The second member begins, And some other was there of lighter wisdom. I say then, A certain one held empire, 
that is to say such an one exercised the imperial office and here be it known that frederick of swabia the last emperor of the romans i say the last up to the present time notwithstanding that rudolph and adolf and albert have been elected since his death and that of his descendants when asked what gentlehood was answered that it was ancient wealth and gracious manners and i say that some other was there of lighter wisdom who weighing and turning about this definition on every side cut off the last clause to wit the gracious manners and clung to the first to wit the ancient wealth and as the text seems to conjecture it was haply because he himself had not fair manners that not wishing to lose the name of gentlehood he defined it according as it made for him to wit the possession of ancient wealth and i declare that this opinion is that of almost every one saying that after him went all those who held one gentle because he springs from a race that has long been rich inasmuch as almost all bark out this these two opinions although the one as has been said is utterly to be neglected seem to have two weighty reasons to support them the first is the philosopher's declaration that what is the opinion of the majority cannot be absolutely false the second is the most excellent authority of the imperial majesty and that the power of the truth which confutes all authority may be the better seen i purpose to expound how supporting and weighty is each one of these reasons and in the first place we can have no knowledge concerning the imperial authority unless its roots be found and these we must expressly handle in a special chapter chapter four the rude foundation of the imperial majesty is in truth the necessity of human civility which is ordained for a certain end to wit the life of felicity to the which no man is sufficient to attain by himself without the aid of any inasmuch as man hath need of many things which no one is able to provide alone wherefore the philosopher saith that man is by nature a social animal and as an individual man requires the companionship of home and household for his completeness so likewise a household requires a district for its completeness since otherwise it would suffer many defects which would be a hindrance to felicity and since a district cannot satisfy itself in everything needs must there be a city for its satisfaction and further the city requires for its arts and for its defence to have mutual relations and brotherhood with the neighbouring cities wherefore the kingdom was instituted and inasmuch as the human mind rests not in the limited possession of land but ever as we see by experience desires to acquire more territory needs must discords and wars arise betwixt kingdom and kingdom which things are the tribulations of cities and through the cities of districts and through the districts of households and through the households of man and thus is felicity impeded wherefore to abolish these wars and their causes needs must all earth and whatsoever is given to the generations of man for a possession be a monarchy that is one single princedom having one prince who possessing all things and not being able to desire more shall keep the kings contented within the boundaries of their kingdoms so that there shall be peace between them in which peace the cities may have rest and in this rest the districts may love one another and in this love the households may receive whatsoever they need and when they have received this man may live in felicity which is that whereto man was born and upon these arguments the words of the philosopher may be brought to bear which he utters in the politics that when diverse things are ordained for one end one of them must be the ruler or guide 
and all the rest must be ruled or guided by it even as we see in a ship that the divers offices and divers ends of it are ordained to one single end to wit the making of the desired port by a prosperous voyage wherein like as each officer regulates his proper function to its proper end there is one who considers all these ends and regulates them with a view to the final end and he is the shipmaster whose voice all are bound to obey and we see the same thing in religious orders and in armies and in all things which are ordained as aforesaid to some end whereby it may be manifestly seen that for the perfection of the universal religious orders of the human race it behoves that there should be one as shipmaster who considering the diverse conditions of the world and ordaining the diverse and necessary offices should have the universal and indisputable office of commanding the whole and this office is called by preeminence empire without any qualification because it is the command of all the other commands and hence he who is appointed to this office is called emperor because he is the commander who issues all these commands and what he says is law to all and he ought to be obeyed by all and every other command draws its strength and authority from his and thus it is manifest that the imperial majesty and authority is the loftiest in the fellowship of man but some might cavil and say that although the office of empire be necessary for the world yet it follows not that reason requires the authority of the roman prince is to be supreme which is the point we have to make but that the roman power was acquired not by reason nor by decree of universal consent but by force which seems to be the contrary of reason to this we may answer readily that the election of this supreme officer must needs proceed in the first instance from the council which maketh provision for all to wit from god since the election would else not have been equal for all since before the above said officer there was no one giving his mind to the general good and because there never was nor shall ever be a nature more sweet in the exercise of lordship more firm in its maintenance nor more subtle in acquiring it than the nature of the latin folk as may be seen by experience and especially that of the hallowed people in whom the high trojan blood was infused god chose that people for such office so we see that since it might not be attained without the greatest virtue nor exercised without the greatest and most humane benignity this was the people who was best disposed to it wherefore at the beginning the roman people got it not by force but by the divine providence which transcends all reason and herein doth virgil agree in the first of the aeneid where speaking in the person of god he says to them to wit to the romans i assign no limit of things nor of time to them have i given empire without end force then was not the moving cause as the caviller supposed but was the instrumental cause even as the blows of the hammer are the cause of the knife whereas the mind of the smith is the efficient and moving cause and thus not force but reason and moreover divine reason was the beginning of the roman empire and that this is so may be seen by two most manifest reasons which show that this city was imperial and had special birth and special progress from god but inasmuch as this may not be handled in the present chapter without excess of length and long chapters are the foes of memory i will make a further digression of another chapter to set forth the arguments indicated above nor will this be without profit and much delight chapter five it is no marvel if the divine providence which utterly surpasses angelic and human perception proceeds many times by ways hidden to us 
inasmuch as even human operations many times conceal their purport from men themselves but it is matter for great marvel if ever the working out of the eternal counsel proceeds so manifestly that our reason discerns it wherefore at the beginning of this chapter i may speak with the mouth of solomon who saith in his proverbs in the person of wisdom hearken for i am to speak of great things when the immeasurable divine goodness will to reconform to itself the human creature which was parted from god by the sin of the disobedience of the first man and thereby deformed it was appointed in the most lofty and united divine consistory of the trinity that the son of god should descend to earth to effect this harmony and inasmuch as at his coming into the world it was meet that not only heaven but earth should be in its best disposition and the best disposition of earth is when it is a monarchy that is to say when it is all subject to one prince as aforesaid therefore that people and that city who were destined to bring this about to wit the glorious rome were ordained by the divine providence and because the abode wherein the celestial king must enter ought to be most clean and pure there was likewise ordained a most holy family from the which after many merits should be born a woman supremely good amongst all the rest who should be the treasure-house of the son of god and this family is that of david and the triumph of honour of the human race mary to wit was born from it wherefore it is written in isaiah a rod shall spring out from the root of jesse and a flower shall spring up from his root and jesse was the father of the above said david and it was all at the same point of time wherein david was born and rome was born that is to say aeneas came into italy from troy which was the origin of the most noble city of rome as testify the scriptures whereby the divine election of the roman empire is manifest enough to wit by the birth of their holy city being at the same time as the root of the family of mary and incidentally we may note that since the heaven itself began to roll it ne'er was in better disposition than at the time when he who made it and who rules it came down below as even now by virtue of their arts the mathematicians may retrace nor was the world ever so perfectly disposed nor shall be again as then when it was guided by the voice of one sole prince and commander of the roman people as luke the evangelist beareth witness and therefore there was universal peace which never was before nor shall be and the ship of the human fellowship was speeding straight to the due port in tranquil voyage o oh, ineffable and incomprehensible wisdom of god which against thy coming into syria didst make so great a preparation beforehand in heaven above and here in italy and o oh, most foolish and vilest brutes pasturing in the semblance of men who presume to discourse against our faith and with your spinning and delving would fain know what god hath ordained with so great wisdom cursed be ye and your presumption and whoso believeth on you and as has been said before at the end of the preceding chapter not only had she a special birth from god but special progress for briefly beginning from romulus who was her first father until a most perfect age that is to say the time of the aforesaid emperor she advanced not by human but by divine activities for if we consider the seven kings who first governed her romulus numa tullus ancus and the tarquin kings who were like the guardians and protectors of her childhood we may find from the scriptures of the roman histories and especially from titus livius that they were all of diverse nature according to the needs of the period of time which was proceeding in their day then if we consider her more advanced youth when she was emancipated from the guardianship of royalty by brutus the first consul 
even until caesar the first supreme prince we shall find that she was uplifted not by human but by divine citizens into whom was inspired not human but divine love in their love of her and this could not nor might not be save for some special end purposed by god in so great an infusion of heaven and who shall say that it was without divine inspiration that fabricius refused an almost infinite quantity of gold because he would not abandon his fatherland that curious whom the samnites tried to corrupt refused a huge mass of gold for love of his fatherland saying that the roman citizens desired to possess not gold but the possessors of the gold that mucius burned his own hand because he had missed the blow whereby he had thought to deliver rome who shall say of torquatus who judged his own son to death for love of the public good that he endured this without divine help and the above said brutus in like manner who shall say it of the decii and of the drusi who laid down their life for their country and of the captive regulus sent from carthage to rome to exchange the captive carthaginians against himself and the other captive romans who shall say that when the legation had withdrawn the advice he gave for love of rome against himself was prompted only by human nature who shall say of quintus Cincinnatus, who was appointed dictator and taken from the plough and after his term of office laid it down of his own accord and went back to his ploughing who shall say of camillus banished and cast into exile that he came to free rome from her foes and when he had freed her withdrew of his own will into exile so as not to offend the authority of the senate without divine instigation o most hallowed bosom of cato who shall presume to speak of thee verily none can speak of thee more worthily than by keeping silence and following the example of jerome who in his proem to the bible where he comes to tell of paul says that it were better to hold one's peace than to come short in speech of a surety it must be manifest when we remember the life of these and of the other divine citizens that not without some light of divine goodness superadded to the excellence of their own nature such marvels were done and it must be manifest that these most excellent ones were instruments wherewith the divine providence proceeded in the roman empire wherein many a time the arm of god was seen to be present and did not god set his own hand to the battle in which the albans fought with the romans at the beginning for the headship of rule when one only roman held in his hand the freedom of rome did not god interpose with his own hand when the franks had taken all rome and were seizing the capital by stealth at night and only the voice of a goose gave notice of it did not god interpose with his own hand when in the war of hannibal so many citizens had perished that three bushels of rings were carried off to africa and the romans were ready to abandon their land had not that blessed scipio young as he was undertaken his expedition into africa for the deliverance of rome and did not god interpose with his own hand when a recent citizen a small estate tully to wit defended the liberty of rome against so great a city as was catiline yea verily wherefore we need demand no more in order to see that a special birth and special progress thought out and ordained by god was that of the holy city and verily i am of firm opinion that the stones that are fixed in her walls are worthy of reverence and the soil where she sits more worthy than man can preach or prove Section fifteen of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. 
The Convivio by Dante Alighieri, translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise four, chapter six through nine. Above, in the third chapter of this treatise, promise was given to discourse of the loftiness of the imperial authority and of the philosophic. And therefore, having discussed of the imperial authority, my digression must further proceed to the inspection of that of the philosopher according to the promise made. And our first business here is to see what authority means, because there is more need of knowing it here than in the discourse concerning the imperial authority, which by reason of its majesty does not seem to be questioned. Be it known, then, that authority is naught else than the act of an author. This word, to wit, octor, without the third letter C, may spring from two principles. The one is that of a verb, dropped very much out of use in Latin, which signifies, as much as binding words together, to wit, aio. And whoso regards it well in its first form will clearly perceive that it shows its own meaning, for it is made of naught save the bonds of words, that is to say, of the five vowels alone, which are the sole injuncture of every word. And it is composed of them in life manner, to figure the image of the tie. For beginning with A, it turns thence to U, and then goes straight by I to E, whence it goes back and returns to O so that truly they image forth this figure, which is the figure of a tie. And in as far as author is derived and descends from this verb, it is understood only of poets who have bound their words with the art of music, and with this significance we are not at present concerned. The other principle whence author descends, according to the testimony of Yuguccioni in the beginning of his derivations, is a Greek word which is called autenten, which is as much as to say in Latin worthy of faith and of obedience. Thus author, so derived, is understood of every person worthy of being believed and obeyed. And hence comes that word of which we are treating, namely authority, whereby we may see that authority is as much as utterance worthy of faith and of obedience. It is manifest that Aristotle is most worthy of faith and obedience and that his words are the supreme and most lofty authority may thus be proved amongst the workers and artificers of divers arts and operations which are ordained for one final operation or art the artificer or operator of that final art should be mainly obeyed and trusted by all as he who alone considers the ultimate goal of all the other goals wherefore the sword maker and the rein and saddle maker and the shield maker should trust the cavalier and so should all those trades which are ordained for the art of chivalry. And inasmuch as all human activities demand one goal, to wit, the goal of human life, whereto man is ordained as man, the master and artificer who explains and considers this should be mainly obeyed and trusted, and this is Aristotle. Therefore he is most worthy of faith and of obedience. And to perceive how Aristotle is the master and leader of the human reason, inasmuch as he is intent upon its conclusive activity, it behoves us to know that this our goal, which each one naturally desires, was sought for in very ancient times by the sages. And inasmuch as they who desire this goal are so numerous, and the appetites differ in almost every single case, though there be one universal goal, yet it was right hard to discern it, as that wherein every human appetite would find direct repose. There were then certain very ancient philosophers, of whom the first and chief was Zeno, whose view and belief was that the goal of this human life is solely rigid integrity, that is to say, rigidly to pursue truth and justice without respect to aught, to show no grief, to show gladness at nothing, to have no sense of any emotion. And this is how they defined this integrity, that which, apart from utility and apart from result, is, for its own sake, to be praised by reason. And they and their sect were called Stoics, and of them was that glorious Cato, of whom I dared not to speak above. There were other philosophers whose view and belief was different from theirs, and of these the first and chief was a philosopher who was called Epicurus, who, seeing that every animal as soon as it is born, and as though directed by nature to the due goal, shuns pain and seeks pleasure, said that this our goal was voluptuary. I do not say voluntary, but write it with a P, that is to say, delight without pain, 
and moreover between delight and pain he placed no middle term saying that voluptuous was none other than without pain as tully seems to recount in the first of the goal of good and of these who are called epicureans after epicurus was torquatus the noble roman descended from the blood of the glorious torquatus of whom i made mention above there were others and they took their rise from socrates and then from his successor plato who looking more subtly and seeing and perceiving that in our activities we might and did err by excess and by defect said that activity without excess and without defect according to the standard of the mean selected by our choice which is virtue was that goal whereof we are at present discoursing and they called it virtuous activity these were called the academicians of whom were plato and his nephew spupsippus so called because of the place where plato studied to wit the academy and they did not take their name from socrates because in his philosophy nothing was affirmed but aristotle whose surname was stagorides and xenocrates the chaldesonian his companion by means of the almost divine intellect which nature had imparted to aristotle coming to knowledge of this goal and pretty much by the method of socrates and the academicians put the finishing touches on moral philosophy and brought it to perfection especially aristotle and because aristotle set the fashion of discoursing while walking backwards and forwards they were called i mean he and his companions peripatetics which is as much as to say they who walk about and because the perfection of this moral science was brought to its limit by aristotle the name of the academicians was quenched and all they who learnt from this sect were called peripatetics and these yet hold sway over the world everywhere in teaching and their doctrine may in a way be called the catholic opinion whereby it may be seen that aristotle is he who directs and conducts folks to this goal and this is what we wished to show wherefore to sum up my main contention is now obvious namely that the authority of the supreme philosopher with whom we are now concerned is in full and complete vigor and it is not opposed to the imperial authority but the latter without the former is perilous and the former without the latter has a kind of weakness not in itself but because of the disorderliness of men so that when the one is bound up with the other they are most profitable and full of all vigor and therefore it is written in that of wisdom love the light of wisdom all ye who are before the peoples which is to say let the philosophical authority unite with imperial for good and perfect rule o wretched ye who at the present rule and o most wretched ye who are ruled for no philosophic authority unites with your government neither by your proper study nor by the counsel of others so that the word of ecclesiastes applies to all woe to thee o land whose king is a child and whose princes rise up early to feast and to no land may what follows be addressed blessed is the land whose king is noble and whose princes eat in due season for necessity and not for luxury give heed who be at your sides ye enemies of god who have grasped the rods of the governments of italy it is to you charles and frederick kings and to you others chiefs and tyrants that i am speaking behold who sit by your side to give counsel and count how many times in the day this goal of human life is pointed out to you by your counsellors better were it for you to fly low like a swallow than like the kite to make the loftiest wheeling over vilest things chapter seven since we have seen how the imperial and the philosophical authority which seemed to support the opinions before us are to be reverenced we are now to return to the direct path of our contemplated progress i say then that this last opinion of the vulgar has become so inured that without the inspection of any argument every one is called gentle who is son or grandson of any worthy man although he himself be of naught and this is where it says and so inured is such false thoughts among us that folk call that man a gentleman who can aver i was grandson or son of such an one of worth though he himself be not wherefore be it noted that it is most perilous neglect to suffer a false opinion to gain footing for just as grass multiplies in an uncultivated field and mounts up and overwhelms the ears of corn so that when one looks from a distance the corn may not be seen and the fruit is finally lost so false opinion in the mind if not chastised and corrected grows and multiplies so that the ear of reason to wit the right opinion is concealed and as it were buried and lost 
Oh, how great a thing have I undertaken in this ode, desiring now to cleanse so weedy a field as this of the common opinion, so long neglected of this tillage. Verily I purpose not to cleanse it throughout, but only in those parts where the ears of reason are not utterly suppressed. That is to say, I purpose to set right those in whom some glimmering of reason still survives, in virtue of their favored nature. For of the rest no more heed is to be taken than of brute beasts, because it seems to me no less a miracle to bring a man back to reason when it has been utterly quenched, than to bring back to life him who has been four days in the tomb. When the evil state of this opinion of the people has been related, the ode, clean out of the order of the refutation, incontinently smites it as a hideous thing, crying, But basest doth he seem to whoso looks on truth. To give to understand its intolerable perniciousness, asserting that such as say so lie to the very uttermost, for he is not only base, that is ungentle, but the very basest, who is descended from good forebears, but is himself bad. And I give an illustration from a way that has been pointed out, concerning which, to make it clear, I must put a question and answer it as follows. There is a plain with certain fields and footways, with hedges, ditches, boulders, logs, and well-nigh every kind of obstruction, save on its narrow footways, and it has snowed so that the snow covers up everything and gives it the same aspect all over, so that no trace of any path is to be seen. A man comes from one side of the plain and desires to go to a house that is on the other side, and by his own ingenuity, that is, by his perception and the excellence of his wit, guided by himself alone, he goes by the direct path to the place he purposes, leaving the footprints of his steps behind him. After him comes another and wishes to go to the same house, and needs only to follow the footprints already left, and by his own fault the path which the other had contrived to find for himself. Without guidance, this man loses, although he has guidance, and he twists about amongst the thorns and the ruins, and reaches not the quarter where he should go. Which of these should be called worthy? I answer, he who went before. And what should the second one be called? I answer, most base. Wherefore is he not called not worthy, that is base? I answer, because he should be called not worthy, that is base, who having no guidance should not journey rightly, but because this man had guidance his error and his fault cannot be exceeded, and therefore he is to be called not base, but basest. And thus he who is ennobled in race by his father or by some forebear, and perseveres not therein, is not only base, but basest, and worthy of all scorn and vituperation, more than any other churl. And that man should be on their guard against this lowest baseness. Solomon, in the twenty-second chapter of the Proverbs, bids him who has had a worthy forebear, Pass not the ancient boundaries which thy fathers set up. And earlier, in the fourth chapter of the said book, he declares, The path of the just, that is of the worthy, goeth forward as a shining light, and that of the wicked is darkened, and they know not whither they plunge. And finally, when it says, And he hits nigh to who should be a corpse yet walk the earth. I say to his further disgrace that such a basest one is dead, though he seem alive. And here be it known that a bad man may rightly be called dead, especially he who departs from the truth path of his worthy forebear. And this may be demonstrated thus. As Aristotle says in the second of the soul, Life is the being of the thing that is alive, and since life is after many fashions, as in plants to vegetate, in animals to vegetate and feel, in men to vegetate, feel, move, and reason or understand, and things should be named from their most noble part, it is clear that life in animals, I mean brute animals, is feeling, and life in man is exercising the reason. Therefore, if his life is the being of man, renouncing the exercise of reason is renouncing his existence, and so it is being dead. And does he not renounce the exercise of reason who gives himself no account of the goal of his life? And does not he renounce the exercise of his reason who gives himself no account of the path he ought to take? Assuredly he does. And this is most manifest in him who has the footprints before him and regards them not. And therefore Solomon says in the fifth chapter of the Proverbs, He shall die because he had no discipline, and in the multitude of his foolishness shall he be deceived. That is to say, he is dead who does not become a discipline, and who follows not the master. And such an one is most base. And of him some may say, How is he dead and yet walks? I answer that the man is dead, but the beast survives. 
for as says the philosopher in the second of the soul the powers of the soul are graded as the figure of the quadrangle is of higher grade than the triangle and the pentagon of higher grade than the quadrangle thus the sensitive is of higher grade than the vegetative and the intellectual of higher grade than the sensitive and so just as if you withdraw the last side of a pentagon you have a quadrangle left but no longer a pentagon so if you withdraw the last power of the soul that is the reason the man is no longer left but something with a sensitive soul only that is a brute animal and this is the meaning of the second verse of the ode we have in hand wherein are laid down the opinions of others chapter eight the fairest branch that rises from the root of reason is discrimination for as thomas says in prologue to the ethics to know the relation of one thing to another is the proper act of reason and this is discrimination one of the fairest and sweetest fruits of this branch is the reverence which the lesser owes to the greater wherefore tully in the first of offices speaking of the beauty which glows in integrity says that reverence is part of it and as this reverence is a beautifying of integrity so its opposite is a befouling and demeaning of the same the which opposite may be called irreverence or mutiny in our vernacular and therefore tully himself in the same place says carelessness to know what others think of him is the mark not only of an arrogant but of a profligate man which is no other than to say that arrogance and profligacy consists in being without knowledge of oneself which is the foundation of the standard of every kind of reverence wherefore i desiring to observe all reverence of speech both to the prince and to the philosopher while removing what is pernicious from the mind of certain in order thereafter to let in upon it the light of truth before proceeding to refute the opinions before us shall make it clear that in refuting them i do not argue with irreverence either towards the imperial majesty or towards the philosopher for were i to show myself lacking in reverence in any other part of all this book it were not so foul a blot as if i were to do it in this treatise where in treating of nobility i am bound to show myself noble and not churlish and first i will show that i do not presume against the authority of the philosopher and then i will show that i do not presume against the imperial majesty i declare then that when the philosopher says that which the majority think cannot be absolutely false he does not mean to speak of outward or sensuous judgment but of inward or rational for a sensuous judgment in accordance with the majority would often be most false especially in the case of the objects common to more senses than one wherein the sense is often deceived thus we know that to the majority the sun appears to be a foot in diameter which is most false for according to the research and discovery which human reason with its attendant arts has made the diameter of the body of the sun is five times as great as that of earth and half a time over and since the diameter of the earth is six thousand five hundred miles the diameter of the sun which seems to sensuous judgment to measure a foot is thirty five thousand seven hundred and fifty miles and hereby it is evident that aristotle did not mean sensuous judgment and therefore if i aim only at refuting this sensuous judgment i am not going to counter to the purport of the philosopher and therefore neither do i offend against the reverence due to him and that it is the sensuous judgment which i purpose to refute is manifest for they who so judge judge only by what they perceive of the things which fortune can give and take away for when they see alliances and distinguished marriages and stupendous buildings and great possessions and mighty lordships they suppose them to be the causes of nobleness nay they suppose them to be nobleness itself whereas if they judged by rational appearances they would say the opposite namely that nobleness is the cause of these things as will be seen below in this treatise and even as i speak not counter to the reverence of the philosopher in refuting this as is plain to see so i speak not counter to the reverence of the empire and i purpose to show why but since we are arguing in the face of the adversary the orator must take great heed in his speech lest the adversary draw matter therefrom to obscure the truth i who am speaking in this treatise in the presence of so many adversaries cannot speak briefly wherefore if my digressions are long let no one marvel i say then that to show that i am not irreverent to the majesty of the empire we must first consider what reverence is i say that reverence is no other than the profession of due submission by patent sign and perceiving this we must distinguish between irreverent and non-reverent 
irreverent implies privation non-reverent implies negation so irreverence is withholding due submission by patent sign non-reverence is the not avowing of submission which is not due a man may repudiate a thing in two ways one kind of repudiation clashes with the truth when due profession is withheld and this is properly disconfessing in the other way a man may repudiate without coming into collision with the truth when he will not confess that which is not and this is properly denying as for instance for a man to repudiate the assertion that he is altogether mortal is to deny it in the proper sense of the word wherefore if i deny reverence to the empire i am not irreverent but i am non-reverent for it is not contrary to reverence inasmuch as it does not clash with it but even as not being alive does not clash with life but being dead clashes with it for it is the privation of it whence being dead is one thing and not being alive is another for not being alive pertains to stones and because death implies privation which cannot be save in a subject of the habit in question and stones are not subjects of life therefore they should not be called dead but not alive in like manner i who in this case owe no reverence to the empire am not irreverent in renouncing it but am non-reverent which is not mutiny nor a thing of blame nay reverence if reverence it could be called would be mutiny for it would result in a greater and more real irreverence that is to say irreverence towards nature and towards truth as will be seen below against this error that master of the philosophers aristotle guarded himself in the beginning of the ethics when he says if we have two friends and one of them is the truth we must comply with the truth but verily since i have admitted that i am non-reverent which is denying reverence to wit denying by patent signs submission that is not due we must investigate how this act of mine is denying and not disconfessing that is to say how in this case i am not duly subject to the imperial majesty and since the argument must needs be lengthy i purpose to demonstrate it in a chapter of its own next following chapter nine to see how in this case that is in refuting or confirming the emperor's opinion i am not bound to submission to him the argument conducted above in the fourth chapter of this treatise concerning the imperial office must be called to mind to wit that the imperial authority was invented for the perfection of human life and that it is by right the regulator and ruler of all our doings because so far as our doings stretch so far the imperial majesty has jurisdiction and beyond these boundaries it does not extend but like as every art and office of man is confined to certain limits by the imperial office so is this empire itself bounded by god within certain limits nor need we marvel at this for we see that the office and the art of nature is bounded in all its activities for if we would take the universal nature of the whole it has jurisdiction so far as the whole universe i mean the heaven and the earth extends and this is up to a certain fixed boundary as is proved in the third of the physics and in the first of heaven and earth therefore the jurisdiction of universal nature is bounded by certain limits and by consequence so is the particular moreover he doth bound her who is bounded by naught to wit the prime excellence which is god who alone with infinite capaciousness comprehends infinitude and to perceive the limits of our operations be it known that those only are operations of ours which are subject to the reason and to the will for albeit there are digestive operations in us these are not human but natural and be it known that our reason is related to four kinds of operations to be considered separately for there are operations which it only considers and does not perform nor can it accomplish any of them for instance things natural and supernatural and mathematics and operations which it considers and accomplishes by its own act which are called rational as are the arts of speech and operations which it considers and accomplishes in material external to itself as are the mechanical arts and all these operations though their consideration is subject to our will are not subject to our will in themselves for however much we might wish that heavy things should rise upward by nature they would not be able so to rise and however much we might wish a syllogism with false premises to be a conclusive demonstration of the truth it would not be one and however much we might wish a house to sit as firmly when overhanging as when straight it would not because we are not properly speaking makers of these operations but their discoverers 
it was another that ordained them and a greater maker who made them there are also operations which our reason considers as they exist in the act of will such as attacking and succoring standing ground or fleeing in battle abiding chased or wantoning and these are entirely subject to our will and therefore we are considered good or bad on their account because they are properly ours in their entirety for so far as our will can have its way so far do operations that are really ours extend and inasmuch as some equity is to be observed and some iniquity to be avoided in all these voluntary operations and this equity may be missed for two reasons either lack of knowing what it is or lack of will to pursue it therefore was written reason invented both to point it out and to enforce it wherefore augustine says if it equity were known to men and when known were observed there would be no need of written reason and therefore it is written in the beginning of the old digest written reason is the art of good and of equity it is to write to demonstrate and to enforce this equity that the official is appointed of whom we are discoursing to wit the emperor and to him we are subject to the extent of those operations properly our own of which we have spoken and no further for this reason in every art and in every trade the artificers and disciples are and ought to be subject to the chief and the master thereof in the respective trades and arts outside of which the subjection is annulled because the chieftaincy is annulled wherefore we may in some sort say of the emperor if we wish to figure his office by an image that he is the rider of the human will and how that horse courses over the plain without the rider is manifest enough and especially in the wretched italy which without any mediator at all has been abandoned to her own direction and be it observed that the more special a thing is to any art or discipline then the more complete is the subjection therein for if the cause be enhanced so is the effect whence we are to know that there be some things so purely matter of art that nature is their instrument such as rowing with the oar where the art makes an instrument of impulsion which is a natural movement or as in threshing leaven where the art makes an instrument of heat which is a natural quality and it is herein most of all that subjection is due to the chief and master of the art and there are things wherein the art is an instrument of nature and these are arts in a lesser degree and in them the artificers are less subject to their chief as in committing seed to the earth wherein heed must be given to the will of nature as in issuing from a port wherein heed must be given to the natural disposition of the weather and therefore we see that in these things there often arises contention amongst the artificers and the superior asks counsel of the inferior there are other things which are not a part of an art but seem to have some relation to it and as to this mistakes are often made and in these things the learners are not subject to the artificer or master nor are they bound to trust him so far as the art goes thus fishing seems to have some connection with navigation and knowledge of the virtues of herbs with agriculture yet they have no common discipline inasmuch as fishing comes under the art of venery and under its command and the knowledge of the virtues of herbs under medicine or under some more general discipline in like manner all these points which we have discussed with reference to the other arts may be noted with reference to the imperial art for there are regulations in it which are pure arts such as are the laws concerning matrimony concerning slaves concerning warfare concerning the successors to titles and as to these we are entirely subject to the emperor without any doubt or hesitation there are other laws which have as it were to follow the lead of nature such as constituting a man of sufficient age for managing his own affairs and herein we are not completely subject there are many others which seem to have some relation to the imperial art and herein those were and are deceived who believe that in such matters an imperial pronouncement carries authority for instance as to manhood we are not to accept any imperial judgment on the ground of its being the emperor's so let us render to god that which is god's and accordingly we are not to trust nor accept the emperor nero who said that manhood was beauty and strength of body but him who should say that manhood is the apex of the natural life and that would be the philosopher it is therefore evident that defining gentlehood is not a part of the emperor's art and if it is not a part of his art then in treating of it we are not subject to him and if we are not subject we are not bound to reverence him therein and this is exactly what we were in search of wherefore we may now with full freedom 
and with full coverage of mind smite upon the breasts of the depraved opinions that are current on the earth in order that the true opinion by this Section 16 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 4, Chapters 10 through 13. Chapter 10. Now that the opinions of others concerning nobility have been laid down, and it has been proved that I am free to refute them, I shall come to the discussion of that part of the ode which contains this refutation. And it begins, as said above, He who defines, man is a living trunk. And so be it known that the opinion of the emperor, although he said it down defectively, did in one phrase, to wit where he said, gracious manners, really hit some part of the ways of nobleness, and therefore there is no thought of refuting it there. It is the other phrase, which is absolutely foreign to the nature of nobleness, that there is thought of refuting, for it seems to indicate two things when it speaks of ancient wealth, to wit, time and riches, which are utterly foreign to nobility, as I have already said, and as I shall prove below. And therefore the refutation falls into two parts. First, riches are rejected, and then time is rejected, as causes of nobleness. The second part begins nor will they have it that a base man can become gentle. Be it known that to reject riches is to refute not only that part of the emperor's opinion that indicates riches, but the whole of the opinion of the vulgar herd, which was based on riches alone. The first part is divided into two, for in the first it is asserted generally that the emperor was wrong in his definition of nobility. In the second it is shown the reason why, and this second part begins, for riches cannot as is held. I say then, he who defines man is a living trunk, firstly speaks not the truth, that is to say speaks false, in so far as he says trunk, and then not the whole thing, that is to say speaks it defectively, in so far as he says living, and does not say rational, which differentiates men from beasts. Then I say that in like manner did he who held empire err in his definition, and I say not emperor, but who held empire, to indicate that, as said above, deciding this question is beside the imperial office. Then I say that he erred in like manner, because he laid down a false subject of nobility, namely, ancient wealth, and then proceeded to a defective form, or differentiating principle, to wit, gracious manners, which do not comprehend the whole formal principle of nobleness, but a very small part of it, as will be shown below. And we are not to overlook, though the text says naught about it, that in this matter Messer the Emperor not only erred in the phrases of his definition, but also in his mode of defining, although fame proclaims him to have been a great logician and clerk. For the definition of nobleness would be more suitably drawn from its effects than from its sources, inasmuch as it appears itself to have the character of a source, which cannot be made known by the things that precede it, but by the things that follow from it. Then when I say, for riches cannot, as is held, I show that they cannot cause nobleness, because they are base, and I show that they cannot take it away, because they are completely severed from nobleness, and I show that they are base by one very great and manifest defect that they have, and this I do when I say, that they be base is apparent, and the rest. Finally, I conclude by virtue of what is said above, that the upright mind is not changed by their translation, which proves what was said above, viz. that they are severed from nobleness, because the effects of union do not follow. And here be it known, that as the philosopher has it, whatever things produce anything, the latter must needs first exist perfectly in the being of the others. Wherefore he says in the seventh of the metaphysics, when one thing is generated by another, it is generated by it in virtue of existing in its being. Further we are to know that everything which is destroyed is destroyed because of some preceding change, and anything which is affected must needs be some way connected with that change, as the philosopher has it in the seventh of the physics and in the first of generation. 
these things laid down i thus proceed and say that riches cannot as folk suppose confer nobility and to show their still further remoteness from it i add that they cannot take it away from him who has it they cannot give it inasmuch as they are naturally base and by reason that baseness is contrary to nobility and here baseness means degenerateness which is opposed to nobleness inasmuch as one contrary does not nor cannot produce the other for the reason above stated and all this is briefly appended to the text in the words further who paints a figure unless himself can be it cannot set it down wherefore no painter could set down any figure unless he had first in intention become such as the figure is to be further they cannot take it away because they are remote from nobleness and for the reason stated above whatsoever modifies or destroys anything must needs be connected with it and therefore it adds nor is an upright tower made to lean by a river that flows far away which means to utter naught else than a parallel to what was said before namely that riches cannot take away nobleness speaking as though this nobleness were an upright tower and as though riches were a river flowing far away from it chapter eleven it now remains only to prove how riches are base and how they are disconnected and remote from nobleness and this is proved in two clauses of the text to which attention must now be given and then when they have been expounded what i will have said will be evident to wit that riches are base and remote from nobleness and thereby the arguments against riches urged above will be perfectly established i say then that they be base and imperfect is apparent and to prove that which it is my purpose to express be it known that the baseness of a thing flows from its imperfection and its nobleness from its perfection wherefore the more perfect a thing is the nobler is it in its nature and the more imperfect the baser and so if riches are imperfect it is clear that they are base and that they are imperfect the text briefly proves when it says for how much soever gathered they can give no quiet but multiply care wherein is manifest not only their imperfection but also that their condition is most imperfect and therefore that they are most base and to this lucan testifies when he says addressing them without resistance did the laws perish but ye riches the basest part of things stirred battle briefly their imperfection may be seen clearly in three things first in their undiscerning advent secondly in their perilous growth thirdly in their hurtful possession and before i prove this a difficulty that seems to rise must be explained for inasmuch as gold and gems have perfect form and act in their own being it seems untrue to say that they are imperfect and therefore be it known that they themselves in themselves considered are perfect things not riches however but gold and gems but so far as they are designed for the possession of man they are riches and in this sense they are full of imperfection for there is no inconsistency in one and the same thing under different aspects being both perfect and imperfect i say that their imperfection may be noted firstly in the want of discernment in their advent wherein no distributive justice shines but absolute iniquity almost always which iniquity is the proper effect of imperfection for if we consider the ways in which they come all may be gathered into three fashions for either they came by pure fortune as when without intention or hope they come by some unsought discovery or they come by fortune supported by reason as by testament or by mutual succession or they come by fortune aiding reason as in lawful or unlawful gains by lawful i mean the earnings of art or trade or service by unlawful i mean theft or plunder and in each of these three modes that iniquity of which i speak may be observed for hidden wealth which is discovered or rediscovered oftener presents itself to the bad than to the good and this is so obvious that it needs no proof indeed i have seen the place on the ribs of the mountain in tuscany called falterona where the basest churl of the whole countryside discovered as he was digging more than a bushel of satellanas of finest silver which had been waiting for him maybe a thousand years or more and it was because he noted this want of equity that aristotle declared that the more subject a man is to understanding the less subject he is to fortune and i affirm that inheritance by will or by succession oftener comes to the bad than to the good and of this i will not to bring any evidence but let each man turn his eyes round his own neighbourhood and he will perceive that of which i speak not so as to cast no smirch on any would that it were god's pleasure that what the provencal desired should come to pass that whoso is not heir of the excellence should lose the inheritance of the possessions 
and i affirm that gain is precisely that which comes oftener to the bad than to the good for illegitimate gains never come to the good at all because they reject them what good man will ever seek gain by force or by fraud it were impossible for by the very choice of the unlawful undertaking he would cease to be good and lawful gains rarely come to the good because since much anxious care is needful thereto and the anxious care of the good man is directed to weightier matters rarely does the good man give sufficient attention thereto wherefore it is clear that in every way the advent of these riches is iniquitous and therefore our lord called them iniquitous when he said make to yourselves friends of the money of iniquity inviting and encouraging men to liberality in benefactions which are the begetters of friends and how fair an exchange does he make who gives of these most imperfect things in order to have and to gain perfect things such as are the hearts of worthy men and this market is open every day verily this merchandise is unlike others for when the thought is to purchase one man by benefaction thousands are purchased by it and who has not alexander in his heart even yet for his royal benefactions who has not the good king of castile in his heart or saladin or the good marquess of monferrato or the good count of toulouse or bertram de borne or galeazzo of monte feltro when mention is made of their donations truly not only those who would gladly do the like but they who would sooner die than do it love their memory chapter twelve as has been said the imperfection of riches may be observed not only in their undiscerning advent but preeminently in their perilous growth and therefore the text makes mention only of that wherein the defect may be most eagerly perceived saying of them that how much soever gathered they not only give no rest but create more thirst so as to make folk still more defective and imperfect and here be it known that defective things may harbor their defects in such fashion that they appear not at first sight the imperfection hiding under a pretext of perfection or they may so harbor them as completely to reveal them so that the imperfection is recognized openly on the surface and those things which at first conceal their defects are the most dangerous because in many cases we cannot be on our guard against them as we see in the instance of a traitor who in appearance shows himself a friend so that he begets in us a confidence in him and beneath the pretext of friendship he hides the defect of enmity and it is in this fashion that riches are dangerously imperfect in their growth for submitting certain things to us which they promise they actually bring the contrary the false traitoresses ever promise to make him who gathers them full of satisfaction when they have been amassed up to a certain sum and with this promise they lead the human will to the vice of avarice and this is why bothius in that of consolation calls them perilous saying ah me who was he who first dug out the weights of hidden gold and the stones that sought to hide themselves those precious perils the false traitoresses promise if it be well considered to remove every thirst and every want and to bring satiety and sufficiency for this is what they do at first to every man confidently fixing this promise at a certain measure of their growth and then when they are amassed to that point in place of satiety and of a refreshment they give and produce the thirst of a feverish bosom and not to be endured and in the place of sufficiency they offer a new limit that is to say a greater quantity to long for and together with it fear and great concern for what has already been acquired so that verily they give no quiet but multiply care which without them was not there before and therefore says tully in that of the paradox denouncing riches as to their money and their splendid mansions and their wealth and their lordship and the delights by which they are chiefly attracted never in truth have i ranked them amongst things good or desirable inasmuch as i saw for a certainty that in the abundance of these things men longed most for the very things wherein they abounded for never is the thirst of cupidity filled nor sated and not only are they tortured by the longing to increase their possessions but they are also tortured by fear of losing them and all these words are tully's and so they stand in that book which has been mentioned and for further witness to this imperfection behold bothius declaring in that of consolation though the goddess of riches should bestow as much as the sand rolled by the wind-tossed sea or as many as the stars that shine the human race will not cease to wail and since it is fitting to gather yet more evidence to bring this to proof let us pass by all that solomon and his father cried out against them all that seneca especially in writing to lucilius all that horace all that juvenal 
and briefly all that every writer every poet and all that the truthful divine scripture cries out against these false harlots full of all defects and that our faith may be drawn from our own eyes let us give heed to the life of them who chase them and see in what security they live when they have gathered of them and how content they are how reposeful and what else day by day in perils and slays cities countries and single persons so much as the new amassing of wealth by any one which amassing reveals new longings the goal of which may not be reached without wrong to some one and what else is the one and the other reason i mean the canonical and the civil intended to cure so much as to make defence against the greed which grows as riches are amassed verily the one and the other reason manifests it sufficiently if we read their beginnings i mean the beginning of their scripture oh how manifest nay rather how most manifest is that in their growth they are utterly imperfect since naught save imperfection can spring from them when they are gathered together and this it is that the text affirms but here by way of difficulty arises a question which we must not omit to ask and to answer some cavalier against the truth may say that if riches are imperfect and therefore base because as they are acquired the longing for them increases by a like reason knowledge should be imperfect and base since in the acquiring of it the longing for it doth ever increase wherefore seneca says had i one foot in the grave i should wish to learn but it is not true that knowledge is made base by imperfection therefore by the destruction of the consequent the increase of longing does not produce baseness in knowledge that knowledge is perfect is manifest from the philosopher in the sixth of the ethics who says knowledge is a perfect account of things which are certain to this question a brief answer must be given but first we must see whether in the acquisition of knowledge the longing for it does so expand as is asserted in the question and whether it is for a reason for which i assert that not only in the acquisition of knowledge and of wealth but in every acquisition human desire dilates though in different ways which reason is this that the supreme longing of everything and that first given to it by nature is to return to its first principle and inasmuch as god is the first principle of our souls and hath made them like to himself even as it is written let us make man in our image and after our likeness the soul itself most chiefly longs to return to him and like a pilgrim who is travelling on a road where he hath never been before who believes that every house which he sees from afar is the hostel and finding that it is not directs his belief to another and so from house to house until he comes to the hostel even so our soul so soon as it enters upon the new and never yet made journey of life directs its eyes to the goal of its supreme good and therefore whatever it sees that appears to have some good in it it thinks to be it and because its knowledge is at first imperfect through having no experience or instruction little goods appear great to it and therefore it begins first from them in its longing and so we see little children intensely longing for an apple and then going on further longing for a little bird and then further on longing for fine clothes and then a horse and then a mistress and then wealth but not much then much and then enormous and this comes to pass because in none of these things does he find that for which he is ever searching but believes he will find it further on wherefore we may perceive that one desirable thing stands in front of the other before the eyes of our soul something after the fashion of a pyramid wherein the smallest part first covers all the rest and is as it were the apex of the supreme object of longing which is god as it were the base of all the rest wherefore the further we proceed from the apex toward the base the greater do objects of our longing appear and this is why in the process of acquisition the longings of men become more capacious one after the other but in truth we may lose this way in error just as we may lose the paths of earth for even as from one city to another there must needs be a best and straightest way and another which ever recedes therefrom to wit the one which goes in the opposite direction and many others some departing less from it and some approaching it less so in human life are diverse paths of which one is the truest and another the falsest and certain less false and certain less true and even as we see that the path which goeth straightest to the city fulfilleth the longing and giveth rest after the toil and that which goeth the contrary never accomplisheth it and may never give rest so it cometh to pass in our life that he who taketh the right path reacheth the goal and hath rest but he who goeth astray never reacheth it 
but with great toil of his mind ever gazeth before him with greedy eyes wherefore although this discourse doth not fully answer the question raised above yet doth it at least clear the way for the answer for it maketh us perceive that every longing of ours dilateth not after one same fashion but since this chapter is somewhat protracted the answer to the question must be given in a new chapter wherein will be ended the whole disputation which it is our present purpose to make against riches chapter thirteen in answer to the question i affirm that the desire of knowledge cannot be properly said to increase although as has been declared it dilates in a certain fashion for that which properly speaking increases is always one the desire for knowledge is not always one but is many and when one ends another succeeds so that properly speaking its dilating is not an increasing but a succession of great things to small for if i desire to know the elements of natural things the moment i know them this desire is completed and ended and if i then desire to know what each of these elements is and how it exists this is another new desire nor by the axis of this am i bereft of the perfection to which the other led me and this dilating is not the cause of imperfection but of greater perfection but that of riches is properly an increasing for it is always one only so that here we can detect no succession of goals reached and perfections realized and if the adversary should say that as the desire to know the elements of natural things is one and the desire to know what they are is another so the desire for a hundred marks is one and the desire for a thousand another i answer that it is not true for a hundred is a part of a thousand and is related to it as part of a line to the whole line along which we proceed by one sole motion and there is no succession there nor perfected motion in any part but to know which are the elements of natural things and to know what each of them is are not parts of one another but are related as different lines along which you cannot proceed by one motion but when the motion of one is complete the motion of the other succeeds and thus it appears that knowledge is not as laid down in the question to be considered imperfect because of the desire for knowledge as riches are because of the desire for them for in the desire for knowledge desires are successively accomplished and brought to perfection and in the desire for riches it is not so so that the question is solved and does not hold it is true that the opponent may stay cavil and say that although many desires are satisfied in the acquisition of knowledge yet we never accomplish the ultimate one which is something like the imperfection of a desire which remaining one and the same never comes to an end here again we answer that this counter assertion is not true namely that the ultimate desire is never accomplished for our natural desires as shown above in the third treatise go down to a certain limit and the desire of knowledge is a natural one so that a certain limit satisfies it although few because of the ill path they take complete the journey and he who understands the commentator in the third of the soul understands this from him and therefore aristotle in the tenth of the ethics speaking against the poet simonides says that man should draw himself to divine things the most he may wherein he shows that our power contemplates a certain limit and in the first of the ethics he says that the disciplined man requires to know the certainty of things in the degree wherein their nature admits of certainty wherein he shows that not only should a limit be contemplated on the side of the man who desires knowledge but on the side of the desired object of knowledge and that is why paul says we are not to know more than is fitting to know but to know in measure so that in whatever way the desire for knowledge is taken whether in general or in particular it reaches perfection and therefore perfect knowledge has a notable perfection and its perfection is not lost by the desire for it as in the case of accursed riches and how these be hurtful in their possession we are now briefly to show for this is the third note of their imperfection their possession may be seen to be hurtful by two reasons one that it is the cause of evil the other that it is the privation of good it is the cause of evil because by mere watchfulness it makes the possessor fearful and hateful how great is the terror of him who knows that he has wealth about him as he journeys and as he stays not only waking but sleeping lest he lose not only his possessions but his life for his possessions sake well do the wretched merchants know it who traverse the world whom the very leaves which the wind tosses make to tremble when they are carrying their riches with them and when they are without them full of security they shorten their way by song and discourse and therefore the sage says if the wayfarer had entered on his journey empty he would sing in the face of the robbers 
and this is what lucan means to say in the fifth book when he commends poverty for its security saying o secure ease of the poor life o ye narrow homes and huts o wealth of the gods not yet understood to what temples and to what fortifications could this ever chance not to know any tumult of fear when the hand of caesar knocks and this lucan says when he tells how caesar came by night to the hut of the fisherman amyclas to cross the adriatic sea and what hatred is that which every one bears to the possessor of wealth whether through envy or through desire to seize the possessions verily it is so great that many times the counter to the tenderness he owes the son schemes the father's death and of this the latins have most great and manifest examples both in the region of po and in the region of tiber and there bothius in the second of his consolation says verily avarice makes men hated also their possession is the negation of good for when they are possessed liberality is not practised which is a virtue and virtue is a perfect good and makes men illustrious and loved which may not be achieved by possessing wealth but by relinquishing the possession of it wherefore bothius in the same book says money is only good when transferred to others by the practice of liberality it is no longer possessed wherefore the baseness of riches is manifest enough by reason of all their characteristics and so a man of right appetite and of true knowledge never loves them and not loving them does not unite himself to them but ever wishes them to be far removed from him save as they be ordained to some necessary service and this is reasonable because the perfect can never unite with the imperfect and so we see that the curved line can never unite with the straight and if there be any union it is not of line with line but of point with point and therefore it follows that the mind which is upright to wit in appetite and true to wit in knowledge is not undone by losing them as the text lays down at the end of this section and by this effect the text purposes to prove that they are a running stream remote from the upright tower of reason or of nobleness and thereby that these riches cannot take away nobleness from him who has it Section 17 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 4, Chapters 14 through 17. The error of others having been refuted in that part wherein it rests upon wealth, in that part wherein it asserted time to be a cause of nobleness, saying, of ancient wealth, and this refutation is conducted in that part which begins, nor will they have it that a base man can become gentle. And the first this is refuted by an argument of the very ones who are in this error, then for their greater confusion this argument of theirs is itself also refuted and this is done when it says further it followeth from what i have above set down finally the conclusion is reached that their error is manifest and therefore it is time to turn to the truth and this is done where it says wherefore to sound intellects and the rest i say then nor will they have it that a base man can become gentle and here be it known that it is the opinion of the erring ones that a man once churl may never be called gentle and a man who is the son of a churl in like manner may never be called gentle and this shatters their own doctrine when they imply that time is required for nobleness by inserting that word ancient for it is impossible in the process of time to come to the moment that begets nobleness according to this their argument that has been rehearsed which precludes a churl from being ever able to become gentle for aught that he may do or by any accident, and precludes the passage from a churl father to a gentle son. For if the son of a churl is only a churl, then his son again is only the son of a churl, and therefore his son too is a churl, and so we shall never at all be able to find the point at which nobility begins by process of time. And if the adversary, bent on making some defense, should say that nobility begins at the point of time when the base state of the ancestors is forgotten, I say that that is counter to them themselves, 
for of sheer necessity there would at that point be a transition from churlishness to gentleness either of the same man from one into the other or between father and son which is contrary to what they lay down and if the adversary were stubbornly to defend his case by saying that they admit that this change can take place when the base estate of the ancestors has fallen into oblivion although the text takes no heed of this it is right that the gloss should answer it and therefore i answer thus that from the contention of theirs follow four extreme absurdities so that the argument cannot be good the first is that the better human nature became the harder and the slower would the generating of gentleness be which is the greatest absurdity inasmuch as a thing is the more mindful in proportion as it is better and is a greater cause of good and nobleness is counted amongst things that are good and that this would be so is thus proved if gentleness or nobleness by which i mean one and the same thing were generated by oblivion nobleness would be the sooner generated in proportion as men were more forgetful for thereby all forgetfulness would come the quicker therefore the more forgetful men were the sooner would men become noble and counterwise the better memory they had the more slowly would they be ennobled the second is that this distinction between noble and base could not be made with respect to anything except men which is highly absurd inasmuch as we recognize in every kind of thing the features of nobleness or baseness so that we often speak of a noble horse and a base one and a noble falcon and a base one and a noble pearl and a base one and that this distinction could not be made is thus proved if oblivion of base ancestors is the cause of nobleness then in cases where there has never been any baseness of ancestors there cannot be any oblivion of them inasmuch as oblivion is the perishing of memory so that in these aforesaid animals other than man and plants and minerals baseness and loftiness cannot be traced since their nature holds them to one only and equal state and in their generation there can be no nobleness and so neither any baseness inasmuch as these two are to be regarded as habit and privation which are possibilities of one identical subject and therefore in these things there can be no distinction between one and the other and if the adversary should choose to say that in other things nobleness means the excellence of the thing but in men it means the memory of their base condition has perished one would wish to answer not with words but with a dagger to such a stupidity as it would be to assign excellence as the cause of nobleness in other things and oblivion as its principle in the case of men the third is that the thing generated would often come before the thing generating which is utterly impossible and this may be shown as follows let us suppose that gerardo de camino had been the grandson of the basest churl that ever drank of the sile or the cognano and that oblivion of his grandfather had not yet come about who should dare to say that gerardo de camino would have been a base man and who would not agree with me and say that he was noble of a surety no one howsoever presumptuous he might be for noble he was and so will his memory be for ever and if oblivion of his base ancestor had not come about as is urged in the objection and he had been great in nobility and his nobleness had been thus openly perceived as openly perceived it is it would have existed in him before that which generated it had come about and this is supremely impossible the fourth is that a man should be held noble when dead who was not noble when alive than which there can be no greater absurdity and that this would follow is shown thus let us suppose that in the age of dardanus the memory of his base ancestors survived and let us suppose in the age of laomedon this memory had perished and oblivion had taken its place according to the opinion we are attacking laomedon was gentle and dardanus was a churl when they were alive we to whom the memory of their ancestors i mean beyond dardanus has not come down are we to say that dardanus was a churl when he was alive and is noble now that he is dead and the report that dardanus was the son of jove is nothing counter to this for it is a fable to which in a philosophical discussion we should give no heed and at any rate if the adversary should choose to take his stand on the fable verily that which the fable veils destroys all his arguments and thus it is manifest that the argument which laid down oblivion as the cause of nobleness is false and erroneous chapter fifteen 
when the ode has disproved on their own teaching that time is demanded for nobleness it straightway goes on to confound their aforesaid teaching itself so that no rust may be left by their false arguments upon the mind which is disposed to the truth and this it does when it says further it followeth from what i have above set down and here be it known that if a man cannot become gentle from a churl and neither can a gentle son be born from a base father as was laid down above in their opinion one of two absurdities must follow the one is that there is no nobleness the other is that there has always been a multiplicity of men in the world so that the human race is not descended from one single man and this can be demonstrated if nobleness is not begotten anew and it has been said above repeatedly that their opinion involves this because it allows not its derivation from a base man to himself nor from a base father to his son a man is always such as he is born and he is born such as its father and so this transmission of one single condition has come down from the first parent wherefore such as was the first generator to wit adam such must the whole human generation needs be for from him to the moderns there is no room to find any change according to this argument wherefore if adam himself was noble we are all noble and if he was base we are all base which is no other than to take away the distinction between these conditions and so to take away the conditions themselves and this is what the words that we be all gentle or else simple declare must follow from what has gone before and if this be not true then of sheer necessity some folk must be reckoned noble and some reckoned base and since the change from baseness to nobleness is ruled out it follows that the human race is descended from diverse origins that is to say one noble origin and one from base and this is what the ode declares when it says or that man had not an origin that is to say one sole origin for it does not say origins and this is most false according to the philosopher according to our faith which may not lie according to the religion and ancient belief of the gentiles for although the philosopher does not lay down the succession from one first man yet he will have it that there is one only essence in all men the which diverse origins could not produce and plato has it that all men depend on one only idea and not on several which is giving one sole origin to them and without doubt aristotle would laugh aloud if he heard folk making two species of the human race like that of horses and of asses or for with apologies to aristotle those who so think might at any rate be considered the asses that judged by our faith which is to be preserved absolutely it would be most false as is clear from solomon who when he makes a distinction between all mankind and the brute animals calls the former sons of adam and this he does when he says who knows whether the spirits of the sons of adam go up and those of the beasts go down and that it was false according to the gentiles behold the witness of ovid in the first of his metamorphoses where he treats of the constitution of the world according to the pagan belief or that of the gentiles saying man was born he does not say men man was born whether the artificer of things made him of divine seed or whether the new-made earth but lately darted from the noble ether retained the seeds of the kindred heaven which mingled with the water of the stream the son of aeptus that is prometheus composed in the likeness of the gods who govern all where he manifestly lays it down that the first man was only one and therefore the ode says but this i grant not that is that man had not an origin and the ode adds neither do they if they be christians it says christians and not philosophers or gentiles though their opinions too are against them because the christian doctrine is of greater vigor and crushes all cavil thanks to the supreme light of heaven which illuminates it then when i say wherefore to sound intellects tis manifest that what they say is vain i draw the conclusion that their error is confounded and i say that it is time for eyes to be opened to the truth and this i tell when i say and now i would declare how i regard it I affirm then that it is plain to sound intellects by what has been said that these utterances of theirs are vain that is to say without marrow of truth and i say sound not without cause wherefore be it known that our intellect may be spoken of as sound or sick and i mean by intellect the noble part of our soul which may be indicated by the common term mind 
sound it may be called when not impeded in its activity by ill either of mind or of body which activity consists in knowing what things are as aristotle says in the third of the soul for as to sickness of soul i have perceived three terrible maladies in the mind of man one is caused by boastfulness of nature for many are so presumptuous that they suppose themselves to know everything and therefore they affirm uncertain things as certain the vice which tully chiefly denounces in the first of the offices and thomas in his against the gentiles where he says many are so presumptuous in character as to believe they can measure all things with their intellect considering everything true that approves itself to them and everything false which does not and hence it is that they never come at learning believing that they are learned enough of themselves they never ask questions they never listen but desire that questions should be asked of them and before the question is well out they give a wrong answer and of these solomon says in the proverbs hast thou seen a man swift to answer from him folly rather than correction is to be looked for the second is caused by abjectness of nature for there are so many obstinate in their abasement that they cannot believe that anything can be known either by themselves or by any other and such never search or argue for themselves nor care at all what any other says and against them aristotle discourses in the first of the ethics saying that they are incompetent students of moral philosophy ever like beasts do such live in grossness without hope of any instruction the third is caused by frivolity of nature for there are many of such frivolous fancy that they dash about wherever they argue reaching their conclusion before they have formed their syllogism and flying from this conclusion to another and fancying all the time that they are arguing most subtly and they start from no axioms and never really see any one thing truly in their imagination and of them the philosopher says that we should take no heed nor have aught to do with them saying in the first of the physics that with him who denies the axioms it is not meet to dispute and amongst such are many unlettered who would not know their a b c and would fain discuss geometry astrology and physics and by reason of sickness or defect of body the mind may be unsound sometimes by defect of some principle from birth as in the case of idiots sometimes by disturbance of the brain as in the case of maniacs and it is this malady of mind that the law contemplates when the enforciatum says in him who makes a testament soundness of mind not of body is required at the time in which the testament is made wherefore it is to those intellects which are not sick by malady of mind or body but are free and unencumbered and sound with reference to the light of truth that i say it is manifest that the opinion just spoken of is vain and without worth then it adds that i thus pronounce them false and vain and thus refute them and this it does when it says and thus do i refute the same as false and afterwards i say that we are to proceed to demonstrate the truth and i say that we are to demonstrate this to wit what gentlehood is and how a man in whom it exists may be recognized and i say this here and now i would declare how i regard it chapter sixteen the king shall rejoice in god and all those who swear by him shall be praised because the mouth is shut of those who speak unjust things these words i may verily here set forth because every true king ought supremely to love the truth wherefore it is written in the book of wisdom love the light of wisdom ye who are before the peoples and the light of wisdom is truth itself i say then that every king shall rejoice because that most false and pernicious opinion of mischievous and erring men which they have hitherto unrighteously spoken concerning nobleness has been refuted it is fitting to proceed to treat of the truth according to the division made above in the third chapter of the present treatise this second part then which begins i affirm that every virtue in principle proposes to determine about nobleness itself according to the truth and this part is divided into two for in the first the intention is to show what this nobleness is and in the second how he in whom it resides may be recognized and this second part begins the soul which this excellence adorns the first part has again two parts for in the first certain things are investigated which are necessary for the comprehension of the definition of nobleness in the second the definition itself is sought and this second part begins gentlehood is wherever there is virtue to penetrate completely into the treatment we must first perceive two things 
the one what is understood by this word nobleness simply considered without qualification the other is by what road we are to travel to find the above-named definition i say then that if we would have regard to the common custom of speech this word nobleness means the perfection in each thing of its proper nature wherefore it is not only predicated of man but of all other things as well for a man calls a stone noble a plant noble a horse noble a falcon noble whenever it appears perfect in its own nature and therefore solomon says in ecclesiastes blessed the land whose king is noble which is to say no other than whose king is perfect according to the perfection of mind and of body and this he clearly shows by what he says before when he says woe unto thee o land whose king is a child that is to say not a perfect man and a man is not a child simply in virtue of age but in virtue of disorderly ways and defect of life as the philosopher instructs us in the first of the ethics it is true that there are foolish ones who believe that by this word noble is meant named and known by many and they say that it comes from a verb which means to know to wit nosco and this is most false for if this were so those things which were most named and known in their kind would be the noblest in their kind and so the obelisk of st peter would be the most noble stone in the world and Astente, the cobbler of Parma, would be nobler than any of his fellow citizens, and Alboino de la Scala would be more noble than Guido de Castillo of Reggio, whereas every one of these things is most false. And therefore it is most false that noble comes from knowing, but it comes from not vile, wherefore noble is as much as not vile. This perfection is what the philosopher himself means in the seventh of the physics, when he says, everything is most perfect when it touches and reaches its own proper virtue and it is then most perfect according to its nature wherefore the circle may be called perfect when it is really a circle that is to say when it attains to its own proper virtue then it exists in its full nature and then it may be called a noble circle and this is when there is a point in it which is equally distant from the circumference that circle which has the figure of an egg loses its virtue and is not noble nor is that which has the figure of an almost full moon, because its nature is not perfect in it. And so it may be plainly seen that in general this word, to wit, nobleness, expresses in all things the perfection of their nature. And this is the first thing we are in search of, the better to enter into the treatment of the section which we are about to expound. Secondly, we were to see how we are able to travel in order to discover the definition of human nobleness, which is the scope of the present process. I say, then, that inasmuch as in those things which are of one species, as are all men, we cannot define their best perfection by essential principles. We must define and know it by the effects they manifest, and so we read in the Gospel of St. Matthew when Christ says, Beware of false prophets. By their fruits ye shall know them. So the straight path leads us to look for this definition, which we are searching for, by way of the fruits, which are moral and intellectual virtues whereof this our nobleness is the seed, as shall be fully shown in the definition thereof. And these are the two things which it behoved us to perceive before, proceeding to the rest, as said above in this chapter. Chapter 17 now when these two things are understood which it seemed advantageous to understand before proceeding with this text we are to go on to expound the text itself it says then and begins i affirm that every virtue and principle cometh from one root i mean virtue that maketh man blessed in his doing and it adds this is according as the ethics say a selective habit setting forth the whole definition of moral virtue according as it is defined in the second of the ethics by the philosopher and the chief stress of this is on two things the one is that every virtue comes from one principle the other is that this every virtue means the moral virtues which are our subject and this is manifest when it says that is according as the ethics say where be it known that our most proper fruits are the moral virtues because in every direction they are in our power and they have been distinguished and enumerated diversely by diverse philosophers, but inasmuch as wherever the divine opinion of Aristotle has opened its mouth, methinks that every other's opinion may be dropped. Purposing to declare what they are, I will briefly pass through them and discourse according to his opinion. 
These are the eleven virtues named by the said philosopher. The first is called courage, which is weapon and rein to control rashness and timidity in things which bring destruction to our life. The second is temperance, which is rule and rein to our gluttony and our excessive abstinence in things which preserve our life. The third is liberality, which is the moderator of our giving and of our taking of temporal things. The fourth is munificence, which is the moderator of great expenditures, making the same and arresting them at a certain limit. The fifth is consciousness of greatness, which is moderator and acquirer of great honors and fame. The sixth is proper pride, which moderates and regulates us as to the honors of this world. The seventh is serenity, which moderates our wrath and our excessive patience in the face of external evils. The eighth is affability, which makes us pleasant in company. The ninth is called frankness, which moderates us in speech from vaunting ourselves beyond what we are, or deprecating ourselves beyond what we are. The tenth is called eutropilia, which moderates us in sports, causing us to ply them in due measure. The eleventh is justice, which disposes us to love and to do righteousness in all things. And each of these virtues has two collateral foes, namely vices, the one in excess and the other in defect, and they themselves are the means between them. And they all spring from one principle, to wit, from the habit of our right selection. Wherefore it may be said generally of all of them that they are in an elective habit consisting in the mean. And these are they which make a man blessed or happy in their operation, as saith the philosopher in the first of the ethics, when he defines felicity, saying that felicity is action in accordance with virtue in a perfect life. It is true that prudence or sense is set down by many as a moral virtue, but Aristotle enumerates her amongst the intellectual virtues, although she is the guide of the moral virtues and shows the way whereby they are combined, and without her they may not be. But be it known, in this life we may have two felicities according to the two diverse paths, the good and the best, which lead us thereto. The one is the active life and the other the contemplative which latter although by the act of life we arrive as was said at a good felicity leads us to the best felicity and blessedness as the philosopher proves in the tenth of the ethics and christ affirms it with his mouth in the gospel of luke speaking to martha and answering her martha martha thou art anxious and dost trouble thyself about many things verily one only thing is needful that is to say the thing which thou art doing and he adds, Mary hath chosen the best part, which shall not be taken from her. And Mary, as it is written before these words of the gospel, sitting at the feet of Christ, showed no concern for the ministry of the house, but hearkened only to the words of the Savior. For if we were to expound this morally, our Lord meant therein to show that the contemplative life was the best, although the active life was good. This is manifest to whoso will apply his mind to the gospel words. But some might say, arguing against me, inasmuch as the felicity of the contemplative life is more excellent than that of the active, and the one and the other may be and is the fruit and end of nobility, why not proceed rather by way of the intellectual than by way of the moral virtues? To this it may be answered briefly, that in every discipline heed should be given to the capacity of the learner, and he should be led by that path which is easiest to him. Wherefore, inasmuch as the moral virtues seem to be and are more common and better known and more sought after than the other virtues, and more closely knit with outward manifestation, it was expedient and suitable to proceed by this path rather than by the other, for we should arrive equally well at a knowledge of Section 18 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 4, Chapters 18 through 22. Chapter 18. The preceding chapter brings us to define how every moral virtue rises out of one principle, that is to say a right and habitual selection, and that is what the present text implies up to that part which begins, I affirm that nobility in its constituent essence. 
in this part when we proceed by way of probable inference to learn that every virtue named above taken severally or generally proceeds from nobility as effect from cause and this is supported by a philosophical proposition which declares that when two things are found to agree in anything they must both be reduced to some third thing or one of them reduced to the other as effect to cause because one characteristic primarily and essentially possessed can only pertain to one thing and if these two were not both the effect of some third nor one the effect of the other then both of them would possess this characteristic primarily and essentially which is impossible it says then that nobility and virtue such as we are discussing namely moral virtue agree in this that the one and the other implies praise in him of whom it is asserted and this when it says wherefore in one same implication the two agree being to one effect that is to say the ascription of them to any one implies praise of him and the belief that he is prized and then it draws the conclusion on the strength of the above noted proposition and says that the one must needs proceed from the other or both from a third and adds that it is rather to be presumed that one comes from the other than that both come from a third if it appears that the one implies as much as the other and more yet and this is what this line affirms but if one signifies all that the other signifies where you are to know that at this point the argument does not proceed by necessary demonstration as though we should say if it is cold that begets water and if we see the clouds etc but expresses a fair and fitting induction for if there are in us sundry things worthy of praise and if there also is in us the principle whence praise of us flows it is reasonable to reduce the former to the latter and it is more reasonable to regard that which embraces several things as their principle than to regard them as its principle for the stem of the tree which embraces all the other limbs should be called the principle and cause of them and not they of it and thus nobleness which comprehends every virtue as cause comprehends effect and many other praiseworthy activities of ours as well ought so to be so regarded as that virtue should be reduced to it rather than to some third thing that may be in us finally it says that what has now been expressed to wit that every moral virtue comes from one root and moral virtue as above declared agrees in one thing with nobility so that the one must be reduced to the other or both to a third and that if the one means all that which the other does and more the latter proceeds from the former rather than from some other third is all to be presupposed that is to say is ordered and prepared for what is further in view and so ends this verse in this present section chapter nineteen now that in the preceding section three certain things have been decided which were necessary in order to learn how we might define this excellent thing of which we are speaking it behoves us to proceed to the following section which begins gentlehood is wherever there is virtue and this must be reduced to two sections in the first a certain thing is proved which was touched upon but left unproved before in the second the conclusion is reached and that definition which we are seeking is found and this second part begins therefore shall be evolved like purse from black to make the first section evident we are to recall what was said above that if nobleness has a larger scope and extent than virtue virtue will rather proceed from it which thing to wit that nobility has a wider extent is proved in this section and it gives an illustration from the heaven saying that wherever virtue is there is nobleness and here be it known that according as is written in reason and is held as the rule of reason those things which are obvious in themselves have no need of proof and nothing is more obvious than that there is nobleness where there is virtue and it is a matter of common observation that everything after its own nature can be called noble it says then even as the heaven is wherever is the star but this is not true conversely viz that wherever the heaven is there the star is also just so there is nobleness wherever there is virtue but not virtue wherever there is nobleness and this with a fair and congruous illustration for in truth it is a heaven in which many and diverse stars shine the intellectual and the moral virtues shine in it good dispositions given by nature shine in it to wit tenderness and religion and the praiseworthy emotions to wit shame and compassion and many others there shine in it the excellencies of the body to wit beauty strength and so to speak unbroken health 
and so many are the stars that extend over this heaven that verily it is no matter for wonder if they make many and diverse fruits grow on human nobleness so many are their natural characteristics and potentialities comprised and united in one simple substance and in them as in diverse branches it bears diverse fruits nay in very truth i dare to affirm that human nobleness considered under the aspect of its many fruits surpasses that of the angel although the angelic be more divine in its unity of this our nobleness which fructifies in such and in so many fruits the psalmist was aware when he composed that psalm which begins o lord our god how wonderful is thy name throughout the earth where he extols man as though marveling at the divine affection for the human creature saying what is man that thou god visitest him thou hast made him but little less than the angels with glory and with honor thou hast crowned him and set him over the works of thy hands verily then it was a beauteous and congruous comparison of the heaven to human nobleness then when it says and we in women and in youthful age it proves that which i say showing that nobleness extends itself to a region where virtue does not and it says that we perceive this saving thing which refers to nobleness which is indeed a truly saving thing to exist where there is sensitiveness to shame that is fear of dishonor as in women and in young folk where shame is good and laudable which shame is not a virtue but a certain estimable emotion and it says and we in women and in youthful age that is in young people because according as the philosopher hath it in the fourth of the ethics shame is not laudable nor becoming in old men nor in studious folk because it behoves them to guard against those things which would cause them shame of young people and of women not so much of this line of conduct is required and therefore in them the fear of encountering disgrace through some fault is laudable for it comes from nobleness and their fear may be regarded as nobleness just as impudence is baseness and ignobleness wherefore it is a good and most excellent sign of nobleness in children and those of unripe age when shame is painted in their faces after a fault for then it is the fruit of true nobleness chapter twenty when there follows next therefore shall be evolved as purse from black the text proceeds to that definition of nobility which we are seeking and whereby we may perceive what this nobleness of which so many folks speak erroneously really is it affirms then drawing the conclusion from what has already been said that every virtue or their generic kind namely the elective habit consisting in the mean will proceed from this to wit from nobleness and it takes an illustration from the colors saying that as purse derives from black so does it namely virtue derive from nobleness purse is a color mingled of purple and of black but the black predominates and it is called after it and thus virtue is a thing combined of nobleness and emotion but because the nobleness predominates over the other virtue is called after it and is named goodness and so it goes on to argue from what has been said that no one because he can say i am of such and such a race should believe that he has nobleness unless these fruits are in him and straightway it gives the reason saying that those who have this grace to wit this divine thing are almost like gods without taint of vice and this gift can be given by none save god alone with whom there is no selection of persons as the divine scriptures make manifest nor let any deem it too lofty in utterance when it says for they are well nigh gods for as argued above in the seventh chapter of the third treatise just as there are men most base and bestial so there are men most noble and divine and aristotle proves this in the seventh of the ethics by the text of the poet homer wherefore let not him of the uberti of florence nor him of the visconti of milan say because i am of such a race i am noble for the divine seed falls not upon the race that is the stock but falls upon the several persons and as will be shown below the stock does not ennoble the several persons but the several persons ennoble the stock then when it says for god alone presents it to the soul the discourse turns to the receptive being that is the subject whereon this divine gift descends for it is in truth a divine gift according to the word of the apostle every best gift and every perfect gift cometh from above descending from the father of lights it says then that god alone gives the grace to the soul of that man whom he sees perfectly balanced in his person and ready and disposed to receive this divine act for as the philosopher says in the second of the soul things must needs be in the right disposition for their agents in order to be acted on by them 
wherefore if the soul takes not its perfect stand it is not so disposed as to receive this blessed and divine infusion just as if a precious stone be ill disposed or imperfect it cannot receive the celestial virtue as said the noble guido guinizelli in an ode of his which begins to the gentle heart love repaireth ever it is possible then that the soul stands not well in the person through defect of complexion and perhaps through defect of season and in such as these this divine ray never glows and such whose soul is deprived of this light may say that they are like valleys turned to the north or caves beneath the earth where the light of the sun never descends unless thrown back from some other region whereon it shines finally it draws the conclusion and declares according to what has been said above namely that the virtues are the fruit of nobleness which god implants in the mind that sits rightly that there are some namely those who have understanding which are few to whom the seed of blessedness draws nigh and it is evident that human nobleness is naught else than the seed of blessedness draws nigh dispatched by god into the well-placed soul that is the soul whose body is perfectly disposed in every part for if the virtues are the fruit of nobleness and if blessedness is the fruition of sweetness it is manifest that this nobleness is the sower of blessedness as has been said and if well considered this definition embraces all the four causes to wit material formal efficient and final material inasmuch as it says into the well-placed soul which is the material and subject of nobleness formal inasmuch as it says that it is the seed efficient inasmuch as it says dispatched by god into the soul final inasmuch as it says of blessedness and thus is defined this excellence of ours which descends into us after the fashion of a supreme and spiritual virtue as virtues into the stone from the noblest celestial body chapter twenty one in order to understand the human excellence which is called nobleness as the principle of all good in us we are to elucidate in this special chapter how this excellence descends into us and first in the natural way and then in the theological that is the divine and spiritual way to begin with we are to know that man is composed of soul and of body but that which has been declared to resemble the seed of the divine virtue pertains to the soul it is true that diverse reasonings have been held by philosophers concerning the difference of our souls for avicenna and algazel would have it that they in themselves and in their principle were noble or base plato and others would have it that they proceeded from the stars and were noble more or less according to the nobleness of the star pythagoras would have it that all were of like nobleness and not only the human souls but together with the human those of the brute animals and of the plants and the forms of the minerals and he said that all the difference was in the bodily forms if each were to defend his own opinion it might be that truth would be seen to exist in all of them but inasmuch as on the surface they appear somewhat remote from the truth it is better not to proceed by way of them but by way of the opinion of aristotle and of the peripatetics and therefore i say that when the human seed falls into its receptacle that is into the matrix it bears with it the virtue of the generative soul and the virtue of heaven and the virtue of the elements it combines that is to say its complexion and it matures and disposes the material for the formative virtue which the soul of the generator gave and the formative virtue prepares the organs for the celestial virtue which draws the soul from the potentiality of the seed into life and the moment it is produced it receives from the virtue of the mover of the heaven the possible intellect which potentially draws into itself all the universal forms according as they exist in its producer but in a lesser degree in proportion as it is more removed from the prime intelligence let no man marvel if i speak in such wise as seems hard to understand for to me myself it seems a marvel how such a producing can be arrived at by argument and perceived by the intellect and it is not a thing to expound in language i mean in any language truly vernacular wherefore i would say like the apostle o height of the wealth of the wisdom of god how incomprehensible are thy judgments and thy ways past finding out and because the complexion of the seed may be more or less good and the disposition of the sower may be more or less good and the disposition of the heaven for the effect may be good better or best since it varies by reason of the constellations which are continually changing it comes to pass that from human seed and from these virtues the soul is produced more or less pure and according to its purity there descends into it the possible intellectual virtue which has been spoken of and in the way spoken of 
and if it chance that because of the purity of the receiving soul the intellectual virtue is well abstracted and absolved from every corporeal shade the divine excellence is multiplied in it as in a thing sufficient for its reception and hence there is multiplication of this intelligence in the soul according as it may receive it and this is that seed of felicity of which at present we are speaking and this harmonizes with the opinion of tully in that of old age where speaking in the person of cato he says wherefore a celestial soul descended into us coming down from the loftiest of habitations into a place which is counter to the divine nature and to eternity and in this such soul there exists its own proper virtue and the intellectual virtue and the divine to wit that influence of which we have just been speaking wherefore it is written in the book of causes every noble soul has three activities to wit the animal the intellectual and the divine and there are some of such opinion as to say that if all the preceding virtues were to accord in the production of a soul in their best disposition that so much of the deity would descend thereon that it would almost be another incarnate god and this is almost all that can be said by way of natural science by way of theological science it may be said that when the supreme deity that is god sees his creature prepared to receive of his benefaction he commits to it as largely thereof as it is prepared to receive and because these gifts come from the ineffable love and the divine love is appropriated to the holy spirit they are thence called gifts of the holy spirit the which as isaiah the prophet distinguishes them are seven to wit wisdom understanding counsel strength knowledge piety and fear of god o fair grain and fair and marvellous seed and o admirable and benign sower who waitest only until human nature prepare the land for thee to sow O blessed they who fittingly cultivate such seed and here be it known that the first and noble shoot which sprouts from this seed to bear fruit is mental appetite which in greek is called hormen and if this be not well cultivated and kept straight by good habit little avails the seed and better would it be had it not been sown at all and therefore saint augustine lays it down and also aristotle in the second of the ethics that man should accustom himself to well-doing and to restraining his passions in order that this shoot that has been spoken of may grow strong by good habit and may be inured in its straightness so that it may bear fruit and from its fruit may issue the sweetness of human felicity chapter twenty two it is enjoined by the moral philosophers who have spoken of benefactions that man ought to bestow thought and care on making the benefits he confers as useful as may be to the receiver wherefore i desiring to be obedient to such command purpose to render this my banquet to every one of its parts as useful as shall be possible to me and since it here occurs to me that there is place for some discourse of the sweetness of human felicity i conceive that no more useful discourse can be made for those who know it not for as saith the philosopher in the first of the ethics and tully in that of the goal of good he makes ill progress toward the goal who does not see it and in like manner he can advance but ill towards this sweetness who was not first aware of what it is wherefore inasmuch as it is our final solace for which we live and accomplish whatsoever we do it is most useful and necessary to perceive this goal in order to direct the bow of our activity toward it and he is chiefly acceptable who points it out to those who see it not letting be then the opinion on this matter which the philosopher epicurus had and that which zeno had i purpose to come at once to the true opinion of aristotle and of the other peripatetics as said above from the divine excellence sown and infused into us from the beginning of our generation there springs a shoot which the greeks called hormon that is natural appetite of the mind and as the grains which when born have at first an almost identical appearance while yet in the blade and then as they go forward become unlike so this natural appetite which rises from the divine grace first appears not unlike that which comes just from nature stripped of aught else and like the blade of divers grains is almost identical with it and this likeness is not confined to men but extends to men and to beasts alike and this appears herein that every animal as soon as it is born whether rational or brute loves itself and fears and flees those which are counter to it and hates them then as things proceed there begins as said above to be unlikeness between them in the progress of this appetite for one takes one path and another another as saith the apostle many run for the prize but one is he who receives it 
so these human appetites proceed from their starting point along diverse paths and one only path is that which will lead us to our peace and therefore letting be all others our treatise is to hold after the one that begins aright i say then that from the beginning it loves itself although without discrimination then it comes to distinguish the things which are most pleasant and less and more detestable and flows and flees in greater and less degree according as its consciousness distinguishes not only in other things which it loves secondarily but just in itself which it loves primarily and recognizing in itself diverse parts it loves those in itself most which are most noble and since the mind is a more noble part of man than the body it loves that more and thus loving itself primarily and other things for its own sake the loving the better part of itself better it is clear that it loves the mind better than the body or aught else which mind it ought by nature to love more than aught else wherefore if the mind always delights in the exercise of the thing it loves which is the fruition of love exercise in that thing which it loves most is the most delightful the exercise of our mind then is most delightful to us and that which is most delightful to us constitutes our felicity and our blessedness beyond which there is no delight nor any equal to it as may be seen by who so well considers the preceding argument and let not any say that every appetite is mental for here mind is taken only to mean that which has respect to the rational part that is the will and the intellect so that if any one should choose to call the sensitive appetite mind his objection would not and could not apply to the present matter for none doubts that the rational appetite is more noble than the sensitive and therefore more to be loved and so that is the thing of which we are now speaking it is true that the exercise of our mind is twofold to wit practical and speculative practical is as much to say operative the one and the other most delightful though that of contemplation be more so as was declared above the practical exercise of the mind consists in ourselves working virtuously that is in integrity with prudence with temperance with courage and with justice the speculative exercise of the mind consists not in working ourselves at all but in considering the works of god and of nature and this and that exercise constitute as may be perceived our blessedness and our supreme felicity and this is the sweetness of the above-mentioned seed as is now quite evident where too many times such seed attains not by reason that it is ill cultivated and that its shoots go astray in like manner by much correction and cultivation some portion of the outgrowth of this seed may be so led to a place where it did not originally fall as to come to this fruit and this is as it were a kind of engrafting of another nature on to a diverse root and so there is none who can be excused for if a man hath not this seed from his natural root he may at least have it by the way of engrafting would that in fact they were as many who had engrafted it on themselves as are they who have let themselves straggle away from the good root but in truth the one of these exercises is more full of blessedness than the other to wit the speculative which without any admixture is the exercise of our most noble part which by reason of that fundamental love which has been spoken of it is chiefly to be loved to wit the intellect and this part cannot in this life have its perfect exercise which is to see god who is the supreme object of the intellect save in so far as the intellect considers him and contemplates him through his effects and that we should supremely demand the blessedness and not the other to wit that of the act of life the gospel of mark instructs us if we would rightly consider it mark says that mary magdalene and james's mary and mary salome went to find the saviour at the tomb and found him not but found a man dressed in white who said to them ye seek the saviour and i say unto you that he is not here nevertheless fear ye not but go and say to his disciples and to peter that he will go before them in galilee and there ye shall see him as he said unto you by these three ladies may be understood the three schools of the active life to wit the epicureans the stoics and the peripatetics who go to the tomb that is to the present world which is the receptacle of corruptible things and demand the saviour that is blessedness and find not but they find a man in white garments who according to the testimony of matthew and also of the others was the angel of god and therefore matthew said the angel of god descended from the heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it and his aspect was as lightning and his garments were as snow 
this angel is the nobleness of ours which comes from god as has been said which speaks in our reason and declares to each one of these schools that it is to every one who goes seeking blessedness in the active life that it is not there but go your way and tell the disciples and peter that is those who go seeking it and those who have gone astray as peter did when he denied him that he will go before them in galilee that is to say that blessedness will go before them in galilee that is in speculation galilee is as much as to say whiteness and whiteness is a color full of material light more than any other and in like manner contemplation is fuller of spiritual light than aught else which is here below and it says and will go before you and does not say and will be with you to give to understand that god is ever in advance of our contemplation nor ever can we here come up with him who is our supreme blessedness and it says and there ye shall see him as he said that is and there ye will have of his sweetness that is of felicity as has been promised to you here that is to say as it has been covenanted for you to have power to obtain and thus it appears that our blessedness which is this felicity of which is the discourse we can first find imperfect in the act of life that is in the activities of the moral virtues and then perfectly in a way in the activities of the intellectual the which two activities are the quickest and straightest ways to lead us to the Section 19 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 4, Chapters 23 through 26. Chapter 23 now that the definition of nobility has been adequately expounded and cleared and has been illustrated in its divisions as far as possible so that we can understand now what a noble man is we are to proceed to the part of the text which begins the soul whom this excellence adorns wherein are shown the tokens whereby we may recognize the noble man that has been spoken of and this part is divided into two the first affirms that this nobleness openly shines and glows through the whole life of the noble one in the second it is specifically indicated in its several lustres and this second part begins obedient sweet and alive to shame concerning the first part be it known that this divine seed of which we have spoken above buds forth in our soul instantly yielding itself in diverse fashions to every power of the soul according to their needs it buds then in the vegetative in the sensitive and in the rational and branches out through the virtues of all of these directing them to their perfections and therein ever maintaining itself until together with that part of our soul which never dies it returns to its most lofty and glorious sower to heaven and this it says in that first part which has been spoken of then when it says obedient sweet and alive to shame and the rest it sets forth that by which we may recognize the noble man by apparent signs which are the working of this divine excellence and this part may be divided into four according as it works diversely in the four ages to wit in adolescence in manhood in age and in decrepitude and the second part begins in manhood temperate and brave the third begins and in old age the fourth begins then in the fourth term of life such is the meaning of this part in general concerning which it should be known that every effect as effect receives the likeness of its cause as far as it is possible to retain it wherefore inasmuch as our life as said above and also that of every creature that lives here below is caused by heaven and heaven displays itself to all such effects not in its complete circle but in parts thereof and thus its motion must needs be above them and like an arch as it were embracing all lives as it mounts and descends i say embracing these lives both of men and of other living things they must needs be in a way likened to the image of an arch returning then to our own life alone with which we are at present concerned i affirm that it proceeds after the fashion of this arch mounting and descending and be it known that this upstretching arch would be equal in every case if the material of our seminal complexion did not impede the rule of human nature but since the humid factor 
which is the seat and the nutriment of the heat which constitutes our life is less or more and is of better quality and has more duration in one effect than in another it comes to pass that the arch of life of one man is of less or greater stretch than that of another death is sometimes violent or is hastened by incidental weakness but only that which is commonly called natural constitutes the limit whereof the psalmist says thou hast placed a boundary which may not be passed and inasmuch as the master of our life aristotle was aware of this arch of which we are speaking he seemed to maintain that our life was no other than a mounting and a descending wherefore he says that wherein he treats of youth and age that youth is no other than the growing of life it is hard to say where the highest point of this arch is because of the inequality spoken of above but in the majority i take it to be somewhere between the thirtieth and the fortieth year and i believe that in those of perfect nature it would be in the thirty-fifth year and i am moved thereto by this argument that our saviour christ was of perfect nature and it was his will to die in the thirty-fourth year of his age for it was not fitting that the divinity should thus abide and decrease nor is it to be believed that he would not abide in this our life up to the apex inasmuch as he had been therein in the lowest state of infancy and this is manifested by the hour of the day of his death for he desired to conform this to his life wherefore luke tells us it was about the sixth hour when he died which is to say the apex of the day wherefore we may understand that about the thirty-fifth year of christ was the apex of his age however it is not specially with reference to its central point that scripture divides this arch but rather according as the combinations of the contrary qualities which enter into our composition are four to which i mean to each combination one section of our life seems to be appropriated they divide it into four parts which are called the four ages the first is adolescence which is appropriated to the hot and moist the second is manhood which is appropriated to the hot and dry the third is age which is appropriated to the cold and dry the fourth is decrepitude which is appropriated to the cold and moist as albert writes in the fourth of the meteorics and these parts occur in like manner in the year in spring in summer in autumn and in winter and also in the day that is up to tierce then up to nons omitting sext between these two for an obvious reason and then up till vespers and from vespers onward and therefore the gentiles said that the car of the sun had four horses the first was called eos the second pyreos the third atheon the fourth phlegon according as ovid writes in the second of the metamorphoses with reference to the parts of the day and briefly be it be known that as said above in the sixth chapter of the third treatise the church in distinguishing between the hours of the day makes use of the temporal hours of which there are twelve in each day long or short according to the measure of the sun and because the sixth hour which is midday is the most noble of the whole day and the most virtuous she approximates her offices thereto from each direction that is to say before and after as much as she may and therefore the office of the first part of the day that is tierce is called after its close and that of the third part and of the fourth after their beginnings and therefore we speak of mid tierce before the bell rings for that division and of mid nons after the bell has rung for that division and in like manner of mid vespers and therefore let every man know that the right nons ought always to be rung at the beginning of the seventh hour of the day and let this suffice for the present digression chapter twenty four returning to our purpose i say that human life is divided into four ages the first is called adolescence that is the increasing of life the second is called manhood that is to say the age of achievement which may give perfection and in this sense it is itself called perfect because none can give aught save what he hath the third is called old age the fourth is called decrepitude as said above as to the first no one hesitates but every sage agrees that it lasts up to the twenty-fifth year and because up to that time our soul is chiefly intent on conferring growth and beauty on the body whence many and great changes take place in the person the rational part cannot come to perfect discretion wherefore reason lays down that before this age there are certain things a man may not do without a guardian of full age as for the second which is truly the summit of our life there is great diversity concerning the period to be taken but passing over what philosophers and physicians have written about it and having recourse to my own argumentation i say that in the majority on whom every judgment about a natural phenomenon may and should be based this age lasts twenty years 
and the argument which gives me this is that if the apex of our arch is at thirty five the age under discussion should have as long a period of descent as it has of ascent and this rising and descending may be likened to the sustained height of the arch wherein but slight bending is to be discerned we have it then that the prime of life is completed at the forty-fifth year and as adolescence lasts twenty-five years mounting up to the prime of life so the descent that is age is a like period succeeding to the prime of life and so age ends at the seventieth year but inasmuch as adolescence taking it as we have done above does not begin at the beginning of life but some eight months after and inasmuch as our nature is eager to rise and hangs back from descending because the natural heat is reduced and has small power and the human is thickened not in quantity but in quality and so is less easily evaporated and consumed it comes to pass that beyond old age there remains perhaps to the amount of ten years of our life or a little more or a little less and this period is called decrepitude whence we have it of plato whom both in the strength of his own nature and because of the physiognomoscope which socrates cast for him when he first saw him we may believe to have had the most excellent nature that he lived eighty-two years as testifies tully in that of old age and i believe that if christ had not been crucified and had lived out the space which his life had power to cover according to its nature he would have been changed at the eighty-first year from mortal body to eternal truly as said above these several ages may be longer or shorter according to our complexion and composition but however they may fall i take it that the proportion laid down should be observed in them all that is we must make the ages longer or shorter according to the totality of the whole period of their natural life through all these ages this nobleness of which we are speaking manifests its effects diversely in the ennobled soul and this is what this part about which i am at present writing purposes to show and here be it known that our nature when good and straight follows a seasonable procedure in us as we see the nature of plants doing in them and therefore different ways and different deportment are suitable at one age rather than at others wherein the ennobled soul proceeds in due order on one simple path exercising its acts in their times and ages according as they are ordained for its ultimate fruit and tully agrees herein in that of old age and passing by the account which virgil gives under a figure in the aeneid of this changing progress of the ages and passing by what egidus the eremite says in the first part of the regimen of princes and passing by what tully says of it in the first of offices and following only that which reason may say of herself i say that this first age is the gate and path whereby we enter upon a good life and this entrance must of necessity have certain things which nature in her goodness failing not in things necessary giveth us even as we see she giveth leaves to the vine to protect her fruit and tendrils wherewith she supports and binds her weakness so as to sustain the weight of her fruit nature then in her goodness gives to this age four things needful for entrance into the city of the right life the first is obedience the second is sweetness the third sensitiveness to shame the fourth is grace of body as the text says in the first section you are to know then that like as he who was never in a city would not know how to keep the way without instruction from him who has practised it so the adolescent who enters into the wandering wood of this life would not know how to keep the right path if it were not shown him by his elders nor would their indications avail if he were not obedient to their commandments and therefore obedience was necessary for this age it is true that some might say then can he be called obedient who shall give credence to evil commands just as well as he who shall give credence to good ones i answer that this would not be obedience but transgression for if the king command one path and the servant command another the servant is not to be obeyed for that would be disobeying the king and so would be transgression and therefore solomon says when he purposes to correct his son and this is his first injunction hearken my son to the admonition of thy father and then at once he warns him off from the evil counsel and instruction of others saying let not the sinners have power to allure thee with flatteries nor with delights that thou go with them wherefore just as so soon as he is born the child cleaves to his mother's breast in like manner as soon as any light of the mind appears in him he should return to the correction of his father and his father should teach him and let him see to it that he give him no example of himself and his works counter to his words of correction for we see every son by nature look more to the prince of the paternal feet than to others and therefore the law which provides for this affirms and commands that the person of the father should ever be regarded as holy and reverent by his sons 
and thus we see that obedience was necessary in this age and therefore solomon writes in the proverbs that he who humbly and obediently endures fitting reprehension from the corrector shall be glorious and he says shall be to give to understand that he is speaking to the adolescent who cannot be glorious at his present age and if any should cavil in that this is said of the father and not of others i say that all other obedience should be reduced to the father wherefore the apostle says to the colossians children obey your fathers in all things for this is the will of god and if the father is not living this obedience should be reduced to him who is left as father by the father's last will and if the father died intestate it should be reduced to him whom reason commits his guidance and next his masters and elders should be obeyed to whom in a certain sense he seems to have been entrusted by the father or by him who holds the place of father but since the present chapter has been long on account of the profitable digressions which it contains the other points are to be discussed in another chapter chapter twenty five not only is this well-natured soul obedient in adolescence but it is also sweet and this is the second thing which is necessary in this time of life for rightly entering the gate of manhood it is necessary because we cannot have perfect life without friends as aristotle hath it in the eighth of the ethics and the greater part of friendships appear to be sown in this first age because therein man begins to be gracious or the opposite the which grace is acquired by sweet conduct to wit gentle and courteous speech gentle and courteous service and action and therefore says solomon to his youthful son the scorners god scorns and to the meek god will give grace and elsewhere he says remove from thee the evil mouth and let churlish mowings be far from thee whereby it appeareth that this sweetness is necessary as has been said and further the emotion of abashment is needed to this period of life and therefore in this period the good and noble nature manifests it as the text says and since abashment is the most obvious token of nobleness in adolescence for it is then supremely needful for the right foundation of our life which is what the noble nature purposes we must diligently speak thereof some little i say that by abashment i understand three emotions necessary for the right founding of our life the first is bemazement the second is pudicity the third is shame although the common folk perceives not this distinction and all these three are needful to this period of life for this reason the period needs to be reverent and desirous of knowledge this period needs to be restrained so as not to transgress this period needs to be penitent for error so as not to become hardened in erring and all of these make up the emotions mentioned above which are vulgarly called abashment for bemazement is bewilderment of mind on seeing or hearing or in any wise perceiving great and wonderful things for in so far as they appear great they make him who perceives them reverent towards them and in so far as they appear wonderful they make him who perceives them desirous to have knowledge of them and therefore the ancient kings contrived magnificent works of gold and gem and artful machinations in their mansions that they who beheld them should be bemazed and therefore reverent and should make question of the honorable conditions of the king and therefore says statius the sweet poem in the first of the story of thebes that when adrastus king of the argives saw polynices clad in a lion's hide and saw tydeus covered with the hide of a wild boar and minded him of the answer which apollo had given concerning his daughters that he was bemazed and therefore the more reverent and the more desirous to know pudicity is a shrinking of the mind from foul things with the fear of falling into them as we see in virgins and in good women and in the adolescent who are so modest that not only where they are urged or tempted to err but where only a bare imagination of venereal pleasure can be found place all are painted in the face with pale or with red color wherefore says the above-named poet in the first book of thebes just cited that when aceste the nurse of argia and of daphile daughters of the king adrastus brought them before the eyes of their august father in the presence of two strangers to wit polynices and tydeus the virgins became pale and red and their eyes fled from every other regard and kept turned only to their father's face as though secure oh how many faults does this pudicity restrain how many unseemly acts and demands does it put to silence how many unseemly desires does it rein back how many evil temptations does it not abash not only in the modest person's self but in him who looks thereon how many foul words does it hold back for as tully says in the first of the offices there is no foul act that is not foul to mention and accordingly 
a clean and noble man never so speaks that his words would be unseemly for a woman oh how ill it becomes the man who goes in search of honor to speak of things which would be unseemly in the mouth of any woman shame is fear of disgrace for a fault committed and from this fear springs repentance for the fault which has in itself a bitterness which is a chastisement against repeating the fault wherefore the same poet says in that same passage that when polynices was questioned by king adrastus of his origin he hesitated before speaking for shame of the fault he had committed against his father and further for the faults of oedipus his father which seemed to leave their trace in the shame of the son and he did not mention his father but his ancestors and his land and his mother and by all this it well appears that shame is necessary to this period of life and not only does the noble nature display obedience sweetness and abashment in this age but it displays beauty and agility of body as the text says when it declares and adorns the person and this adorns is a verb and not a noun i mean a verb indicative present tense and third person and here be it known that this effect also is necessary for the excellence of our life for our soul must needs accomplish a great part of its doings by a bodily organ and it accomplishes them well when the body is well ordained and disposed in its parts and when it is well ordained and disposed then it is beauteous as a whole and in its parts for the due order of our members conveys the pleasure of a certain wondrous harmony and their right disposition that is their health throws over them a color lovely to behold and so to say that the noble nature beautifies its body and makes it comely and alert is to say not less than it adjusts to the perfection of order and this together with the other things that have been discoursed of appears to be needful to adolescence and these are the things which noble the soul that is the noble nature being as said above a thing sown by divine providence designs for it in its first stage chapter twenty six now that we have discoursed upon the first section of this part which shows whereby we may recognize the noble man by outward tokens we are to proceed to the second section thereof which begins in manhood temperate and brave it says then that as the noble nature in adolescence shows itself to be obedient sweet and alive to shame giving adornment to the person so in the prime of life it is temperate and brave and loving and courteous and loyal which five things appear and are necessary to our perfection in so far as has respect to ourselves and concerning this we are to know that everything which the noble nature prepares in the first period of life is provided and ordained by the foresight of universal nature which ordains particular nature to her perfection this perfection of ours may be considered in two ways it may be considered as having respect to ourselves and this perfection should be reached in the prime of our life which is its apex or it may be considered as having respect to others and since it is necessary first to be perfect and then to communicate perfection to others this second perfection must needs be had after that age to wit in old age as will be said below here then must be called to mind the discourse contained above in the twenty-second chapter of this treatise concerning the appetite which is born in us from our beginning this appetite never doth aught else save pursue and flee and whensoever it pursues the right thing in the right degree and flees the right thing in the right degree man is within the boundaries of his perfection but this appetite must needs be ridden by reason for just as a horse let loose however noble he may be by nature does not conduct himself aright by himself without a good rider so this appetite which is known as irritable and appetitive however noble it may be must needs obey reason which guides it with rein and with spurs like a good horseman the rain it uses when appetite is in pursuit and this rain is called temperance which shows the limit up to which the pursuit is to be carried the spur it uses when appetite is fleeing to make it return to the place whence it seeks to flee and this spur is called courage or consciousness of greatness which virtue shows us where to make a stand and fight and thus restrained virgil our greatest poet shows aeneas to have been in that part of the aeneid where this period of life is represented which part embraces the fourth the fifth and the sixth books of the aeneid and how great a restraint was that when having received from dido so much solace as will be discoursed of below in the seventh treatise and experiencing such a delight with her he departed to follow a path honorable and praiseworthy and fruitful as written in the fourth of the aeneid 
how great spurring was that when the same aeneas hardened himself to enter alone with the sibyl into hell and search for the soul of his father and Jesus, in the face of so many perils as is shown in the sixth of the aforesaid story whereby it appears how in manhood it behoves us for our perfection to be temperate and brave and this is what goodness of nature accomplishes and shows forth as the text expressly says moreover it is needful to this period of life for its perfection to be loving because it behoves it to look back and for as being itself in the meridian circle it behoves it to love its elders from whom it has received being and sustenance and instruction so that it may not seem ungrateful it behoves it to love its juniors so that loving them it may give them of its benefits by whom then in its lessening prosperity it may itself be sustained and honored and this love the above-named poet shows that aeneas had in the above-mentioned fifth book when he left the aged trojans in sicily commending them to ascetes and releasing them from their toils and when in that place he instructed ascanus his son with the other young people in tournament whereby it appears that love is necessary to this period as the text says further it is needful to this period of life to be courteous for although it becomes every age to be of courteous ways yet to this age above all it is needful to practice them since on the other hand age cannot do so because of its gravity and the severity which is demanded of it and still more in the decrepitude and this courtesy that most lofty poet shows aeneas to have had in the above said sixth book where he says that aeneas king as he was to honor the corpse of the dead misinus who had been hector's trumpeter and had afterwards commended himself to him girt himself and took the axe to help hew the wood for the fire which was to burn the dead body as was their custom wherefore it is clear that this quality is required in manhood and therefore the noble soul displays it in this age as was said further it is needful to this period of life to be loyal loyalty is the following out and putting into action of that which the laws dictate and this is especially fitting for one in the prime of life for the adolescent as has been said because of his minority deserves pardon on easy terms the senior ought to be just in virtue of his wider experience and should follow the laws only in so far as his own right judgment and the law are one and the same thing and he should follow his own just mind as it were without any law which the man in his prime cannot do and let it suffice that he observes the law and delights in observing it just as the above said poet in the above said fifth book declares that aeneas did when he instituted the games in sicily on the anniversary of his father's death for he loyally gave to each one of the victors what he promised for the victory as was their ancient usage which was their law wherefore it is manifest that to this period of life loyalty courtesy love courage and temperance Section 20 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Treatise 4, Chapters 27 through 30. Chapter 27 we have sufficiently inspected and considered the section of the text which sets forth the probity which the noble soul furnishes to manhood wherefore it seems right to turn to the third part which begins and in old age wherein the text purposes to show those things which the noble nature reveals and must have in the third period to wit old age and it says that the noble soul in age is prudent is just is open-handed and rejoices to tell of the goodness and excellence of others and to hear of it that is to say is affable and truly these four virtues are most fitting to this age and to perceive this be it known that as tully says in that of old age our life has a fixed course and a simple path that of our right nature and in every part of our life place is given for certain things wherefore just as that is given to adolescence as said above whereby we may come to perfection and maturity so too is given to manhood that perfection and maturity themselves so that the sweetness of its fruit may be profitable to itself and to others for as aristotle says man is a civic animal wherefore he is required not only to be useful to himself but also to others and so we read of cato that he did not think of himself as born for himself but for his country and for all the world wherefore after our own proper perfection which is acquired in manhood 
that perfection should also come about which enlightens not only ourselves but others and man should open out like a rose that can no longer keep closed and should spread abroad the perfume which has been generated within and this should come about in that third period of life with which we are dealing it is fitting then to be prudent that is wise and to be so demands a good memory of things formerly seen and a good knowledge of things present and good foresight of things to come and as the philosopher says in the sixth of the ethics it is impossible for a man to be wise unless he is good and therefore a man is not to be called wise who proceeds by stratagems and deceits but he is to be called astute for as no one would call a man who had skill to strike the point of a knife into the pupil of the eye wise so neither is he to be called wise who hath skill to do some evil thing doing the which he ever injureth himself ere he injures another if it be rightly considered from prudence come good counsels which lead the man himself and others to a right goal of human affairs and doings and this is that gift which solomon when he saw himself set to govern the people required of god as is written in the third book of kings and a prudent man such as this waiteth not till some one saith to him give me counsel but himself foreseeing without being requested he giveth him counsel like to the rose which not only giveth its perfume to him who cometh to it that he may have it but also to every one who passeth it by here some physician or legist may say that i am to carry my counsel and to give it even to those that ask it not and pluck no fruit of my art i answer as our lord saith i receive freely if it hath been freely given i say then sir legist that those counsels which have not respect to thy art and which proceed only from that good wit which god gave thee and this is the prudence whereof we are now discoursing thou shouldst not sell to the children of him who gave it thee those which have respect to the art which thou hast purchased these thou mayest sell yet not so but that it is fitting from time to time to pay tithes and give to god that is to those poor who have not left save the divine grace it behoves this period of life also to be just so that its judgments and its authority may be a light and a law to others and because this singular virtue to wit justice was seen by the ancient philosophers to be revealed perfectly in this period of life they committed the guidance of the city to those who had reached this age and therefore the college of the rulers was called the senate o oh, my wretched wretched country what pity for thee constrains me whensoever i read whensoever i write of aught that hath respect to civil government but since justice will be dealt with in the last treatise but one of this volume let it suffice at present to have touched this little upon it it is also meet for this period of life to be generous because a thing is most in season when it satisfies the due of its nature nor can the due of generosity ever be so satisfied as at this period of life for if we would rightly consider how aristotle proceeds in the fourth of the ethics and tully in that of offices generosity must be in such time and place that the generous man injure not either himself or others which thing may not be without prudence and without justice which to have in perfection by the natural way before this age is impossible ah ye ill-starred and ill-born who disinherit widows and wards who snatch from the most helpless who rob and seize the rights of others and therefrom prepare feasts make gifts of horses and arms robes and money wear gorgeous apparel build marvellous edifices and believe yourself to be doing generously and what else is this than to take the cloth from the altar and cover therewith the robber and his table no otherwise ye tyrants should your presence be scoffed at than the robber who should invite his guests to his house and should set upon the table the napkin he had stolen from the altar with the ecclesiastical signs yet on it and should suppose that no one would perceive it hearken ye stubborn ones to what tully saith against you in the book of offices verily there may be many who desiring to be conspicuous and famous take from these to give to those thinking to be held in esteem if they make folk wealthy by what means soever but this is so counter to what ought to be that naught is more further it becomes this period of life to be affable that is to love to speak of good and to hear of it because it is well to speak good on those occasions when it will be hearkened to and this period of life carries a shade of authority whereby it seems that men hearken more to it than to any earlier age and it seems that it ought to have more beautiful and fair news because of its long experience of life wherefore tully says in that of old age in the person of the ancient cato upon me has grown both the desire and the enjoyment of conversation beyond what was my want 
and that all these four things are fitting to this period of life ovid instructs us in the seventh of the metamorphoses in the story where he tells how cephalus of athens came to king achus for help in the war that athens was waging with crete he shows that old achus was prudent when having lost by pestilence through corruption of the air almost all his people he wisely had recourse to god and asked from him the restoration of his dead people and by his wit which held him to patience and made him turn to god his people were restored to him greater than before he shows that he was just when he says that he made partition to his new people and divided his desolated land he shows that he was generous when he said to cephalus after his request for aid o athens ask not help from me but take it and consider not the forces which this island holds and all this state of my possessions yours doubtfully we lack not power nay we have superfluity and the foe is mighty and the time for giving is right prosperous and without excuse ah how many things are to note in this answer but for one with a good understanding it is enough that it be set down here just as ovid sets it down he shows that he was affable when he carefully tells and rehearses to cephalus in a long discourse the story of the plague of his people and the restoration of them wherefore it is manifest enough that four things are suitable to this age because the noble nature manifests them in it as the text says and that the example which has been spoken of may be the more memorable he says of king achus that he was the father of telamon or peleus and of phocus of which telamon sprang ajax and of peleus achilles chapter twenty eight after the section now discoursed upon we are to proceed to the last that is to the one which begins then in the fourth term of life whereby the text purposes to manifest that which the noble soul doth in her last age to wit decrepitude and it says that she does two things the one that she returns to god as to that port whence she departed when she came to enter upon the sea of this life the other is that she blesseth the voyage that she hath made because it hath been straight and good and without the bitterness of tempest and here be it known that as tully says in that of old age natural death is as it were our port and rest from our long voyage and even as the good sailor when he draws near to the port lowers his sails and gently with mild impulse enters into it so ought we to lower the sails of our worldly activities and turn to god with all our purpose and heart so that we may come to that port with all sweetness and with all peace and herein we have a noteworthy instruction in gentleness from our own nature for at such an age death is not pain nor any bitterness but as a ripe apple lightly and without violence drops from its branch so our soul without pain parts from the body wherein it has been whence aristotle in that of youth and age says that the death that takes place in old age hath no sadness and as to him who cometh from a long journey ere he enter the gate of his city the citizens thereof come forth to meet him so come and so should come to meet the noble soul those citizens of the eternal life and this they bring about by their good deeds and contemplations for when the soul has already been surrendered to god and abstracted from the affairs and thoughts of the world it seems to see those whom it believes to be with god hearken what tully says in the person of the ancient cato i lift up myself in the utmost yearning to see your fathers whom i loved and not only them but also those of whom i have heard speak the noble soul then surrenders herself to god in this period and awaits the end of this life with great longing and seems to herself to be leaving and hostile and returning to her own house seems to be coming back from a journey and returning to her own city seems to be coming from the sea and returning to the port o wretched and vile who with hoisted sails rush into this port and where ye ought to rest shatter yourselves in the full strength of the wind and lose yourselves in the very place to which you have made so long a voyage verily the knight lancelot would not enter there with hoisted sails nor our most noble latin guido of montefeltro in truth these noble ones lowered the sails of the activities of the world for in their advanced age they gave themselves to religious orders putting aside every mundane delight and activity and no one can excuse himself by the tie of marriage which holds him in advanced age for not only they turn to a religious order who liken themselves in garment and in life to saint benedict and to saint augustine and to saint francis and to saint dominic but also to a good and true religious order may they also turn who abide in matrimony for god would have naught of us in religion save the heart and therefore saint paul says to the romans 
not he is a jew who is so outwardly nor is that circumcision which is manifested in the flesh but he is a jew who is so in secret and circumcision of the heart in spirit not in letter is circumcision the praise whereof is not from men but from god and further the noble soul at this age blesses the times past and well may she bless them because turning back her memory through them she is mindful of her righteous doings without which she could not come to the port whereto she is drawing nigh with so great wealth nor with so great pain and she doth as the good merchant when as he draweth nigh to the port he examineth how he hath prospered and saith had i not passed by such a way this treasure i should not have nor should i have wherewith to rejoice in my city to which i am drawing nigh and therefore he blesseth the way that he hath made and that these two things are suitable for this period of life the great poet lucan figures forth to us in the second of his pharsalia when he says that marcia returned to cato and begged him again and prayed that he would take her back again by which marcia is understood the noble soul and we may thus convert the figure to the truth marcia was a virgin and in that state she signifies adolescence then she came to cato and in that state she signifies manhood then she produced a son by which are signified those virtues which are declared above to be fitting in the prime of life and she departed from cato and married hortensius whereby it is signified that the prime of life departs and old age comes she bore sons also to him whereby are signified the virtues which are declared above to be fitting in old age hortensius died whereby is signified the end of old age and marcia having become a widow by which widowhood is signified decrepitude returned at the beginning of her widowhood to cato whereby is signified that the noble soul at the beginning of decrepitude returns to god and what earthly man was more worthy to signify god than cato verily none and what says marcia to cato whilst blood was in me that is prime manhood whilst the maternal power was in me that is to say age for she is in truth the mother of those other virtues as has been said above i said marcia did and accomplished all thy commands that is to say that the soul abode with constancy in the civic activities she says i took two husbands that is i have been fruitful in two ages now says marcia that my womb is wearied and i am exhausted for bearing offspring to thee i return no longer being such as may be given to another spouse that is to say that the noble soul knowing that she has no longer any womb for fruit that is to say when her members feel that they have come to feeble state returns to god who hath no need of the corporeal members and marcia says grant me the treaties of the ancient couch give me the name only of marriage which is to say that noble soul saith to god now give me repose o my lord she saith grant me at least that in this so much life as remaineth i may be called thine and marcia saith two reasons move me to say this the one is that it may be said after me that i died as cato's wife the other is that it may be said after me that thou didst not expel me but didst give me in marriage of good heart by these two reasons the noble soul is moved and desireth to depart from this life as the spouse of god and desireth to show that god was gracious to his creature o wretched and ill-born who prefer to depart from this life under the title of hortensius rather than of cato with whose name it is well to end that which it behoves us to discourse concerning the tokens of nobility because in him nobility itself shows all its tokens in every age chapter twenty nine now that the text has been expounded as also those tokens which appear in the noble man in every age whereby he may be recognized and without which he may not be any more than the sun can be without light or fire without heat the text at the end of all that has been related about nobleness cries out against the people that saith o ye who have hearkened to me see now how many be thus deceived to wit those who believe themselves to be noble because they are of famous in ancient generations and descended from excellent fathers though they have no nobleness in themselves and here rise two questions whereto at the end of this treatise it is well to give heed sir manfred de vico who has now the titles of praetor and prefect might say whatsoever i may be i call to men's minds and represent my ancestors who by their nobleness earned the office of the prefecture earned to set their hands to the crowning of the empire earned the reception of the rose from the roman pastor therefore i ought to receive honor and reverence from the people and this is the one question the other is that he of san nazaro of pavia and he of the piscicelli of naples might say 
if nobleness were that which hath been said to wit a divine seed graciously placed in the human soul and if no progeny or race hath a soul as is manifest no progeny or race could be called noble and this is counter to the opinion of those who say that our families are the most noble in their cities to the first question juvenal answers in the eighth satire when he begins as it were to exclaim what avail these honors which remain from them of old if he who would fain mantle him therein liveth ill if he who discourses of his ancestors and sets forth their great and marvellous deeds is intent on wretched and vile doings and yet says the same satirist who will call him noble because of his good family who is himself unworthy of his good family this is no other than to call a dwarf a giant then afterwards he says to such an one between thee and a statue made in memory of thy ancestor there is naught to choose save that its head is marble and thine is alive but herein speaking with submission i agree not with the poet for the statue of marble or of wood or of metal left as a memorial of some worthy man differeth much in its effect from its unworthy descendant because the statue never confirms the good opinion in those who have heard the fair fame of him whose statue is and begets it in others whereas the worthless son or grandson does just the reverse for he weakens the opinion of those who have heard good of his ancestry for a thought will come to them and say it may not be all that which is said of this man's ancestors is true since we see such a plant of their sowing wherefore he should receive not honour but dishonour who beareth ill witness of the good and therefore tully saith that the son of the worthy man should strive to bear good witness of his father wherefore in my judgment even as he who defames a worthy man deserves to be shunned by folk and not hearkened to so the vile man descended from worthy ancestors deserves to be expelled by all and the good man should shut his eye so as not to look upon his reproach which reproaches the goodness that remains only in memory and let this suffice for the present for the first question which was mooted to the second question may be answered that a family in itself hath not a soul and yet it is true that it is called noble and in a certain sense so it is wherefore be it known that every whole is composed of its parts and there are some wholes which have one simple essence together with their parts as in one man there is one essence of the whole and of each of its parts and what is said to exist in the part is said in the same sense to exist in the whole there are other wholes which have not a common essence with their parts like a heap of grain the essence of such is secondary resulting from many grains which have true and primary essence in themselves and the qualities of the parts are said to exist in such a whole in the same secondary sense in which it has an essence wherefore a heap is called white because the grains whereof the heap is composed are white in truth this whiteness is rather in the grains primarily and comes out as the result in the whole heap secondarily and thus in a secondary sense it may be called white and it is in this sense that a family or a race can be called noble wherefore be it known that as the white grains must preponderate to make a white heap so to make a noble race the noble persons must preponderate in it i say preponderate that is exceed in number so that their goodness by its fame may overshadow and conceal the contrary which is in it and just as from a white heap of grain you might remove the wheat grain by grain and grain by grain substitute red millet till the whole heap at last would change its color so out of a noble race the good might die one by one and worthless be born into it until it should change its name and should not deserve to be called noble but base and let this suffice as answer to the second question chapter thirty as is set forth above in the third chapter of this treatise this ode has three chief parts wherefore since two of them have been discoursed upon whereof the first begins in the aforesaid chapter and the second in the sixteenth so that the first is completed in thirteen and the second in fourteen chapters not counting the proem of the treatise on the ode which is comprised in two chapters we are now in this thirtieth and last chapter to discuss briefly the third chief division which was composed as the tornada of this ode for a kind of adornment in which begins against the erring ones take thou thy way my ode and here to begin with be it known that every good workman on the completion of his work should ennoble and beautify it as much as he may that it may leave his hands the more noted and the more precious and this it is my purpose to do here in this section not that i am a good workman but that i aspire after being such i say then against the erring ones and the rest 
this against the erring ones etc is a whole section and it is the name of this ode chosen after the example of the good brother thomas of aquino who gave the name against the gentiles to a book of his which he made to the confusion of all those who depart from our faith i say then take thou thy way as though i should say thou art now complete for it is time no longer to stand still but to go for thy emprise is great and when thou shalt be in the region where our lady is tell her thy business where it be noted that as saith our lord pearls must not be cast before swine because it does them no good and is lost to the pearls and as saith the poet aesop in the first fable a grain of corn is more profit to a cock than a pearl and therefore he leaves the one and picks up the other and considering this i caution and command the ode to reveal its business where this lady to wit philosophy shall be found and there shall this most noble lady be found where her treasure house is to be found to wit the soul wherein she harbors and this philosophy not only harbors in the sages but also as was shown above in another treatise wherever the love of her harbors and to such i tell my ode to reveal its business because to them its teaching will be profitable and by them it will be received and i say to it declare to this lady i go discoursing of a friend of thine truly nobility is a friend of hers for so much doth the one love the other that nobleness ever demands her and philosophy turns not her most sweet regards in any other direction oh how great and beauteous adornment is this which at the end of this ode is given Section twenty one of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode four text of the projected fifth treatise amor che muovi tua virtù dal cielo love who dost launch thy power from the heaven doth the sun his splendour for there his worth is apprehended most where his ray most nobility encounters and as he puts to flight darkness and chill so lofty sire dost thou drive baseness from the heart of men nor can wrath make long stand against thee from thee must every blessing needs arise for which the whole world travaileth without thee perishes all potency in us of doing well e'en as a painting in a darksome place which may not manifest itself nor give delight of colour nor of art upon my heart thy light doth ever strike as on a star the ray since when my soul became the handmaiden of thy power at the first whence hath its life a longing that leadeth me with its persuasive speech to gaze again upon each beauteous thing with more delight in measure as tis winsome by power of this my gaze into my mind a damsel has entered who has captured me and in flame has kindled me as water by its clearness kindles flame because when she approached those rays of thine wherewith thou dost make me glow all rose up in her eyes even as in her being she is beauteous and noble in her features and amorous so does imagination resting not adorn her in the mind wherein i bear her not that it is subtle in itself as for a thing so lofty but from thy might it hath it that it dares beyond the power nature hath proffered us her beauty is thy worth's accreditor in that effect may be estimated upon a worthy subject in fashion as the sun is fire's ensign though giving not nor reaving from it power but making it in lofty region reveal more saving force in its effect 
then sire of such a gentle nature that this nobility which cometh down to us and all other excellence taketh its source from thy loftiness have regard unto my life how hard it is and take pity on it for thy burning by her beauty maketh me have at heart excess of anguish love of thy sweetness make her feel the great yearning that i have to behold her nor suffer not that she by glory of her strength lead me to death for not yet is she aware how she doth please nor how mightily i love her nor how she bears my peace within her eyes great honour shall it be to thee if thou aid me and rich gift to me in measure as i know full well who find me at such point where i may not defend my life for my spirits are assailed by such a one that i deem not save i have succour through thy will that they can keep their stand and perish not and thy potency moreover shall be felt by this fair lady who is worthy of it for it seems as it were fitting to give to her great store of every good as unto one Section 22 of The Convivial. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivial by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode 5 text to the projected sixth treatise io sento si d'amor la gran possanza so do i feel the mighty power of love that i may not endure long to support it which is grievous to me for so does his might keep growing and mine i feel to fail so that hour by hour i am enfeebled from my wont I say not that love works more than I desire, for if he wrought all that my will demands, such power as nature gave me would support it not, in that it is finite. And this it is whence I pluck sorrow, that power will not keep faith with purpose, but if from good will springs reward, I demand it for furtherance of life of those eyes whose beauteous splendour brings comfort whensoe'er i taste of pain the rays of these beauteous eyes enter into mine enamoured ones and bring the sweet when as i taste the bitter and they know the way even as such who erst have traversed it and they know the spot where they have left love when through my eyes they led him in wherefore when they turn on me they do mercy and to her whose i am they purchase loss when they hide themselves from me who so love her that only to serve her do i hold myself dear and my musings compact merely of love as to their goal hie them to her service wherefore to perform the same i long so greatly that did I believe I might accomplish it by fleeing her, it were an easy thing to do. But I know that I should die thereby. Tis very love indeed that hath captured me, and mightily indeed he grips me, since I would do that which I say for him. For no love is of such weight as is that which of death makes a man taste for good service of another and in such will was i confirmed so soon as the great longing which i feel was born by virtue of the pleasure which gathers from all good in the fair countenance a servant am i and when i bethink me whose and what she is i am utterly content
For if a man may serve well against good pleasure, and if unripeness bereaves me of grace, I look to the time which shall grasp more reason, if but my life shall hold her own so long. When I muse upon a noble longing, born of that great longing which I bear, that draws all my powers to well-doing, meseems that I am overpaid with grace, and in like manner more than wrongly meseems I bear the name of servant. So before her eyes of pleasure is serving made, thanks to a not my goodness. Yet since I hold me close knit to truth, needs must such longing count as service, because if I make haste to be of worth, I ponder not so much on what concerns myself as her, who hath me in her power, for I so do in order that her cause may be more prized, and I am wholly hers, so do I esteem myself, because love hath made me worthy of so great honour. Other than love could not have made me such, as to be, worthily, aught that pertains to her, the unenamoured, who takes her stand as a lady whom concerns not the amorous mind, that without her may not pass an hour. Not yet so many times have I beheld her, but that new beauty I may find in her, whence love makes grow his greatness in me, in measure as new joy is added. Wherefore it comes about that so long do I abide in one state, and so long doth love lime, with one torment and one sweetness, as lasts that season that so often goads me, which endures from when I lose the sight of her, until the time when it be won again. Tornata My beauteous ode, if thou be like to me, thou wilt not be scornful so much as cometh to thy excellence. Wherefore, I pray thee, that thou ply thy wit, my sweet amorous one, in culling mode and way that shall become thee. Should cavalier invite thee, or arrest, ere thou yield thyself to his pleasure, see if thou canst make him of thy sect. And if it may not be, straightway abandon him, for the good keeps chamber ever with the good. But if it chances that one often throws himself into a company where he has naught save smirch of evil fame that men proclaim of him, with the guilty sojourn not by wit nor art, for never was it wisdom yet to hold their side. Alternative Tornata Ode to the three least vicious of our city, thou shalt take thy way ere thou go other whither. Salute the two, and see to it that thou try the third to draw him first out of ill company. Tell him the good joins not in conflict with the good, rather than win emprise against the wicked. Tell him that he is mad who fleeth not, for fear of shame, from madness, for he feareth who hath Section 23 of The Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode 6. Text of the projected seventh treatise. Così nel mio parlar voglio esser aspro. As harsh in my discourse would I fain be, as in her bearing is that beauteous stone, whom, every hour, petrify more hardness and more cruel nature. And she clothes her person in an adamant, such as for it, or for that she arrests her, 
there issues not from quiver arrow that can ever catch her naked but she slays and it avails not for a man to case him nor to flee from the mortal blows for as they had wings they light on folk and shatter every armour wherefore to protect me from her i have nor wit nor power i find no shield she may not shatter for me nor place to hide me from her vision but as the flower on the spray so does she hold the summit of my mind she seems as much to heed my misery as a craft does the sea that uplifts no wave the weight that sinks me is such as no rhyme may hold in poise o oh, agonizing and unpitying file that dumbly scrapes away my life how is it that thou shrinkest not from gnawing thus my heart coat within coat as i from telling folk who he is that gives thee power thereto for my heart more trembles when i think of her in such region that folk may thither direct their eyes for fear that through should shine my thought externally so as to be discovered than i do at death who every sense already crunches with the teeth of love which as i muse scorches so their powers that their working slackens he has smitten me to earth and stands over me with that same sword wherewith he slaughtered dido love to whom i cry and call for grace and humbly pray and he seems set to refuse all grace he ever and anon uplifts his hand and defies this my weak life in his perversity and outstretched and overthrown he pins me to the earth exhausted past a quiver then rise up shrieks within my mind and the blood all scattered through the veins flees running towards the heart that summons it and i lie bleached of it he smites me under the left side so rudely that the pain re-echoes through my heart then do i cry should he uplift one other time death will have closed me in ere down his blow descends so might i see him to the centre cleave the cruel one's heart who quarters mine then were no longer black to me the death to which i hasten through her beauty for she smites as hard in sun as shade this murderous assassin and robber o oh me that she howls not for me as i for her in the hot cauldron for swiftly would i cry i succour thee and eagerly would do it e'en as one who upon those fair locks that love has crisped and golden to consume me would set my hand and then would sate myself had i seized the fair locks that have become my scourge and lash laying hold of them ere tears with them would i pass vesper and evening bells and would not be nor pitiful nor courteous but were rather as the bear taking his sport and if love scourges me therewith i would take more than thousand vengeance still on those eyes whence issue forth the sparks which set on flame the heart i carry slain close would i gaze and fixedly to avenge me for that he makes me flee and then would i render her peace with love tornata ode take thy way straight to that lady who hath smitten me and slain and who robs from me that for which i most thirst and with an arrow drive thou at Section twenty four of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio 
by Dante Alighieri, translated by Philip H. Wicksteed, Ode Seven. Text of the projected Eighth Treatise. Al poco giorno ed al gran cerchio d'ombra. To the short day and the great sweep of shadow have I come, ah me, and to the whitening of the hills when colour vanishes from the grass. And my longing changes not, for that it's green, so is it barbed in the hard stone that speaks and hears as though it were a woman. And in like fashion does this wondrous woman stand chill like snow beneath the shadow, for no more moves her than a stone the sweet season that warms the hills and brings them back from white to green in that it covers them with flowers and grass when on her head she bears a wreath of grass she banishes from our mind each other woman for the waving gold is mingled with the green so beauteous that love comes there to sojourn in the shadow who hath riveted me between the little hills more fast by far than calcined stone her beauty has more virtue than a stone and her stroke may not be healed by grass for i have fled o'er plains and hills that i might escape from such like woman and against her light might not give me shadow mountain nor ever wall nor leaf of green erst have i seen her clad in green in such guise she would have planted in a stone the love i bear even to her very shadow wherefore i have wooed her in a beauteous field of grass enamoured as was ever woman and girt around with loftiest hills but of a truth the rivers would return to the hills or ere this log sap full and green would catch a flame after the wont of fair woman from me who would endure to sleep on stone all of my life and go pasturing on grass only to look where her garments cast a shadow when the hills cast the blackest shadow under the beauteous Section 25 of The Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode 8 text of the projected ninth treatise amor tu vedi ben che questa donna love thou perceivest that this lady heeds not thy power at any season which of the other fair ones is wont to make itself the mistress and when she perceived that she was my mistress by thy ray that on my face shines of all cruelty she made herself the mistress so that it seems not she has the heart of woman, but of whatever beast has of love greatest chill. For through the warm season and through the chill she shows me the semblance of a woman, who should be made of beauteous stone, by hand of such should best carve in stone. And I, who am unshaken more than rock in obeying thee, for the beauty of a woman bear concealed the stroke of the stone with which thou didst smite upon me as on a stone that had offended thee long season in such guise as to reach my heart where i am stone and never was discovered any stone or by virtue of the sun or by his light which had so much of virtue or of light as to have power to aid me against that stone so that it should not lead me with its chill to where i shall be dead with chill sire thou knowest that by freezing chill the water turns to crystal rock there under the north 
where is the great chill and the air ever into the element of chill there so converts itself that water is mistress in that region by reason of the chill so before the semblance chill freezes my blood ever in every season and that thought which most shortens my life is all converted into moisture chill which issues then through the midst of the eye by which there entered the dispiteous light in her is gathered all beauty's light and in like fashion all cruelty's chill runs to her heart whither pierces not thy light wherefore in my eyes so beauteous does she shine when i look on her that i see her in the rock or wheresoever else i turn my sight from her eyes there comes to me the sweet light that makes me heedless of each other woman ah would that she were a more piteous lady towards me who seek in darkness and in light only for serving her the place and season nor for aught else desire to live long season wherefore o power who art earlier than time earlier than motion or than sense felt light take pity upon me who have such evil season enter now into her heart for in truth tis season so that by thee there pass forth from her the chill which suffers me not like others to have my season for if there overtake me thy strong season in this such state that noble rock will see me lying in a narrow stone never to raise me till has come the season when i shall see if ever was fair lady in the world like unto this bitter lady tornata ode i bear in my mind a lady such that for all she be to me of stone she gives me hardihood where me seems every man is chill so that i dare to make for this chill the new thing that through thy Section twenty six of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode nine text of the projected tenth treatise io son venute al punto della rotta i have come to the point of the wheel where the horizon when the sun declines yields up the twinned heaven and the star of love is severed from us by the shining ray that enforks her so athwart as to become her veil and that planet that strengthens the cold displays himself to us full on the great circle wherefrom each of the seven casts shortest shadow and yet discharges not one single thought of love wherewith i am laden my mind which is harder than a stone in holding firm the image of stone rising from the sand of ethiopia an alien wind disturbs the air by reason of the sun's sphere that is now burning it and it passes the ocean whence it leads us store of such cloud that if another baffle it not this hemisphere it all closes up and seals and then resolves and falls in white flakes of chill snow and of grievous shower whence the air is saddened all and weeps and love who his nets draws back on high for the beating wind abandons not me so beauteous is the lady this cruel one who has given me for my lady fled is every bird that followeth the heat from that region of europe that loses not the seven chill stars ever and the rest have set a truce upon their voices no more to sound them till the green season unless it be by cause of wailing 
and all animals that are wanton in their nature are discharged from love because the chill deadens their spirit and mine beareth the more of love for my sweet musings are not reft from me nor are not given me by revolving season but a lady gives them me of but short season past their limit have the leaves that the virtue of the ram drew forth to adorn the world and dead is all the grass no branch conceals itself in green save laurel or pine or fir and such other as preserves its verdure and so hard and bitter is the season that it slays upon the slopes the flowers that have not power to endure the frost and the amorous thorn love for all that draws not from out my heart for i am fixed ever to bear it the while i am in life although i lived for ever the veins pour forth the steaming waters by reason of the vapours earth holdeth in her womb who draweth them up aloft from the abyss whereby the path that pleased me in fair weather has now become a river and will be whilst the winter's great assault shall last the earth makes one seeming cemented floor and the dead water turns to glass by reason of the cold that locks it from without and i from my warfare have not for that drawn back one step nor would draw back for if torment be sweet death must surpass all other sweetness tornata my ode what now will come of me in the next sweet season of renewal when rains love upon the earth from all the heavens if throughout these frosts love is in me alone and no other where that will come to me Section 27 of The Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode 10 text to the projected eleventh treatise em incresce di me si duramente i have ruth for myself so cruelly that as much suffering is furnished me by the pity as by the pain ah me that dolorously i feel against my will the breath of the last sigh gathering within the heart that the beauteous eyes smote when love opened them with his own hands to lead me to the season that undoes me o oh me how gentle tender and sweet did they lift themselves upon me when they began the death that is now so grievous to me saying our light brings peace peace will we give thy heart to thee delight said to my eyes time was those of the beauteous lady but when of their intelligence they learned that by her might my mind was now wholly reft from me with love's ensigns they wheeled about so that their victorious spectacle was not beheld again one single time whence is left mourning my soul that looked for solace from them and now all but dead doth she behold the heart to whom she was espoused and must needs depart love smitten love smitten she goes weeping on her way beyond this life she the disconsolate for love expels her she departs thence so grieving that ere she goes her maker hearkeneth with pity to her she has gathered herself midmost the heart together with that life which remains quenched only at the moment when she wends her way and there utters her complaint of love 
who from this world expels her, and many a time embraces the spirits that still weep that she loses their company. The image of this lady sits yet in my mind where love established her, being her guide, and it irks her not of the woe which she beholds, nay, rather is she far more beauteous now than e'er before, and far more joyously she seems to smile, and lifts her eyes that slay, and cries over her who weeps that she must go. Get gone, thou wretch, now get thee forth. And this cry is caught up by the yearning which assails me after its wont, albeit the smart is less. For greatly hath the power of feeling waned, and draweth nearer to the end of woes. The day whereon she came into the world, as stands recorded in memory's book that wanes, my infant person sustained a passion never known, such that I remained fulfilled with terror. For on my every power a curb was set so suddenly that down I fell to earth by reason of a light that smote me at the heart. And, if the book errs not, the main spirit trembled so mightily that well it seemed as though death was reached in this world by him. Now he who set this moving hath ruth of it. Then when appeared to me the great beauty which so makes me mourn, ye gentle ladies to whom I have addressed me, that power that has most nobility, gazing upon the joy, perceived right well that its woe was born, and recognized the longing that had been created by the intent gaze that she wrought, so that she then said, weeping to the others, here shall arrive to hold vicarious sway the beauteous form of one whom I have seen, who even now strikes me with terror, and shall be lady over all of us so soon as it be the pleasure of her eyes. Tornata To you, ye youthful ladies, have I spoken, whose eyes are adorned with beauties, and mind vanquished and bemused by love that commended to you may be my rhymes, where'er they be. And, before you, I pardon my death to that beauteous being. Section 28 of The Convivio this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug The Convivio by Dante Alighieri Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed Ode 11 Text of the projected Twelfth Treatise Poscia che mor del tutto m'ha lasciato. Since love has utterly forsaken me, not at my will, for never had I been so joyous, but because he had pity so much upon my heart that he might not endure to hearken to its wailing, I will sing, thus disenamoured, against the sin that has arisen in our midst, of counter-calling such one as is base and irksome by a name of worth, to wit of gallantry, which is a thing so fair as to make worthy of the mantle imperial him in whom it reigns. A veritable sign it is which shows where virtue sojourns. Wherefore I am assured that if I well defend it in speech, even as I conceive it, Love will again do me grace of himself. There are who, by flinging their wealth away, think to assert a place of worth there, where the good take stand, who after death make their repair within the mind of such as have discernment. But no pleasure may their largesse give the good, because restraining it had been wisdom, and they had escaped the loss that is now added to the error of them, 
and of the rest who pass false judgment in their deeming. Who will not call it fault to engulf food, and give the mind to wantoning and deck him, as for sale impending at the fair of fools? For the wise prizes not a man after his garments, which are but alien ornaments, but prizes intellect and noble hearts. And others are there who, by being quick to smile, of understanding swift, would be supposed by such as be deceived, seeing them laugh at aught which the blind intellect not yet perceives. They speak with words elect, go their unpleasing way content, so they be gaped at by the herd. They are enamoured never of amorous lady, in their discourse they cleave to mere grimace. They will not move the foot to serve a lady after gallant fashion, but as a robber to his theft, so do they pace to pluck their base delight. Not that, in truth, in women is so quenched or gallant bearing, that they seem animals bereft of intellect. Till heaven accord precise with heaven, which gallantry casts from its way, as much as I relate of it, and more, I, who have skill of it, thanks to a gentle one, who showed it forth in all her utterance, shall not be silent of it, for villainy it would appear to me so base that I had joined me to its enemies. Wherefore, from this point forth, with rhyme more subtle, will I treat of truth about it, but to whom I know not. I swear by him whose name is Love, and who is full of saving, that without doing virtue none may true praise acquire. Wherefore, if that which I am handling be good, as each declares, it must be virtue, or with virtue linked. Not virtue pure and simple is this strayed thing, for it is blamed, renounced, where virtue is demanded most, that is, in seemly folk of spiritual life, or garb that holds with study. Therefore, if it be praised in a cavalier, it must be mingled, caused by more things than one. Wherefore this same must needs clothe itself upon one well, another ill. But virtue, pure and simple, becomes every man. A joyance is it that consorts with love himself, and the completed work directed by this third, is very gallantry. In being it endures, even as the sun, to make whose being are conjoined the heat and light, and his own perfect fair form. To the great planet she is all resemblant, who, from the east, forward till he conceals himself, with his fair rays, down pours life and power below, into material, according as is disposed. Even as she, scornful of so many folk as bear human semblance, but not corresponds their fruit unto their leaves, because of ill which they have practised, brings near like blessings to the gentle heart. For she is swift to give life with fair semblances and new beauteous acts which every hour she seems to find and he has virtue for his model who lays hold on her. O false cavaliers, evil and guilty, enemies of her who to the prince of stars is likened! That man whom she will have both gives and takes, and ne'er it irks him, neither the sun to give light to the stars, nor to take from them help in working his effect, but one and the other draws delight therein. Ne'er is he drawn to wrath by words, but such only does he gather as be good, and what things he hath to tell are, each and every, fair. For his own sake is he held dear, and by sage ones desired. For from the savage rest he holds, or praise, or blame, of equal worth. For no greatness doth he mount up in pride, but where it chances that it is fitting to display his valour.
Section twenty nine of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode twelve. Text of the projected thirteenth treatise La dispietata mente che pur mira The torturing memory that ever looks back to the time that has departed from the one side assails my heart, and the amorous longing that draws me towards the sweet country I have left hath on the other side the might of love nor do i find such strength within as may long make defence gentle my lady save it comes from thee wherefore if it behoves thee for its deliverance ere to do emprise may it please thee send thy salutation to be the heartening of its power may it please thee my lady not to fail at this point the heart that so loveth thee since from thee alone it looks for succour for good liege lord ne'er draweth rein in succouring vassal who cries out for him for not him only he defends but his own honour and verily its pain afflicts me hotlier when i reflect that thou my lady by love's own hand art painted therewithin and even for that cause shouldst also thou hold it far greatlier in care for he from whom all good must needs appear because of his own image holdeth us the dearer if thou shouldst speak o sweet my hope of setting a delay on that which i demand know that i may not longer wait on it for at the limit of my power i stand and this thou shouldst discern when as i have set me to explore my final hope for to bear every load upon his back a man is bound up to the mortal weight ere he make trial of his chiefest friend for how he shall discover him to stand he knows not and if it chance that he respond amiss to him naught is there that can cost so dear for swiftest and most bitter death he hath thereby and whom i chiefliest love art thou and who the greatest gift canst give me and in whom most my hope reposes for only to serve thee do i desire life and such things as make for thy honour i demand and will all else being grievous to me thou hast the power to give me what no other may for all the yea and nay of me within thy hand hath love placed whereat myself i magnify the faith i meet to thee flows from thy tender bearing for whoso looks on thee in verity knows from without that within there is pity then let thy salutation now be launched and come into the heart that waits for it gentle my lady e'en as thou hast heard but know that at its entrance it is found strong barred by that same arrow that love discharged the day i was made captive whereby the entrance is disputed to all other save to the messengers of love who know to open it by will of that same power that barred wherefore in my conflict its coming were but hurt to me came it without escort of messengers of that liege lord who hath me in his power tornata my ode needs must be brief thy journey for thou knowest that Section thirty of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Algie Pug The Convivio by Dante Alighieri Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed Ode 13 Text of the projected 14th Treatise Tre donne intorno al cor mi son venute. Three ladies have gathered round my heart, and seat themselves without, for within sits love, who holds scenery over my life. So beauteous are they, and of such power, that the mighty liege, I mean him who is in my heart, can scarce man himself to speak of them. Each one seems grieving and dismayed, as one cast out and weary, from whom all folk have fallen, and whom nor beauty avails, nor wit. Time was wherein, according to their speech, they were beloved. Now they are held in wrath and in neglect by all. These, so lonely, have come as to the house of a friend for they know verily that within is he of whom I speak. Much doth the one of them grieve in her words, and on her hand supports her, like a clipped rose. Her naked arm, column of grief, feels the ray falling from her face. The other hand conceals her tear-drenched locks, ungirt, unsandaled, and only in herself seeming a lady. When first love through her tattered gown saw her, Were it were comely not to say, He, in pity and in wrath, Of her and of her grief made question. O oh, food of few, answered a voice, Mingled with sighs, Our nature sends us here to thee. I, who am saddest, am sister to thy mother, And am righteousness, Whore, as thou seest by my weeds and cincture. When she had revealed her, and made known, Grief and shame laid hold upon my lord, And he demanded who were the other two with her. And she, who was so eager in her tears, Soon as she understood him, Was kindled into hotter grief, saying, Now, on my eyes' behalf, hast thou not Ruth? Then she began, As thou shouldst know, From its source springs the Nile, a slender stream, there, where the great light is shielded from the earth by the rush spikes, over the virgin wave did I bring forth her at my side, who with her fair tresses dries her tears. This, my beauteous birth, gazing on herself in the clear fountain, brought her forth, who is more distant. His sighs held love a little back. Then with eyes softened, that before were wild, he greeted the disconsolate kinswomen, and having grasped one and the other dart, he cried, Uplift your necks, behold the arms which I have chosen, rusted ye see them by disuse. Generosity and temperance, and the others born of our blood, go their way, begging, whereat, if this be loss, let the eyes weep and the mouth wail of men whom it concerns, who have come under the rays of such a heaven. Not we, who are of the eternal rock, for though we now be thrust at, we shall endure, and folk will come again, who shall make this dart abide in brightness. And I who mark, in divine discourse, comfort and dole bestowed upon such lofty exiles, count as my glory the banishment wreaked on me. And if judgment and force of destiny will have the world convert white flowers into dark, falling amongst the good is yet worthy praise. But because the fair signal of my eyes is reft by distance from my sight, which has set me in flame, light should I count that which is heavy on me. But this flame has already so consumed my bone and flesh that death has put his key unto my breast for which, if I had fault, many a moon has the sun revolved, since it was quenched, if a fault dies, because a man repents. Tornata Ode, on thy weeds let no man set his hand to look on that which a fair woman hides. Let the uncovered parts suffice, 
the sweet apple do all folk deny for which each one extends his hand but if it chance that ever thou find one a friend of virtue who should pray thee for it make thyself of fresh hues and reveal to him Section thirty one of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Ode fourteen. Text to the projected fifteenth treatise Dolia mi reca nello core ardire Grief furnishes my heart with daring For a wish that is truth's friend Wherefore, ladies, if I utter words Almost against all mankind Marvel not at it, but recognize your base desire For beauty, which love concedes to you only for virtue was formed by his decree of old, against which ye offend. You I address, who are enamoured, for if to us virtue was given, and to you beauty, and to him the power to make one the two, ye should not love at all, but hide away whatever beauty hath been granted you, because there is no virtue which was its targe. Woe's me! What do I go about to say? I say that fair disdain were with reason praised in woman, severing beauty from herself by her dismissal. Man has made virtue distant from himself. Man? No, but the beast that bears man's semblance. O oh God, what marvel to choose to decline to slave from master, or from life to death? Virtue is still supporting to her doer, him she obeys, to him acquires honour. Ladies, so much that love stamps him of his chosen household in the blessed court. Joyously she issues from the beauteous gates of her mistress, and returns. Joyously she goes and sojourns, joyously she does her great service. Through the short journey, preserves, adorns, increases what she finds. To death she is so counter that she heeds him not. O oh, dear handmaid, and pure, in heaven hast thou taken measurement. Thou alone givest mastery, and this is proved by that thou art a possession always of avail. Slave, not of a master, but of a base slave, he makes himself who departs from such a handmaid. See how great the cost, reckoning one against the other loss, to him who wanders from her. This slavish master is so arrogant, that the eyes which make light for the mind are closed for him, so that he needs must walk at prompting of another, who hath his eye only on folly. But that my speech may serve you, I will descend from the whole to the detail, and that in sentences more easy, that it be less hardly understood, for rarely underneath the veil does a dark saying reach the understanding. Wherefore is there need of open speech with you? And this I will, for the behoof of you, and verily not me, that ye hold vile all men and in contempt, for it is likeness that breeds delight. Who is a slave like him who followeth a liege in haste, and knoweth not whither he goeth along the dolesome path, as doth the miser hurrying after wealth which plays the tyrant over all. The miser runs, but peace more quickly flees. O blind mind, that may not see thy mad desire, with the sum he looks to catch up with his gold that infinitely gapes. Lo, when she has come who levels us, tell me, what hast thou wrought, blind, undone miser? Answer me, if thou canst give other reply than naught. 
a curse upon thy cradle which lulled so many dreams in vain a curse upon thy wasted bread which is not wasted on the dog for at eve and morn thou hast amassed and clutched with either hand that which so swiftly draws away from thee as without measure it is gathered so without measure is it hugged this it is that thrusts many into slavery and should any defend himself it is not save with mighty conflict death what art thou doing dear fortune what art doing that ye dissipate not that which is not spent but if ye did to whom to render it i know not since such a circle rings us which compasses us from above it is the blame of reason who doth not correct it if she would say i am captive ah how sorry a defence does the master show whom a slave overcomes here shame is doubled if that to which i point be well considered false animals cruel to yourself and others for ye see going naked o'er hills and marshes men before whom vice takes to flight and ye keep vile mire clad before the miser's face displays herself virtue who invites her very foes to peace with polished matter to entice them to her but little it avails for he ever flees the bait when she has swung it round with many a cry she flings the food towards him so great her care for him but he spreads not his wings at it and if at last he come when she is gone it seems to irk him so as though he could not give save so as to make vanish all praise from benefit i will have all men hear me one by delaying and one by vain display and one by gloomy semblance turns the gift into a sale so dear as he knows only who pays such purchase would you hear whether it wounds so dismayed is he who receives that henceforth refusal seems not bitter to him so does a miser mutilate himself and others ladies in a certain branch have i unveiled to you the baseness of the folk that gaze upon you that ye may hold them in wrath but far more yet is that which is concealed because tis foul to tell you in each one is a gathering of all vices because the world's way is that friendship blends and the lovesome leaf of the root of good draws other good to it for like only pleases see how i advance to my conclusion for she should not believe who thinks that she is fair indeed that she is loved by such as these but if beauty amongst evil things we would enumerate it might be believed calling love the appetite of a beast oh may such woman perish as dissociates her beauty from natural goodness on such Section 32 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. The Mountain Ode. Note. As there is but one well-authenticated ode of Dante's, in addition to those in the Vita Nuova and those of the Convivial group, it is here given for the sake of completeness. It is probably later than any of the rest, and stands apart from them. The Mountain Ode Amor, d'acchi convien pur ch'io mi doglia Love since I needs must make complaint for folk to hear, and show myself bereft of every virtue, grant me the skill to wail, even as I would, that the woe which is discharged may be borne forth on my words, even as I feel it. Thou wilt have me die, 
and I am satisfied. But who shall pardon me, if I have not skill to tell that which thou makest me to feel? Who shall believe that I am now so smitten? But if thou grant me speech, in measure with my torment, see to it, O oh my liege, that ere I die, she who is guilty may not hear it through me. For should she understand that which I feel within, pity would make less beauteous her beauteous face. I may not flee, so that she come not within my fantasy, no more than I may flee the musing that brings her there. The mad soul, which plies its wit to its own ill, beauteous and injurious as she is, depicts her, and forges its own torture. Then gazes on her, and when right full of the great yearning it draws through the eyes, falls into a rage against itself, for having made the fire wherein all dismally it burns. What argument of reason draws the rain on so great tempest as within me whirls? The anguish that may not be contained within breathes so through the mouth as to articulate and give, to boot, their merit to the eyes. The hostile figure that remains, victorious and cruel, and that lords it o'er the power that wills, enamoured of itself, bids me to go where, in verity, is she herself, since like to like still rushes. Well know I that tis snow seeking the sun, but having no more strength I do as he who in another's power goes with his own feet to his place of death. When I draw nigh, meseems that I hear words which cry, Quick, quick, if thou wouldst see him die. Then I turn to see to whom I may commend me, to such pass brought by the eyes that slay me with grievous wrong. And what, so wounded I become, O love, thou knowest to relate, not I, thou who dost stay to look on lifeless me. And though the soul thereafter comes again to the heart, Nescience and Oblivion have been her comrades whilst she was away. When I arise again, and look upon the wound which undid me when I was struck, I may not so assure myself but that I tremble all for fear, and my discoloured face declares what was the thunderbolt that leapt upon me, for though it was the sweet smile that launched it, long time thereafter it abides, darkened, in that the spirit cannot trust itself. Thus hast thou dealt with me, O love, among the Alps, in that river's vale on whose banks thou ever hast been strong upon me. Here, living or dead, at thy will thou handlest me in virtue of that fierce light that makes a thunder-crashing path for death. Woe's me! No ladies here, nor folk of skill can I perceive whom it may irk of my woe. If she heed it not, neither do I hope for succour from another. And she... Banned from thy court, my liege, marks not thine arrow's stroke. Such mail of pride hath she forged for her breast, that every shaft there breaks its point and course, for her armed heart by naught is bitten. Tornata O oh, mountain song of mine, thou goest on thy way, mayhap to see my city Florence, who bars me out from her, void of love, and stripped of pity. If thou enter in, go crying. Now no longer can my Maker war upon thee here. There, whence I come, clips him a chain, such Section thirty three of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Appendix one. 
the date of the convivio and its relation to the de vulgari eloquentia and the de monarchia dante contrasts the convivio as a work composed after he had passed the threshold of manhood gioventute with the vita nuova as written before he had crossed it and he regarded manhood as lasting from twenty-five to forty-five but since beatrice died in twelve ninety dante's twenty-fifth year the vita nuova as a whole cannot have been written in the poet's adolescence before he entered manhood the passage then can only indicate that the range of emotion represented by the poems of the vita nuova belongs to the poet's adolescence and that with which he desires to connect the cantoni or odes to his early manhood as to the prose work itself we have more precise indications when the first treatise was written dante had long been in exile and had wandered over almost every region of italy this places us at least some years later than thirteen o two the first treatise refers forward to the fourth the second treatise presupposes the first and refers forward to the third the third refers back to the second and forward to the fourth while both second and third directly carry forward a part of the promise and program of the first the fourth treatise three times refers back to the third it departs in one respect from the program announced as general in the second treatise at least three of the unwritten treatises were planned in more or less detail when the existing books were written back references generally specify the chapter four references never unless definite proof can be brought to the contrary therefore we have a right to suppose that the four treatises of the convivio were written in the order in which we have them and that the whole scheme of the book as projected in fifteen treatises was already definitely worked out in the author's mind though subject to modification in detail when he began to write the first treatise the indications of date in the fourth treatise are fairly precise rudolph adolf and albert have successively become emperors since frederick the second but the election of henry the seventh in november thirteen o eight has not yet taken place whereas it is implied that gerardo da camino who died in march thirteen o six is no longer living if we may infer from the passage cited above that albert is already dead we shall be carried past may the first thirteen o eight and shall have a very precise date but though this seems the natural reading of the passage it is hardly safe to lay stress on it but further a comparison of four six a hundred eighty and following with de vulgari eloquentia one twelve thirty six to thirty nine suggests though it does not prove that azzo of este was already dead which would take us past the beginning of thirteen o eight our conclusion then is that the four treatises of the convivio were begun a considerable time probably several years after thirteen o two and were finished before november thirteen o eight and that the fourth treatise was begun certainly after march thirteen o six and probably after the beginning of thirteen o eight the idea irresistibly suggests itself that the election of henry was at least one of the causes that diverted dante's mind from the completion of the convivio and we shall be disposed to regard the whole design and execution of the fragment we possess as belonging essentially to the year thirteen o eight or the immediately preceding years the close relation of the convivio in general and of the first treatise in particular to the de vulgari eloquentia is obvious both works deal with the odes and in both dante regards these compositions with evident pride as conferring on him his chief title to literary fame in both his thoughts are engaged on the relations between latin and the vernaculars though his views or at any rate the expression of them do not completely agree in the two works compare the vulgari eloquentia one one thirty four to forty one 
with Convivio 1545 and following. In the absence of clear proof to the contrary, we are justified in assuming that these two works, including the second as well as the first book of the De Vulgari Eloquentia, belong to the same period of Dante's life, as they certainly move in the same circle of ideas and interests, and take the same view of the general scope of vernacular poetry. Internal evidence confirms this impression. In the De Vulgari Eloquentia 112, 36 to 39, Frederick II, King of Sicily, not the Emperor Frederick II, Charles II of Naples, the Marquis John, evidently of Monferrato, and the Marquis Azzo, evidently of Ferrara, are spoken of as though still living. They died respectively in 1343, May 1309, January 1305, and January 1308. On the other hand, Dante is already in exile. This gives us a range from the beginning of 1302 to the end of 1304 for the composition of the De Vulgari Eloquentia, and when we reflect on the political agitations that absorbed Dante's thoughts in the early period of his exile, we shall be inclined to place the composition of the work in 1304 rather than earlier. Against this conclusion, which I think we must accept, two objections may be urged. Villani and Boccaccio both conjecture that the composition of the De Vulgari Eloquentia was, or may have been, interrupted by the poet's death. But, as they speak quite generally, and seem to have no other data to go on than the fragmentary state of the work, we need not attach any special importance to their suggestion. It is noteworthy that Villani gives the same reason, with greater confidence, for the unfinished state of the convivio, and this we certainly cannot accept. Moreover, the passage of Villani itself appears not to be above suspicion. A more formidable difficulty is presented by a passage in the convivio, in which Dante speaks of a work which I intend to write, God granting, on the vernacular speech, and in which he promises to deal with a subject actually handled in the De Vulgari Eloquentia as we have it. To this, we can only say that, whereas the passage would certainly warrant us in assuming the priority of the first book of the Convivio to the first book of the De Vulgari Eloquentia, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, it does not warrant us in ignoring the clear proof that the first book of the De Vulgari Eloquentia was written before the beginning of 1305, and the very strong presumption that the Convivio was not completed till the middle or towards the end of 1308. For, if Dante took one work in hand before he had completed the other, and this he must in any case have done, and intended to complete the Convivio before he resumed the De Vulgari Eloquentia, he might well refer to the latter, even when speaking of the parts already written, as a future work. But if this seems straining a point, the reader may suppose that the convivio was begun first of the two, without supposing that it is prior as a whole. But in that case, he will have difficulty in finding time for the long wanderings mentioned in one three twenty to thirty three. The general conclusion seems safe that the De Vulgari Eloquentia may be dated 1304, and the Convivio 1308, allowing the possibility in the former case that the work may have overflowed into the immediately following years, and in the latter case that it may have been begun in the years immediately preceding. It remains to examine the relation of the Convivio to the De Monarchia. There are two considerations, one of a general and one of a special nature, which give strong support to the belief that the De Monarchia is later than the Convivio. Both works alike deal with the Roman Empire, and in a general way it might be maintained, with equal show of justice, that chapters 4 and 5 of the fourth treatise of the Convivio 
are a popular summary of the treatment of the empire in book two of the de monarchia or that they are a preliminary sketch of it but we know that the specific relations of church and state which form the real subject of the de monarchia are ignored in the convivio in place of them we find a short passage on the relations of philosophy to the office of government indeed though as we shall see that dante is full of recognition of the church as the organ of spiritual truth he does not seem in any way at all to take count of her as a governing institution even in the beautiful passage in which he likens the whole human civility to a religious order religione he seems to be thinking rather of the ideal philosophical emperor than of the pope as the superior again the doctrine of revelation is never in any way worked out in the convivio the contemplative life is looked upon throughout rather from the point of view of philosophy than of revelation it is therefore impossible not to feel that the de monarchia represents a more developed scheme and one far more closely connected with that of the commedia than we find in the convivio after making all allowances for the differences of treatment natural in a popular and in a scholarly work we have still to admit that if the convivio were later than the de monarchia it would constitute a bewildering parenthesis between this latter and the commedia and would indicate a marked relapse from maturity into comparative crudity to this general argument we may add a specific one of great weight in the fourth treatise of the convivio dante criticizes at great length and with unsparing severity that portion of the emperor frederick's definition of nobility which makes ancient wealth one of its essential factors and he defends himself from the charge of irreverence towards the empire in thus disputing the emperor's definition by declaring that it is not part of the imperial office but rather as he implies a part of the office of the philosopher to define nobility we also attempt to show that a sentiment of aristotle's which might quite indirectly be brought to the support of the opinion he attacks does not really bear the construction put upon it by his imaginary opponent now the fact is that the incriminated part of frederick's definition is really due to no other than aristotle himself who defines nobility as ancient wealth and virtue politics four eight nine dante then must have seen the utter futility of his attempt to make out that he is only dealing with the emperor in his unofficial capacity and with an indirect and erroneous deduction from aristotle had the passage in aristotle been in his mind it is clear then that he did not know it or had forgotten it when he wrote the fourth treatise of the convivio but in the de monarchia dante expressly quotes this passage from aristotle and works out his main thesis as to the nobility of the roman people in connection with it if not in direct dependence on it is it possible that after that he could so completely have forgotten it as to be able to write as he has done in the convivio we are driven to the conclusion therefore that internal evidence points strongly to the priority of the convivio to the de monarchia with the general difficulty section thirty four of the convivio this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri, translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Appendix 2. On Dante's Second Love and the Relation of the Convivio to the Vita Nuova and the Commedia. The Convivio is the monument of Dante's Second Love, and we can have no difficulty in forming a clear conception of its object. 
Dante's second love was for wisdom, that is to say, the wisdom of God, spoken of in the Proverbs and the wisdom of Solomon. The wisdom that Dante loved was the brightness of the eternal light, the spotless mirror of the majesty of God. Solomon declared of her that God began all creation in company with her, and exclaimed in her person, when he prepared the heavens, I was there, etc. She is therefore the logos of the proem of the Gospel of John, and she is expressly identified with the incarnate deity. Ho, oh, worse than dead, who flee from her friendship! Open your eyes and see that before you were she loved you, preparing and ordaining your progress, and after you were made she came to you in your likeness to guide you aright. And again, O oh, ineffable and incomprehensible wisdom of God, which against thy coming into Syria didst make so great preparation beforehand in heaven above and here in Italy. Ultimately, then, Dante's second love is for wisdom as a hypostasis in the Trinity. But the transition is easy to wisdom as an attribute of deity not identified with deity itself. Thus, Dante says of her, that her proper abode is in the most secret place of the divine mind, or that she is the spouse of the emperor of heaven, and not only spouse but sister and most beloved daughter. And the wisdom that thus exists primarily in the creator exists in a secondary way in created intelligences, angelic and human. The love of her is philosophy, and therefore Dante may say of his second love that the lady of his adoration was the daughter of God, the queen of all that is, the most noble and most beauteous philosophy. And finally, since the object of any emotion is often called by the name of that emotion itself, the subjects which philosophy, love of wisdom, studies, may themselves bear the name of philosophy. And so the sciences, one and all, are a part of the object of Dante's love, inasmuch as they are parts of his lady. And amongst the sciences, the noblest and surest place is taken by theology, which suffers no strife of opinions or of sophistical arguments, and is therefore likened to the tranquil Empyrean heaven. Such being the lady of Dante's second love, it is clear that she can, in no sense, be the rival of theology, and since she supersedes Beatrice in Dante's affections, Beatrice cannot be taken as the symbol of theology in the scheme of the convivio. Nor, indeed, is there any indication whatever in this work that Beatrice stands, as yet, for anything but the Florentine maiden who lives in heaven with the angels and on earth with my soul nor is there any note of hesitation or doubt in Dante's devotion to the church. She is the spouse and secretary of God. She is holy church who cannot utter falsehood. Our minds are incapable of grasping the highest truths unless aided by revelation. The Christian faith cannot lie, and has supreme authority above that of philosophers and poets. It is obvious from these passages, and many others that might be added to them, that the convivio is not in any way the record, as has been maintained, of a period during which Dante exalted human reason or secular philosophy to the same level of authority as revelation, or treated theology with disrespect. What he records in the convivio is a period in his life during which his love of study became his dominating passion, partially eclipsing the memory of Beatrice. But the wisdom he loved, so far from leading him away from theology, led him to it, for theology was the most glorious of the sciences, which constituted the body of wisdom as love constituted her soul. Clearly Dante's dominating motive in writing the Convivio was a passion for the study and the promulgation of philosophic truth but he tells us very distinctly that he was also moved by the desire to glorify the Italian language, and by the desire to avert from himself the infamy of having yielded to so great a passion as the reader of his odes would suppose to have had possession of him. 
and the way in which he intends to avert this infamy is by allegorizing all the odes of passion without distinction. This intention may have been only incidental to the real purpose, but it was evidently essential and integral to the method and scheme of the convivio. We have to ask, then, whether we can accept all the love poems on which Dante comments or promises to comment in the convivio as having really been addressed in the first instance to philosophy. It is clear that we cannot. The seventh treatise was to be a comment on Old Six, and it is impossible for a moment to believe that this poem relates to anything but earthly passion. Dante's confession to Forese and his desire to dissociate himself from the moral impression produced by his odes are a sufficient comment on this poem and its companions, even if, for the moment, we leave aside the evidence of cantos 30 and 31 of the Purgatorio. Some of the convivio cycle of the odes commemorated phases of passion from which the author, in the lofty sense of his mission, now desired to dissociate himself. Examining the odes in detail, we can have little doubt that six, seven, eight, and nine were poems of earthly love inspired by a woman of whom we have no other knowledge, and that two, four, and five are hymns of love genuinely addressed to philosophy, whereas ten and twelve seem to connect themselves with Beatrice, and one irresistibly carries us to the lady of the window of the Vita Nuova, with whom indeed Dante himself directly connects it. Now, we cannot accept Dante's asseveration that the lady of the window was no other than philosophy, and that the old Voi che intendendo il terzo ciel movete, which stands at the head of the second treatise, was from the first allegorical. We might hesitate to disbelieve his express statement, had we not seen that it is merely incidental to his general purpose of allegorizing all his odes. As it is, this particular bit of allegorizing must stand or fall with the whole scheme, that is to say, it must fall with it. But the inconsistencies and frigidities to which Dante is driven in allegorizing this ode are in themselves sufficiently convincing. In the Vita Nuova, the lady of the window first appears to Dante a certain space after the first anniversary of Beatrice's death, and then tries his constancy during certain days, after which the memory of Beatrice victoriously reasserts itself, and the poet, writing after the close of the whole episode, pronounces the thought of this lady as gentle in so far as it discoursed of a gentle lady, but in other respects most base. Further, he declared that the heart which took part for the lady of the window signifies appetite. In the convivio, the lady, now identified with my lady philosophy, first appears to Dante considerably more than three years after Beatrice's death. It is some thirty months after this, before he has sufficiently overcome the first difficulties of study to feel the full power of his enamorment. He does not purpose to speak any more of Beatrice in this whole work. He emphatically warns his reader against taking heart to mean any special part of the soul or body. And, so far from being ashamed of his new love as most base, he frankly exalts it over his first love for Beatrice, and declares that a man ought not, because of a greater friend, to forget the services received from the lesser. But, if it really behoves him to follow the one and to leave the other, when he follows the better, the other is not to be abandoned without some fitting lamentation. In spite of Dante's declaration, then, that he does not intend the convivio in any way to derogate from the Vita Nuova, we must believe that it was only by a tour de force that he could attempt to harmonize the scheme of the one work with that of the other, and that we shall be safer in basing our judgment as to the lady of the window and the ode that concerns her upon the internal evidence of the Vita Nuova and the ode itself than upon the express assertions avowedly made with the purpose of the convivio. We have, therefore, 
reached the conclusion that Dante desired to dissociate himself from the implications of some of his poems, which implications he regards as infamous, that he intended to effect his purpose by treating all his love poems as allegorical, and that in pursuance of this purpose he actually explained old one in a manner inconsistent with the narrative of the Vita Nuova and with the facts. But the scheme, alien surely from Dante's sincerity of character, was never completely carried out. Henry's election and expedition, as we have seen reason to believe, interrupted the progress of the convivio, and gave rise first to the de monarchia, and then to the political ladders. After Henry's fall, the world had changed for Dante. His thoughts had been matured, his whole nature had passed through the fire, his life-thought had deepened from that of the convivio to that of the comedy. And if the substance of the convivio had become inadequate, its form and scheme had become impossible. Dante had come to see that, if there is any aspect of our past lives that is at war with our present lives and aspirations, we must dissociate ourselves from it, not by allegorizing it away, but by purgatorially living ourselves out of it, and into its opposite, by confession and by penitence. At the same time he perceived that philosophy, so far from leading him away from Beatrice, had been leading him back to her. It was in sin that he had wandered from her, it was in love of wisdom that he came back to her. My lady philosophy, no longer the rival of Beatrice, was resolved into Beatrice's emissary, Virgil, and Beatrice herself. The superseded scheme of symbolism of the convivio was abandoned. The poet purged himself from its taint of insincerity. And after his passage through purgatory, the supreme confession and the agony of penitence with which he met his outraged ideal in the earthly paradise give us his final comment on the aberrations he had once thought to explain away. Final save. Section 35 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri, translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Appendix 3. The Astronomy of the Convivio. Dante follows the Ptolemaic system of astronomy, a good account of which will be found in Young's General Astronomy. But he only deals with the simplest elements of the system, and avoids all such points as the eccentricities of the planetary orbits, corresponding to the ellipticities of orbits of modern astronomy. The difficulty which students find in understanding the astronomical passages in Dante is due to ignorance of astronomy in general, not to ignorance of the Ptolemaic system, which is extremely simple and easy to connect directly with the observed phenomena of the heavens. Dante's expositions are of admirable lucidity, and any one who has watched the actual doings of the stars, the sun and moon, and the planets, will understand them without difficulty. Those who are only acquainted with representations of the solar system in books or orreries may find some difficulty in adjusting their minds to a system that always keeps in direct touch with the appearance of the heavens, as really seen from the earth, but the following hints may be found useful. The starry heaven presents the appearance of a solid sphere revolving round fixed poles, one of which is visible to us, from east to west. This appearance was taken by the ancients as a fact. Between midnight and midnight, that is, during one diurnal revolution of the sun round the earth, any given star that has been observed will be found to have completed something more than a full revolution and consequently to be further west than it was twenty-four hours ago. That is to say, the stars revolve faster than the sun, 
and constantly overtake him in their journey from east to west. In the course of a year, the whole starry heaven has thus overtaken and passed the sun, so that the stars are once more in the same relative positions with respect to him. Moreover, the sun rises due east at the spring equinox, and then till the summer solstice rises further and further north, till he is about twenty-three and a half degrees north of the equator, then a little further south every day, till at the autumn equinox he is on the equator and rises due east again, and by the winter solstice is twenty-three and a half degrees south of the equator, after which he creeps north again. It will be seen, then, that, in the course of a year, the sun both lags behind the stars till they have all passed him, and also moves north and south within a space of twenty-three and a half degrees on each side of the equator. That is to say, he works back through the stars, tracing on the starry heavens a great circle at an angle of twenty-three and a half degrees with the equator, and cutting the equator at two points. To account for this, the ancients supposed that inside the sphere of the stars was another sphere, the axes of which were fixed, not mechanically, as suggested by the figure, in two points of the starry sphere twenty-three and a half degrees distant from the poles, and that the sun was fixed on the equator of the inner sphere. Now, let the reader suppose himself to be standing somewhere on the surface of the earth, in the northern hemisphere, at the center of the two spheres in the figure. If the outer sphere revolved, carrying the inner sphere, otherwise motionless, with it, he would see the sun moving round once in every twenty-four sidereal hours clockwise. If, on the other hand, the outer sphere were to cease revolving, and the inner sphere were to revolve counterclockwise once in a year, he would see the sun trace a circle on the starry sphere, moving back from west to east at its most northern point, twenty-three and a half degrees above the starry equator, and at its most southern point, twenty-three and a half degrees below it. If both of these motions are going on at once, both effects will follow. That is to say, the sun will be carried round every day from east to west with the stars, but also will, at the same time, lag behind them, and also creep north or south according to the season of the year. He will, in fact, trace the spiral which has been described above as the course he actually appears to take. The resolution of this spiral into a combination of two circles was the triumph of ancient astronomy, and it still holds its place in modern astronomy, the two circles being now regarded as the motion of the earth round her own axis and her motion round the sun. The motion of the moon is like that of the sun, only that her proper orbit from west to east is completed in a month instead of a year. A closer inner sphere, therefore, was supposed, which sympathetically obeyed the motion of the starry sphere, and had its oblique axis fixed, not mechanically, in it, but was unaffected by the motion of the sun's proper sphere. On its equator the moon was fixed. The motion of the planets, other than the sun and moon, which are also regarded as planets by the ancients, is more complicated. On the whole, they travel through the stars obliquely to the equator from west to east, like the sun and moon, each having its own period of proper revolution. But they do not travel steadily, and sometimes they actually travel westward through the stars for a time. To explain this, the ancients introduced, in the case of these planets, a third circular motion. The planet, Venus, for instance, was not supposed to be fixed like the sun on the equator of its proper sphere, but another smaller sphere, the center of which would lie on the equator of that sphere, was supposed to be thrust into its side, and to revolve round the center which the greater sphere was itself carrying round the earth from west to east. 
Here, the reader's modern conception of the solar system may help his imagination. Let him suppose himself to be observing our moon from the sun in the center of the system. Further, let him suppose the distance of the moon from the earth to be immensely increased, and the motion of the earth so slow down that the movement of the moon round the earth is more rapid than that of the earth round the sun. And lastly, let him suppose the earth to shrink till it becomes a mere ideal point circling round the sun while the moon circles round it. He will see that under these conditions the moon would appear to take a looped course through the stars, prevailing from west to east, but occasionally doubling back from east to west. This is exactly analogous to the course of a planet as seen from the earth, and explained in terms of the Ptolemaic mechanism. The three circles, of the starry sphere, the planet's proper sphere, and the planet's epicycle or inserted sphere, correspond to the three circles of the Earth's revolution on her axis, her revolution round the sun, and the planet's revolution round the sun, as conceived by modern astronomy. Again, the great triumph of resolving the extremely complex apparent motion of the planets into a combination of three circles was won by the ancients and is still enjoyed by the modern astronomers. Finally, Hipparchus observed the phenomenon now known as the precession of the equinoxes, and explained by modern astronomy as due to a slow top-light motion of the Earth's axis. Its effect on the appearance of the heavens is to make a slow change in the pole of the daily rotation of the starry heavens. Our pole star was not always and will not always be so near the pole as it now is. This was explained by the ancients by supposing that the starry sphere itself had its poles obliquely fixed, not mechanically, in a sphere outside itself, on which there is no heavenly body, just as the poles of the proper spheres of the planets were fixed in the starry sphere. It was this outmost sphere to which the daily rotation of the whole heavens from east to west was due. The starry sphere had a slow proper motion from west to east, one degree in a hundred years, Dante thought, which was communicated like that of the primum mobile, or outmost sphere, to all the inner spheres. The proper motions of the other spheres were strictly proper, that is, they not only originated in them, but were not communicated by them to any of the lower spheres within them. The proper motions of the other spheres were strictly proper, that is, they not only originated in them, but were not Section 36 of the Convivio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Convivio by Dante Alighieri, translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Editorial Note. In preparing this translation for the Temple Classics, I have generally followed the text of Dr. Moore's Oxford Dante, but I have sometimes preferred that of Perettini's Variorum edition, Modena, 1831, or have adopted a manuscript reading which it indicates. On these matters, and on significant changes of punctuation, I have given such information in the notes as I thought might be useful in a popular work, but not in a uniform or systematic manner. But in the few cases in which I have ventured upon actual emendation of the manuscript text on my own authority, I have, of course, invariably given notice of them in the notes. Square brackets in the text indicate insertions. Both translations and notes are, for the most part, based on independent study, but I have found Pederzini's edition, cited above, of the highest value in difficult passages. 
Kanegisers, German translation, Leipzig, 1856, I have found useful as a check. But, though it is in general a singularly careful and scholarly piece of work, it follows Pederzini in cases of difficulty so closely as to deprive it of independent value in passages of doubtful interpretation. When my translation was completed, I compared it throughout with Miss Hillard's The Banquet, Kagan Pole, 1889. I have felt compelled in very many passages to adhere to a translation at variance with hers, as will be obvious to any one who compares the two versions. But the number of passages in which her translation enabled me to detect and avoid mistakes in my own can of course be known only to myself, and I wish to be allowed, if I may do it without impertinence, to express my thanks to her, together with my high admiration of the sustained brilliance of her work from the literary point of view. To Mr. Toynbee's Dante Dictionary and Studies, my obligations are extensive. Many of them are acknowledged in detail. My debt to Dr. Moore's first series of studies will be understood by those, but by those only, who have attempted some work similar to that involved in annotating the convivio. I have not always agreed with him in my identification of Dante's references to Aristotle, and I have often drawn independent conclusions from the material he has gathered, but my work, such as it is, would have been almost impossible within the limits of time at my disposal had I not been able to take his patient researches as a starting point. To Mr. Edmund Gardner I owe a very special personal debt indicated in connection with the translation of the Odes. Philip H. Wicksteed.